Hi, good morning, um, everyone. My name is James from uh, TBN Asia. Welcome, welcome to our social enterprise Saturday morning. All right, while well, you get a cup of coffee while we go along this morning, I also like to give special mention to our uh, sessions partners, Plus from uh, Indonesia and Magic from Malaysia. All right, so for this morning's uh, session, we have uh, a lineup for you almost 50 companies from 9 to 3 p.m. this afternoon to share their exciting stories on the impact they are giving to the community. And over the next one hour, 15 minutes, we have uh, five companies, three in Malaysia and two from Singapore presenting their stories, right? These five companies are serving the marginalized in society and people with special needs. So for the format of uh, today's sessions, after each presentation, we'll take the Q&A uh, for a few minutes. So the, partic the participants or the audience, you can send in a Q&A uh, during the presentation, but I will be moderating or posing the questions after each presentation. After which, uh, you can also, for the audience, you can also reach out to the exhibitors, right, who will be arranging their own Zoom sessions for networking with you guys and to connect uh, with you guys after 3 p.m. today. Altern alternatively, you can also download the TBN um, conference app to visit and follow the exhibitors to connect with them. All right. So uh, without oh, one more point, uh, for those of you uh, out there, right, we welcome you to our uh, to meet our TBN uh, family and board uh, members this afternoon at 3 p.m. is in uh, Zoom link uh, for room one. Uh, for those of you who are interested to interact with us. So uh, without further ado, let me hand over the time to uh, our first uh, exhibitor, uh, Sophia Aliza from Pink Collar Agency. Over to you, uh, Sophia. Hi everyone, good morning. Can everyone hear me? Um, thank you for joining us um, so early on a Saturday morning. Um, my name is, are my slides being projected? Okay, great. Yeah, thank you for joining me so early in a Saturday morning. Um, my name is Sophia and I'm one of the co-founders of Pink Collar Employment Agency. Next. So what is Pink Collar? Um, we are a professional recruitment agency for migrant domestic workers, also known as domestic helpers or maids. Um, we're based in Malaysia and we have ethical um, sourcing and hiring practices. Uh, Pink Holler was founded to address um, the systemic exploitation of migrant domestic workers in Malaysia, um, where workplace abuses, contract breaches, um, and you know, debt bondage conditions are very common. Um, really quickly, uh, debt bondage is a condition where a worker is charged a really high sum of money to um, an agent who helps her find a job. And then once she gets a job, she's highly indebted to this agent. Um, what this looks like practically is that um, a worker would essentially have her salary deducted um, and she basically does not earn an income um, when she works. And in Malaysia, you know, this, um, you know, this, this condition is, is quite bad. Um, workers can often, you know, forego nine months of their salary to pay off these recruitment fees. Um, uh, next. Yeah. Um, so, you know, solving um, debt bondage is really central to our mission. But apart from debt bondage, um, this industry is problematic in so many other ways. Domestic workers are one of the most um, vulnerable communities of workers. Um, they're often placed in unsafe homes um, where you know, their passports are withheld from them, their phones are taken away, they are physically restricted from leaving their employer's homes, they're isolated from communities, cut off from their families. Um, and you know, for many of them, you know, they come to work in Malaysia and once they leave, they haven't made you know, a single friend. Um, so, Apart from that as well, um, workers often um, don't get training. So if you look at the slides, they lack migration preparedness. Um, and this is especially key um, for workers because if you think about their jobs, they're not just here to work as domestic workers, um, but they're also essentially up 
risking their lives and leaving their families behind for years. So it is a job which requires, you know, especially unique training. Um, on the other hand, um, employers are also charged really high service fees, sometimes even hidden fees, meaning that, you know, a few months into the, the contract, they're asked to pay more fees. Um, and they often are matched with workers who are untrained or not even suitable um, to the jobs. So um, because of this, uh, next. Yeah. Um, because of this, these issues, uh, the domestic worker market is actually, you know, quite a broken market. So about 30 to 40 percent um, of employer and domestic worker placements and prematurely. So what this means is that um, workers actually don't complete their two year contract um, and it ends in termination before two years. Next. Yeah, so um, we quickly learned in order for us to really change standards of this market and to ensure that workers are treated fairly, we needed to be um, an agency ourselves. Um, and if you look at the slide here, um, you know, number one, what is very different about us is that we don't charge any placement fees to workers and we don't allow for any salary deductions. Um, so workers earn immediately when they start work with us. Um, Number two, you know, we're compliant to the laws and regulations of both the Malaysian government and the Philippines government, where we currently source workers from, um, so that both employers and workers are free of any immigration risk. And this is especially pertinent for the workers um, whose, you know, undocumented status, you know, could really cause issues for them down the line. And one thing that is absolutely crucial to our business is what we call, you know, responsible matching. So what does that mean? Um, on the worker side, we actually vet all of the workers who apply with us. And we only accept workers, you know, who we believe are committed to work abroad, um, prepared for, you know, the idea of migration, and also um, sufficiently trained. Um, we vet employers as well. So we only work with employers who agree with our ethical hiring process um, and who, you know, who are also ready to comply with all of the laws and regulations required to hire a domestic worker in Malaysia. And when we match, you know, employers with workers, we, we recognize that not all our employers are the same and not all workers are the same. So we take into account, you know, workers' skills, uh, but not just that, but also their job preferences um, and, you know, their personalities when matching employers um, with workers. So, for example, if a worker, you know, is very skilled in childcare, but has done it for 15 years and doesn't want to do childcare anymore, we won't place her in a home where she needs to look after kids. And we also grant, you know, workers the autonomy to, you know, choose which jobs they want to interview for and also which jobs they want to accept or decline. Um, looking for this, you know, long-term compatibility is really key for us um, to reduce the termination rates in this industry. Um, next. Yeah, so obviously, you know, we, we can't do this alone. Um, we work with amazing partners, actually, throughout our entire recruitment pipeline. Um, we receive a mentorship from Fair Employment Foundation, um, sorry, can you go back? Yeah, Fair Employment Foundation, which, uh, which is connected to Fair Employment Agency, um, Asia's first nonprofit um, and ethical domestic worker agency based in Hong Kong. And to help us process the papers of all of our workers based in the Philippines, we work with Concord Agency. So they're our supply side um, agency partner. And the founder is actually a long time, you know, activist for worker rights. So we're really confident that we're aligned in that way. Um, our training center, Fair Training Center, is um, one that we partner with. And you know what they do is amazing. They don't just train workers on on hard skills. Um, what I mean by that is, you know, how do you you know iron or set the table properly, um, but also on really crucial soft skills. So these are things like. Um, professionalism, um, financial management, emotional resilience, um, understanding their legal rights. Um, and these are crucial for successful migration and our training center focuses heavily on these skills before workers are deployed to Malaysia.
And we've also built a strong partnership with FEMA, which is a self-organized Filipino-based um, community in Kuala Lumpur. And they offer, you know, a migrant skills training program for workers on their rest days, usually Sundays. So workers go to um, FEMA and, you know, they have so many options to choose from. They have counting, photography, Zumba. And we find this really important because it helps, you know, workers develop their lives personally outside, you know, their role as a domestic worker. Uh, next. Next, yeah. So if you look very quickly here, there are some photos. We also, you know, produce materials to help the employment relationship. We have a salary slip or a bill book where our employers can use to record the salaries of their workers. We have a journal that all pink collar workers um, receive when they first arrive in Malaysia, which contains you know, functional and therapeutic tools to help them throughout their two year journey here. Uh, next. Um, so I understand that, you know, that was a lot to take in such a short time. I'm sorry I had to condense everything. Um, but the reality is that, you know, thoughtfulness is really required um, at every stage of the sourcing and hiring process. Um, this industry is really complex. There are so many stakeholders holders from you know domestic workers employers the agency ourselves and the truth is the solution by nature has to be multi-pronged and that's how we've taken our business model approach you know we've tried to um, understand each um, stakeholder very well and then come up with a solution that meets everyone's needs and mutually benefits everybody so I'm really glad to share that um, so far our efforts um, have borne fruit. Um, if you look at the slide, debt savings is one of our key indicators of our success um, or how we measure our impact. So since we started operating in August last year, we've placed uh, 51 workers in Malaysian houses. And um, if you look um, there, we've actually saved workers um, 60,000 ringgit of debt. And we project that by the end of our third year of operations, you know, we would have saved migrant domestic workers in Malaysia about 900,000 um, ringgit of debt, close to a million ringgit of hard earned income that support the lives, you know, of these workers um, and their families that would otherwise, you know, have gone illegally into the pockets of various agencies in Malaysia. Um, so we find this really crucial to our mission. Um, but importantly as well, um, do you mind moving on? Uh, Sophia, we only have uh, just two minutes left. Yeah. Um, importantly as well, um, we also have reduced the termination rates from 40% to just 5% for our, for our um, employers and workers. Um, next. Yeah. And um, in the past, you know, um, about eight months since we started operating, we've generated a revenue of slightly over half a million ringgit um, with a team of four. Um, and, you know, we project that by the end of the, you know, three year period, we would have achieved a revenue of 13 million. Um, and obviously with the COVID situation recently, you know, these, are, these were our projected numbers before. Um, we hope that it wouldn't change too much. But right now, what I think would be great is, you know, if we could actually ask, if I could ask the audience, especially people who have worked with governments before, on, you know, giving us advice on how to lobby for government uh, policy, as because, you know, we are a business that relies heavily on international borders, whether or not Malaysia opens up and how they open up really affects our business. And secondly, in this time, I would like to ask for any funding opportunities in, in, in the form of grants or, you know, or loans um, to help us cushion ourselves during this, you know, uncertain time period. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sophia. Um, is there any uh, questions uh, from the audience? No, if not, maybe I'll just uh, ask uh, uh, one question again to, uh, to Sophia. Very, mm. It's a very interesting uh, presentation you made regarding, I uh, like a point about uh, debt bondage elimination. Yeah, mm. I think it's a very important aspect of, of, your, of uh, that business. So, uh, mm. Um, just one question. Uh, what is the most important, if I can ask you, one, mm. what's the most important need you have uh, for Pink Collar Agency now? So that, uh, so that uh, the audience uh, uh, would know. Yeah. The biggest need you have now. 
Yeah, I, I would say the biggest need for us right now is to cushion ourselves financially, given the uncertainty the next few months. So we would, you know, like to seek for advice on funding. Um, either in a form of you know, grants um, or loans. So I like to have conversations with people who would have a good idea of you know, who we can be connected with, especially investors or you know, just funders who would be interested in the kind of work that we do. Very good, uh, Sophia. So funders out there, uh, people with capital, right? Uh, people with uh, grant money. Um, well, you heard uh, Sophia. Please connect with her um, for, for her Zoom meetings which uh, Sophia will set up with you. Uh, get in touch with her. And, uh, yeah, we already, her. we already posted a Zoom link on our exhibitor profile, so you can search us on the app. Uh, James, Thank you, Sophia. There's one question in the Q&A box. Okay, let me see. Oh, how do, one question. Um, do you manage illegal workers from Indonesia in Malaysia? No, so we only work with work with legal workers and how we do that is we only bring in workers into the country once they've been legally tied to an employer and they found an employer in Malaysia and they have a calling visa attached to the employer's name. I see. Okay, uh, one more question, just a quick one. Mm. Somebody asked, mm -hmm. uh, do you monitor uh, the mental well uh, mental well-being of the migrant workers during the workers' employment period? Yeah, so we don't have a touch-and-go engagement stance with our workers. Um, we actually send follow-up surveys throughout their employment, and if we see any red flags, we do check-ins with them. The Philippines um, Overseas Labor um, Administration also actually requires agencies now to check in with workers quarterly. So we do that with our workers and we have a very thriving, active Facebook virtual group with them and it's always active and they're always talking with us. So we, we can pinpoint when we, when we feel that there are issues and we do reach out to our workers when those things happen. Thank you very much, Sophia. All right. Uh, I think it's been a good session and a learning for all of us, all right? Everyone, yeah. do can get connected with Sophia. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Right. The next uh, exhibitor we have is uh, from uh, Iron Nori. I'd like to invite uh, Bernard Chan from Iron Nori to come on board. Hey, hi. Uh, thank you, James. Uh, this is Bernard over here from Iron Nori over in Singapore. Yeah, uh, and, and a huge welcome to all the friends overseas. So I'm actually uh, the operation consultant for the iron groups. And we do have uh, quite a few companies uh, under our names. The first of course will be the iron nori brands. And today my main aim will be really to be sharing this information across to the uh, international crowd that we see in this webinar today. And uh, what we will be looking out for is actually the possibility for, uh, for funders or even actually investors to be coming over into Singapore. And uh, I'm going to share with you a little bit of our concepts, how we run our business over within Singapore, how we carry on with these strong social missions. So at the end of the webinar, I'm going to share a bit of my information and we really will welcome collaborators coming into our network cross with us. Okay, so I, I'm actually going on over to the next slide. Uh, Eliza, I mean, you need to be on full screen and the next slide. Okay, yes, uh, so we have just started this whole business uh, from uh, three years ago, all the way until now, and everything has been smooth selling so far. We are actually a special needs group. Special needs meaning we have been focusing very strongly uh, on uh, special needs individuals like those with intellectual challenges, those who are autistic, uh, Down syndrome, and actually we are serving the underserved community. Underserved meaning ex-offenders, ex-drug users, and sometimes actually low income individuals. And in the last uh, three years, uh, we've been holding almost quarterly events, uh, hosting such individuals. And of course, uh, many of them are actually working across within our company. And uh, in the whole, uh, the last three years, we have actually been having approximately 40% of our special needs individual working in the company. And uh, the, other, the other probably 20 to 30% are actually underserved community meaning uh, the ex-offenders, ex-drug users, to even including low-income individuals. So from three years ago until now, uh, we've been operating quite a few trials and concept stores and all has been running uh, to, to fruition. Okay, so I, 
I'm going to, to go to the next slide. Uh, Eliza, if I can have the next slide. Yes, and uh, over here in the picture, what you will see uh, one of our restaurants over in Singapore, McPherson's. And uh, in, the, in the restaurant itself, there's actually a staff of approximately six individuals. And out of these six, uh, we have actually one mild intellectual disabled staff, one autism spectrum disorder staff, one ex-offender, and one dyslexic. And along the way, we have always been uh, getting a job coach help, help from uh, SG Enable. SG Enable is a Singapore uh, uh, multi-agency combination whereby a lot of our underserved community has been receiving help. And let me share a little bit more uh, where we are at. The whole team has actually had approximately 12 years of experience working with special needs individual. And uh, this started off uh, with uh, our head chef being a trainer across for special needs individual in special needs schools. And only in uh, very recent years, uh, we have started opening up almost as a franchising opportunity across to our families with special needs individual. I, I give some example. We started off purely just as a special needs restaurant, but after a few years, uh, some of the family members came over to us and said that they really, really needed help to look for a future, to look for uh, another job across for their child, maybe their son or their daughter, who might be intellectually challenged. And they know that it's not easy to be looking a job across for them. They came over to us, asking us to hire them. But uh, we also shared across with them that we can only hire so many. I cannot hire 20 staff in one single restaurant. But why don't let's, let's do it the other way around. Let me help you as a special needs family start a small food franchise by yourself. We are not going to charge you money across for it. We will support you by starting your small little, it can be a hawker store, it can be a small little uh, restaurant. We help you to start it. We will help you to teach you what to do. We will help you to employ people. We will support your special needs kids. Uh, to be one of the few workers within that new restaurants. And even the food supplies will help you to be supplying over to you and creating a concept, creating the menu. So that's what we have been doing in the past three years. And I think we have came to a quite, quite a fair bit of results. So can I have the next slide, please? Okay, so to share with you the journey in the last uh, two years, we started off having a location over in Ocean Road in Singapore. So that was the uh, proof of concept and that, that was uh, uh, really fantastically well. But the location has been a little bit small. So we shifted over to another location called Jalan Wangi. And uh, that's where we, we had our second locations. Concurrently in 2018 March, we have a franchisee that started called Chameleon over in the arcade in uh, Raffles Place, Singapore. And uh, that, that franchise until today is actually still running. And uh, we actually took over at the location at Jiang Wangi in uh, August 2018. And even until today, we are still functioning across from there. And in between there, we have had locations over in uh, Parkway Parade Shopping Center. And uh, now the very recent setup that we have from February this year was actually to be running a cafe and pub over in Tanjung Paga, Singapore. So this is a, a little bit illustration of our journey over the last two years that how we've been helping franchisees to be starting their locations. And uh, of course, the next setup is actually a, a cafe and pub locations. So you can go over to the next slide. This is the journey over the uh, last few years. So starting from September 17th, that's where we started the whole concept with a celebrity chef uh, helping us with the whole ideations. And of course, uh, that has moved on uh, over the past uh, few years. And uh, we had many uh, rounds of food tasting and even committed to employing head chef uh, and a culinary team and coming with the R&D. Of course, uh, July 18 was a, was a key point in time where we started our Ultram Road locations. And that's where we had our Series A of our injector funding coming in. So of course, uh, we are still at Series A. We have started only scaling from August 18, and that's where we are at today, starting out a new uh, cafe and pub location over in Tanjung Paga. And uh, maybe the sharing across to all of you guys today is that uh, uh, we are really looking at scaling up this possibility to have a few more other locations within Singapore. And uh, if you are managing any family office, any uh, philanthropy directions, or even if you have a VC fund working across uh, with you, uh, what we are actually able to do is that uh, we have a few shareholders who are probably looking at uh, locating their families over within Singapore. So there's a few possibility of uh, working arrangements 
whereby uh, families and shareholders are able to work within Singapore. So it might be a little bit of migration possibilities that we can work with. Uh, the other possibility that we are working for is also families with special needs individuals. And when I say uh, family with special needs, like example, if uh, your, your employer or even your, the family that you're looking for, some of them, if, if they have an intellectually challenged child or even a, an autism child or even a Down syndrome child, where they're looking at some possibility of finding work, and if it's not possible within your home country or within which, wherever you are at, I think we are very ready to start up and to set up a small little business within Singapore for this child. And uh, the third part that what we are keen and ready to be doing is that actually we have been running special needs trust across for some of the families. So what do I mean by special needs trust? So this will be trust funds that uh, will be there for the sustenance of the uh, special needs child. Okay, so uh, let's go on over to the next slide. Okay, so this will be part of the expansion plan that I've been sharing across with, with all of you. And our main focus that we are actually looking at is to start a responsible drinking locations. This, this location actually has already been confirmed. We have already started it. It's over in uh, Tanjung Paga 116. And uh, we have already been running over in March. That's all the way until where COVID came in that we have to uh, close it for a short while due to the country's uh, circuit breaker measures. But uh, we are actually restarting it from early June because the circuit breaker measures will be lifted off. And uh, we are actually using this to challenge a little bit the concept of uh, persons with disability selling alcohol. I do understand that uh, there may be ethical concerns, yeah, but over in the place where we are at, it's not a pub whereby it's messy, noisy, uh, fighting area. It's actually a location of more responsible drinking. It's a bistro locations whereby a fair combination of food and alcohol coming together. And actually that's based in a very famous location in Singapore called Tanjung Paga where uh, it's a very culturally inclined near to where our Chinatown area is. So uh, we are pretty confident that, uh, that that area is doing well, and that's where we'll be working towards uh, for the next, uh, next half of the year. Uh, so actually, I've uh, listed down some of my contact information over in the chat message. And uh, for all of you who are keen to collaborate across with Iron Nori, you can contact me on my email. I've also placed my LinkedIn profile over there. And uh, if you guys need some of our social media details, you can always look at uh, this social profile called Iron Supper Club. And we are, we are on both our Facebook and Instagrams. Yes, thank you. So uh, to the next slides. I think that's the last slides. I will take some questions over here uh, with James before we can actually hand over to the next speaker. Thank you, Bernard. You just made all of us uh, hungry again. Uh, just when I thought <laughs> Thank I, you. Yes. I took my breakfast, but now uh, <laughs> it's early lunch for me. <laughs> maybe. Yes, okay. Yes, very yeah. interesting uh, story that you're sharing and the impact they're creating for the special needs uh, people. Uh, there was one question uh, that came on. Um, the person asked if do you, do you charge any fees for special needs trust? Okay. Uh, so this is a very interesting part over here. I'm going to answer this question live. Uh, we, you might be surprised. Most of the time, we do not charge any fees for special needs trust at all. Uh, the reason because is that the Singapore government has been very, very encouraging in this perspective. There is a, this group called SNTC, Special Needs Trust Company within Singapore, that is able to be setting this up across for whether Singaporean or non-Singaporeans. So that is the setup that we've been using. Of course, uh, independently, uh, the very interesting part is that I am not a full employee within the Ayanori Group. I'm actually the consultant and a volunteer over here. And in my personal perspective, actually I manage finances and because I'm a volunteer, so actually a lot of time I, we do not charge for all this setup at all. Yeah, so, so that's, that's where we are at. Even on the franchisees that we're actually creating, we do not charge franchisee fee. Our only suggestion across the to them is that let us carry on supplying you the food supply and the expertise so that we can maintain a contact across over with you. So that's, that's where we are at. Yeah, we have always been told by many of our friends that this is not a very clever perspective. But I think it's, it's, it's this passion that keeps us going in this direction. So thank you. Thank you, James. Very good. Yeah, all of you heard that. Yeah, so uh, do support uh, Bernard and uh, Ian Nori. Yeah. Um, maybe just one last question um, to, to close this off. Um, what is the, may I ask, what is the biggest need that you have at the moment? I, I guess the biggest need is really about our expansions. 
And uh, in Singapore, thankfully, I think we are the longest uh, special needs restaurant in Singapore, 12 years so far. Uh, we are based in Nai Jalan Wang Yi. Uh, I know there are other special needs restaurants in Singapore. They have opened and they are closed. And I guess uh, what we really need right now is it's about collaborations. Many FMB partners, many special needs individuals only work by themselves or by just those families. Uh, we want collaborations. We want people to come in together. Uh, you may not be an FMB partner, but we are sure that we can find ways to work with you. We are able to help you to, uh, to spearhead a little bit of your CSR direction, uh, maybe a little bit of social giving and uh, a little bit of philanthropy coming in. So we need collaborations. And uh, many of you guys, uh, please uh, drop me an email. I think I sent my information on the chat groups. Uh, I would love to connect across with you guys. Will do. Okay, there's, uh, maybe we have time for just uh, one more question. Uh, very quickly, share with us, right? Uh, how do you develop the franchise? There's a question. Okay, uh, thank you, thank you. And actually, our franchise, uh, we have operationalized in a few locations, uh, over in uh, Parkway Parades in Singapore, over in uh, Raffles Place. So what we do is that uh, we use a very unique uh, food preparation method called vacuum pack. And uh, it's, a, it's a blast freeze process. So this is a process whereby we, we start to prepare all the foods, but we actually use, uh, we suddenly lower the temperature and keep it in a vacuum bag so that actually there is no need for, for any form of preservatives. So this is one of the techniques that we actually be using. It's a, it's a technique that a lot of people know, but uh, not many companies are actually utilizing it. So this is the, one of the methods. And of course, financially, what we do is that we, we go along a direction that we want to help a special needs family. We want to help uh, groups around who are keen to participate in to create this further awareness of the special needs community. Yeah, thank you, James. Thank you, Bernard. So uh, rest of you do connect uh, with Bernard after this session. All right, thank you. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye. All right. Next, uh, we'll invite uh, Stevens Chan uh, to talk about and share a story on uh, Dialogue in the Dark. Over to you, Stevens. Yes, thank you, James. Good morning. Uh, my name is Steven Chan, uh, the founder of Dialogue in the Dark, uh, which is managed and operated by DeepMind Academy Malaysia, which is an, an accredited social enterprise uh, recognized by MAGIC and the Ministry of Entrepreneurship Development in Malaysia. So I lost my eyesight at the age of 45, due to glaucoma and diabetic uh, retinopathy. I used to be a very busy entrepreneur until I lost my eyesight uh, back in 2007. Uh, thank God, uh, in 2009, after coming out of darkness, I uh, began my social work journey. I started and founded the Malaysia Glaucoma Society in an attempt to create more awareness about this silent tip of sight. Uh, that's nearly 11 years ago. Moving on then, uh, as I see the needs of the uh, visually impaired in, in the other disabled communities in our country, I started a movement called Dogs for Sight, uh, which was to bring in the guide dog school into Malaysia. So I started that movement and I brought in the first guide dog into Malaysia. And through that work, we started a non-profit organization to reach out to even more uh, patients with uh, various kinds of visual uh, disorders. And soon, uh, even people from the other impact communities as well. And then in 2012, uh, thank God again, we came across Dialogue Social Enterprise, which managed and operated the Dialogue in the Dark uh, franchise all around the world. And thankfully, they agreed to partner with us. And that's how I brought Dialogue in the Dark uh, into Malaysia. Uh, as a social entrepreneur, uh, social enterprise, uh, our aim was actually to dialogue in the dark. Prayfully, we'll be able to find the funds to sustain our ongoing community and social work so without solely to just depend on handouts, donations, or even grants. So, um, thankfully, I also have a board who is very supportive of my work. Uh, besides me, there's my boss, there's my wife, uh, Kay, uh, associate professor, Dr. Pu, who is a professor with this uh, high, uh, Harriet Ward University, and uh, Miss Debbie Pu, who is a HR consultant. Uh, our management team is actually 50% sighted and 
non-sighted. So what is our goal with Dialogue in the Dark? Uh, well, Dialogue in the Dark has been around the world for 30 plus years. In Malaysia, uh, in all over the world, uh, we want to just transform this landscape of people looking at a disabled person. Uh, how do you see a blind person? The question I always ask people, do you see them with sympathy? Do you see them with apathy? Or do you see them with empathy? And that's what we are all heading into. We pray and hope that through these dialogues, they will begin to see their capabilities and not really their disabilities because many of them are able. It's just that they lack the opportunities. And since starting uh, the Dialogue in the Dark exhibition, we have impacted more than 30 over thousand visitors. Uh, we have done about 100 over uh, education, uh, corporate workshops and events. And we have trained and impacted uh, more than 100 visually impaired and physically impaired trainees. Yeah, uh, we've been doing this since 2014. So we started the first center in the, right in downtown, at the, formerly the world's highest tower, uh, the KL Twin Towers. We were in petrol signs. And since then, we've been like a nomad. We've moved from uh, petrol signs to a mall in uh, PJ. Uh, that's another part of Malaysia, Klang Valley. Uh, it's a mall called the school. Then we were in uh, Sunway University for a while before uh, now landing at our latest venue, which is the Welt, uh, a mall again in uh, downtown Kuala Lumpur, just adjacent to the KL Towers. So that's where we are. And Dialogue in the Dark is an important anchor for our academy because it is through Dialogue in the Dark that we train our impact beneficiaries. Be as soon as they attain the self-esteem, the confidence about their capabilities, then that's where we move them into our different academies, uh, schools within the academy itself, which was started in collaboration with partners. Yeah, Dialogue is with Dialogue Germany. The others that we have, like the School of Aromatherapy, Urban Farm Call Centre, uh, learning programs, uh, digital commerce, arts and dance, uh, these are all in collaboration with partners like Microsoft for Good, uh, Saspadi, which is a public listed education provider, uh, with ASEAN School of Barista, and uh, just to name a few of these partners. Uh, we believe in collaboration. We work with all of these partners. We just renovate their platforms to accommodate our impact uh, friends so that they can also manage and operate uh, these enterprises or jobs when they graduate from our academy. Yeah, so post COVID-19 and post MCO will, prove, uh, will, will pose a very big challenge for Dialogue in the Dark, especially with social distancing. So for the past two months during this MCO period, lockdown, or in Singapore, we call it the circuit breaker period, we have uh, been fast forwarding some of our enterprise programs mainly focusing on digital. And first off is of course our learning program and education program, uh, where we have been working with Saspadi, uh, our country's largest uh, public listed education content provider, to tweak uh, their online education platform so that the blind, who has always been depending on Braille and other learning resources, which are non-portable and very expensive, then they can now study anytime, anywhere, online, safely, uh, remotely through this education platform. And the, the, the additional uh, advantage of this platform is, of course, uh, that the coaches and the tutors themselves are also the impact community, blind, the blame as well, who are graduates or adult professionals who have lost their um, physical abilities in some way, so that they can now earn as well while tutoring and mentoring these students. Other programs is our call center, uh, customer service calls, uh, which can be done remotely as well, and digital commerce and also our uh, cafe, uh, where we are working with uh, food delivery apps like Grab and Foodpanda uh, to our 
little cafe there in our center where we pair this food uh, together with some of our trained uh, impact beneficiaries uh, to market and sell uh, coffee and pre-baked cu cuisines in some of our sandwich sandwiches sorry over this uh, grab uh, and, and food panda application so this is what we are doing fast forwarding while we wait for the norm to come back uh, god knows when that will come back but in this new norm we are uh, prayfully hoping to get our team uh, currently we have 12 of them uh, to move into this new norm and to earn digitally as well uh, while we wait for the old norm to come back yeah so we are hoping that through this uh, TVN conference be able to be uh, connected to investors to invest our in our social impact so that more of these uh, people can uh, learn to earn their income as well so thank you uh, yeah I'm open to any question uh, is there any questions uh, that anybody would like to raise yeah maybe yeah stevens we can see yes. that there's a lot of things uh, you have done over the last uh, decade right uh, yeah. and the impact and the transformation you have you have uh, given to many people yeah and it's interesting to note that you have uh, three pillars uh, dialogues to raise awareness for your for for the people with special needs like and then uh, academies for training right skills training and also uh, call centers and um, even digital commerce yeah so so it looks like uh, you you do have a uh, big plans and uh, big ambitions to to serve this uh, this uh, special needs people yeah yes, so may, yes, may yes. i ask what what is uh, maybe uh, what are the two big uh, challenges or two biggest needs that you need uh, in the next uh, six months so that maybe we can reach out to the right audience to look for partnership with uh, yourselves as much as i like to say i think everyone of us are all looking for funding but I'd rather look at it as an investment, uh, not loans, not grants, which is again uh, something that is, uh, again, uh, with these unforeseen circumstances, uh, what we really need is investment. We would rather look at investment, that they are investing in uh, a future, these people's future. And who knows, uh, yeah, God really, uh, through this investment, they can see even more uh, people around not only in Malaysia, but prayfully, we hope that in, in ASEAN as well. And we, of course, uh, through this investment, we also need uh, talent capital, uh, especially in the technical side. Uh, as we develop all this digital work uh, to make sure it's barriers free. Um, not many people are aware that there are many websites, uh, many apps, which is still not accessible enough for the blind uh, like for myself if, if you ask me to go back to braille uh, i think i won't be here today <laughs> i'll probably be be, be uh, cocoon somewhere uh, but thanks to technology and because of accessible technology i, I can now navigate uh, on my phone of course with some assistance as well but i can do my whatsapp my my, my zoom on my own yeah uh, and that's technology and but it can be further skill and that's where we lack like the investment capital to hire these technical talents to to help us yeah make it more okay. accessible thank you uh stevens there are two yes. more questions that came up uh one is uh how do you manage cash flow by opening several centers across areas uh i have only one center not several center okay. uh, but our cash flow is not really but our biggest challenge was always with venues yeah um, mm. uh, as you know because uh, challenge is always uh, uh, corporate still see uh, special needs uh, investment as a charity base mm. so when it comes to values that that's always a challenge there for us uh, where we can only work a certain period of time and they probably look at it as a csr approach and then after that they move on uh, with I the see. next one yeah, I see. Okay, second question, uh, maybe is yeah. uh, the last question. Uh, how I think all myself included as an uh, audience that asked, how does the online format of digital, you know, work in the in the dark? You know, 
how, how does it work? How does technology? <laughs> now, now we are calling it dialogue out of the dark. Uh, oh. uh, they, how does it work? I, mean, they, I don't know who the, the questioner is, but if you are using a smartphone, Android or iPhone, if you are using an iPhone, you just have to activate your app called Voice Over, and it will talk whatever it is on the screen to you and it will teach you how to navigate and some of my team members can even go shopping on Lazada and Shopee. Um, if you are on Android, it's called TalkBack and it mm -hmm. gives the same, almost the same function as the iPhone mm -hmm. and they can just navigate it. Uh, a lot of them book their Grab. I book my Grab on my own yeah, uh, so that they can move everywhere anywhere safely okay interesting maybe i should yeah. check that out too <laughs> yes, 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 yes thank you yes, yes. Yes. thank you thank, thank you. you very much uh stevens all right uh um thank you for your time yeah. and uh, yeah. the audience do reach out to uh uh stevens yeah, we have really set up the, the, sorry, the zoom in our, uh, our profile there so i'll be okay. there until about 11 yeah thank you very much stevens thank you james thank, thank you, you uh, stevens thank you Next uh, session, we'd like to welcome uh, Cindy Leong from uh, Silent Teddies. Is Cindy there? Hello. Hello. Cindy, are you online? Uh, yes. Okay, please take can you hear? Can you hear me? Yes. All right, please, uh, please carry on. Okay. A very good morning to everyone. My name is Cindy Leong, the founder of Silent Teddy in Malaysia. It is a small enterprise. Uh, thank you very much uh, to TBN Asia and also to thank you to Magic for sponsoring my stock this, for this event. Okay, next. Hello, can you hear me? The yes. Okay, the Community Service Center started in 1995 to provide free education to the deaf community. We started a baking project to help the deaf who have graduated to learn some vocational skills while waiting for employment. Fast forward, our bakery became a social enterprise. We have trained more than, over more than hundreds of deaf youth at Silent Teddy's um, work uh, in different work sessions. Okay, next slide. So this drives us to continue our mission to empower the deaf uh, in this society. And this is what is our main challenge in Silent Teddy. In Malaysia, uh, we did a survey with the human resource and we found out that there is an estimated about 32,000 uh, deaf in Malaysia. The disability is invisible and large number of them have been left out, untrained, unemployed. Public do not understand that yet the future, the culture and communication is a great barrier to them. Next. Okay, this is a virtual uh, circle of how we solve our, power, our solution. Uh, okay, we came up with um, bakery. We set up a bakery. We have get job space for them. We employ them, and we also provide jobs opportunity to them, and also a social level of uh, well-being. And this, and in Silent Teddy, we became a vehicles of changing them uh, as a platform to help them and we provide jobs opportunity for them in our food and uh, beverage industries. Next. Okay, this is our beneficiaries and we, they are from the deaf, the hearing impacts and from the B40 communities. So these are some of the children in the center you can see and, and, and our trainees at the bakeries. Next. 
Okay, our cookies, uh, markets, and how our actual business model. Uh, Silent Teddies, we produce uh, corporate gift, uh, cookies for festivals, cookie for hampers, and cookie for dog gift. So uh, we have 25 products that is HALA certified by Jakim. And Silent Teddy is also granted the Social Enterprise Accreditation by the Ministry of Entrepreneur Development and Cooperation last year. So uh, this is the market. Okay, next. Uh, go to the marketplace. This is our plan. We want to upscale and we want expansions uh, in our business. And also we want to uh, have e-commerce. This is one of the major things we need funding to go into. And we also need expertise to come in to help us in our e-commerce. And, and we also um, we want to increase our visibility and also we need growth in our plans. Next. Okay, uh, this is the social impact. Okay, uh, we have, uh, we provide workforce and we have job opportunity and we also help to increase economy in the country where we help the government, where the deaf are trained and they have um, at least above, uh, we want them to work at least have minimum above uh, wages where we can help the government. Next. Hello. Okay. The fundings we need to upscale our growth. We need tools. Uh, we need tr many marketing tools. Uh, we need trainings. And with all these fundings uh, that can be upscaled, we can employ more dev uh, in this society. Okay, uh, this is the services provided by Silent Teddies. We are the manufacturers of cookies. And our first collaboration project is with AirAsia, where we sell our cookie on the plane. And that is how uh, we started this project. As a, and currently we are collaborating with uh, Starbucks. We are supplying to 268 uh, uh, our cookies to 268 outlet Hall of Malaysia. Um, we also uh, a group of sign language interpreters where we also provide sign language interpreting services to the beneficiary and as well to the public. And we also conduct sign language classes. And the effort that we make is actually goes to into our learning center where all our beneficiary, uh, we provide free education to the deaf. Okay, uh, this is our management team. And the management team is made up of myself and a, fan and a person, uh, Rose is the financial, uh, in charge of financial and we have a quality control. And the baking team and the production team are all run by the, entirely by the deaf. Next. Okay, uh, if you, you, you want to contact us, you can have, uh, oh, this is the link where they can contact us and you can Google to or Facebook to it. it. Hello, next. Okay, hello. Uh, I'd like to share with you a little video of achievement of Silent Teddy. Teddy focus on baking fresh, humble handmade cookies. We have a wide variety of delicious cookies, breads and muffins. Every cookies is made with great love. 
by the deaf community. The deaf are unique to this business as they have heightened senses such as taste and smell, which makes them perfect bakers. Walking down the street, I see a lot of children loitering. Many of them are deaf, thinking they have no future. It touched my heart to take action, to carve a path for our deaf members to stand on the feet with their heads held high long after I'm gone. What better way than to create job opportunity for them with something they are good at? At our kitchen, we train and empower deaf community and their families through the baking business and income earned. Here, they find a place to grow and to call home. It was tough initially. The public do not understand the deaf culture and we cannot compete with the well-known bakeries in town. We have to make sure our cookies are not only good, but super good. Now our production has increased from 1,000 to 10,000 packets per month. Many large companies have begun purchasing our cookie because of the quality. We wish to take on the next step and set up a gluten-free kitchen to supply a new range of products throughout Malaysia. It's going to be exciting. Magic has helped many social entrepreneurs like us to connect and create greater impact in the society. I did not make the journey here alone. Many have supported us along the way. Be grateful. They mean the world to me. Thank you, uh, Cindy. Hi. Yeah. Hi. It's really a very inspiring uh, story that uh, really touched, I think, most of our hearts, what you've been doing, right, uh, in this uh, special needs community. Yeah. I, um, yeah, I'm taking uh, one question from the floor uh, to ask, uh, how do you manage to uh, work with uh, Starbucks and AirAsia, these two big names uh, from the uh, oh. commercial world? Oh because my cookies are super good and yummy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure, yeah. yes. Yeah, it's also collaboration. And we work, actually we started, uh, we collaborate with Starbucks because uh, we first started, we, con we helped Starbucks to, we conduct sign language to their staff. They say sign language is so important to us and also uh, this is one of the milestones that I want to fulfill too, that uh, we want to promote sign language to the people, especially employees of company, where you see one of the examples that Starbucks is doing now, they have many of the uh, dev are trained from the staff and their, their outlets, like they have a signing store in Bangsa and also a signing store in Penang. So it's also provide jobs opportunity for the disabled. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Very good. I mean, uh, yeah. Then in, in, in returns, uh, they, we ask them whether you can help us in our bakery. So that is how we collaborate. And we got our first procurement, uh, first procurement to supply cookies to Starbucks. Okay. Very good. Can I ask, um, yeah, what is the, maybe tell the audience, what is the biggest uh, need you have at the moment okay uh, during convicts that uh, we do not have income and many of our orders have been uh, on hold and be cancelled so what we did is uh, we we need fundings to maintain so that we can keep our workers and we also uh, for their salary at least six months so that uh, we can run the uh, the bakery and also we need expansions and we need also uh, volunteer experts to come in to help us in our e-commerce so that we can bring in more business. You do. Thank you very much, uh, Cindy. I like uh, your company name, Silent Teddies, because Teddies remind me of, uh, symbolizes love and uh, huggability, right? <laughs> Actually, Silent Teddies come from the word silent. Yes. That is deaf. And Teddy come from the word tag, T-E-D. Tech stands for Teenage Entrepreneur Development. So this is a project that
that we ah, help this young deaf to uh, in entrepreneurial skills. Very good. Now I know uh, where Ted is from. I thought it's, uh, you know, the other way you look at it is uh, symbolizes uh, somebody who is uh, lovable and huggable and cute. <laughs> oh, no, no. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you very much, Cindy. Um, Thank you. So all of you out there, please uh, connect with uh, Cindy and uh, Silent Teddies. Thank you, uh, Cindy. Bye. Thank you, James. Next, uh, we have online is uh, Jonathan, uh, who's going to present uh, Agape Connecting People. Over to you, uh, Jonathan. Uh, thanks, James. Hi, uh, everyone. My name is Jonathan. I'm the CFO and Chief People Officer of Agape. Uh, today, I'm going to take you through the journey of uh, Agape and also um, the strategic directions and perhaps uh, the collaborations we can form after the presentation. Agape was founded by Anil, an ex-offender who served time in prison and released only to find that he was uh, in a second prison, the prison of stigma, social stigma. Fueled by the desire to restore his relationship with his family by being a responsible father, he started this call center business from home to make amends and also to contribute back to the society. On the other side of the story, I was actually one of the officers who interacted with Anil when he was incarcerated. And our paths crossed again several years ago and we decided to come together because we share the same beliefs and the values to help those that have fallen through the cracks of the society. Along with our CEO, we are driven by the motivation to make a difference in the lives of these incarcerated peoples, uh, the persons and the ex-offenders, uh, people with disabilities and the single mothers. Uh, next slide. We pride ourselves as a value-driven business organization with a vision to be the leading business process solutions provider by transforming lives and enriching the stakeholder value. Our mission is to provide equal reskilling and employment opportunities for a sustainable community transformation. Next slide. Today, with the seed capital from impact investors like some of you here, Agape has scaled up to become a 250-seater call center operating inside prison and outside of prison. At one point of time, we engaged more than 120 incarcerated persons, but we have recently scaled down to 60 or 70 due to the current difficult business environment. If you look at the picture of the lady, uh, she's actually one of our beneficiaries who who we, whom we invested our time and our effort into her lives. And when she was released, she find pleasure in uh, joining us. And today he's one of our best performing call center uh, outside of prison. Um, as a full service BPO provider, we offer inbound and outbound call center solutions, email management services, live chat, and technological solutions to meet the requirements of our clients. Our social mission is to promote inclusive employment opportunities for the disadvantaged and equip them with employable skills so as to uh, uh, promote social mobility and eradicate urban poverty. Next slide, please. Uh, besides call center solutions, we are working to diversify to business verticals such as uh, HR share services to help other like-minded companies to hire and manage their capital, human capital. This idea, business idea came about because a lot of companies are complaining that they, they have difficulties in finding Singaporeans. But what, what they did not know is that there are about 5,000 people releasing from prison every year. And given a second chance, and proper guidance, they too can be contributing citizens. Another business vertical we are expanding into is to help companies to create website or e-commerce platforms. So besides the uh, diversifications of um, revenue drivers, we believe in building strategic capabilities to build organization effectiveness and to future-proof ourselves. So some of the digital, digital developments we have undertaken include being more data-driven when making business decisions, creating an architecture to support the above initiatives, 
by reviewing our current system, our IT solutions, and so on and so forth, and eventually equipping our workforce to learn to embrace data and digitalization. In fact, we have uh, embarked on a journey to accredite our training arm so that um, when, they, when they go out of the workforce, they are their skills are recognized by the country, the, uh, the nationwide uh, uh, companies. To date, we have impacted over 500 lives, but we are going to double this by two, uh, 2022 through organic growth and by strategically positioning ourselves for the next stage, next stage of growth. Uh, next slide, please. We are not only a profit-driven company, but we are also a value-based company. And we believe in giving back to the society using what we have. So some of the achievements and initiative we have as a company includes partnering with uh, this social enterprise called Speak and Spend to provide sanitization uh, services to companies and setting up a national care hotline to provide emotional support to those who are affected by the COVID-19 situation. They include people who has lost their job, lost their loved ones, or under uh, emotional distress because they have to work from home and juggle between work and family. Uh, next slide, please. In the past two months, we have also rallied our employees to distribute food and essential items to our migrant workers who are left stranded and even our senior citizens at nursing homes. Next. At Agape, we believe in co-creation, and this has led to many valuable partnerships and trips to become where we are today. If you look at the picture, this is Gurmit Singh, for those who know him. He used to have a very uh, a promising acting career, but he gave it all up. And he reminded us that it's eventually, at the end of the day, it is the family that matters, and not how much money you have made, uh, how uh, how much pain you have made for yourself. But uh, jokingly, when, when she shared, he shared with us that uh, when he gave up his career and he uh, stayed at home, right, and all his family members are not, not around and he, he was like shouting to the empty space, hello, where are you? I'm giving up my acting career to spend time with you. And yet, most of them are out doing their own business. So this is one of the friends that we have at Akape. Next slide, please. Uh, if you look at the first uh, picture, this is uh, Benny Sito, uh, the founder of uh, 18, uh, 18 Chefs. And he shared uh, with our inmates uh, in the male prison, uh, in the men's prison, about how he struggled, how he quit the addiction of drug and now become where he was. And in the middle of the picture is the, uh, the Minister for Social and Family Development, who, who, who is very impressed by our work. And uh, Irene Ang is the last one. Uh, whose mother is in and out prison and he went into our women prison and share with them the struggles and how 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 she became how she overcome adversity and become where she was today so all these are the friends uh, of Akape that we have uh, uh, we have uh, made over the years uh, next slide please so as we embark on the journey to move from a pure call center to diversify into other business areas, there are three imminent needs from us. We used to hire, the first one, we used to hire more than 120 incarcerated persons, but have since scaled down to around 60. We need more businesses. And if you know of anyone who need the call center solutions or know of any company who wishes to hire uh, ex-offenders, please uh, you know, reach out to us. Uh, and secondly, as an initiative to help single mother to return to workforce, we actually allow interested party to make a donation of a donation to them. So this cost will involve like uh, acquisition of a hardware and a software and a workstation, uh, including headset and IP phone to help them to set up a workstation, a proper workstation from home where they can work and they are free time. So we want to expand our uh, beneficiary base. We want to uh, touch the lives of more uh, single mom and we believe that this work from home model can work for us. And thirdly, 
As we embark on the journey of digital transformation and sailing into uncharted water, we hope to make the journey less bum bumpy. Therefore, we are looking to form an advisory board who can provide guidance for us. And these are the people who can be uh, experienced business leaders who has uh, uh, the current relevant experience in IT solutions or e-commerce platform. So they can provide the guidance for Agape to move on to the next stage. So if you believe in our cause and if you uh, like what we are doing, we love to hear from you. And below is the contact details that you can reach out to us. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, uh, Jonathan. Thank you, yeah, James. This is yeah. indeed a very uh, inspiring story again uh, by Agape. Uh, Thank to, you. To impact lives and uh, provide them uh, with a second chance in life. Well, uh, an audience uh, commented, it's awesome what, what you're doing. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, Thank you. Yes. So, uh, yeah, can I uh, yeah, just uh, ask again, all right, to because we have a couple of minutes uh, available, if you would like to just share again, what are the main challenges, maybe the main challenges that you face? And then again, if there's one uh, high priority now for your business, right, mm -hmm. uh, what would it be? Because I hear that uh, you are actually contributing um, uh, workers uh, to support uh, uh, this pandemic uh, mm -hmm. lockdown and, mm -hmm. and so forth. Uh, that's very uh, encouraging. So um, yeah, what, what would be the, you know, the main challenges and the top, uh, top priority mm -hmm. need you see at the moment? I think like all companies, uh, we, we did not escape from the, this uh, impact from uh, the, this uh, COVID-19 and our businesses has been uh, affected because our client businesses ha uh, has been affected. So um, we need businesses, we need uh, businesses so that we can hire more people and impact more lives. And it is uh, unfortunate that we have to scale down our workforce within prison. And we wanted to impact more lives, but uh, we need to keep ourselves sustainable. Yeah, so uh, we hope to have more businesses from those uh, uh, out there. And even uh, if you don't have, you don't need the call center businesses, but you know of anyone who doesn't mind hiring those uh, disadvantaged people, uh, we will want to help you to manage them, equip them, train them so that they can be contributing to your companies or to, to the organizations. And uh, I think we are also at the next stage of uh, do, uh, going into a digital transformation. And this is like what I mentioned is uncharted water. We really need uh, experienced hands to help us as much as a, as a management team. We, we, we are uh, aligned, we are into this together, but we hope, hope to um, uh, leverage on, on the experience of the people out there who might have a relevant experience, more relevant experience than us. And uh, we hope to, uh, 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 really skill Agape to, to the next to the next level. Thank you, Jonathan. Yeah. yeah. So uh, for all those uh, folks out there who you think you can uh, outsource uh, your business to uh, Agape, you know, please uh, connect with Jonathan. All right. Uh, he needs more partners and uh, collaborations. And also for those of you who needs uh, who is short of uh, labor resources, I think uh, this is a useful. Uh, you know, uh, connection uh, that you have with Agape, right? Uh, thank you, James. So, thank you very much, uh, Jonathan. Yep. So uh, that comes to the end of the, the session. Um, thank you. So uh, for before I hand over the time to, uh, to Alex, just a few uh, um, logistics administration for, for the audience, right? Um, just to give special mention again to PLUS, who is our uh, plus from Indonesia, who is our sessions partner for this Saturday's uh, uh, Social Enterprise Saturday, uh, who is partnering us. And secondly, uh, please do not, do not uh, miss out meeting uh, our TBN Asia team uh, at, at 3 p.m. this afternoon um, through the virtual links that uh, uh, we will be sending out so that you can uh, discuss with us and also to meet the people and also to find out how you can play a part in this uh, whole uh, TBN Asia ecosystem. And, um, and another point is uh, please download for, for those of you who haven't done it. Uh, there's a lot of useful information um, in our TBN Asia conference app. Please download the app to connect with all the parties, the exhibitors uh, who will be 
um, you can reach out to and to find out more about their, their business and causes. All right. And last but not least, please uh, leave your feedback for the social enterprises. The link has been uh, uh, set out in the uh, chat. So please um, give us a useful feedback um, to improve uh, our so-called presentation. All right. And um, appreciate uh, your attendance this morning. And uh, I shall hand over the time now to, to Alex, the next moderator for the next group of uh, companies in the uh, healthcare industry. Right. Over to you, Alex. Thank you, James. Thank you. Can I just check that uh, Janice from Aspire 55 is here? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, great. All right, guys, good morning. You know, one of the best things in this journey of uh, uh, social impact investing is really getting to know the entrepreneurs and listening to their passion and uh, listening to it, it never fails to inspire me. And today, as the first uh, presenter we've got, exhibitor we've got here, is Janice Chia from Aspire 55. Um, I read a statistic, something about by 2050, about half the population in Singapore would be above 65, nearly half. So Janice has uh, Janice's enterprise goes around trying to go to the root of this problem. So I'll pass the time over to Janice. Great. Um, I'll share screen. Should I turn my video on or leave it? You can turn it on, yes. Okay. Okay, hi everybody, good morning. Hello Alex, thanks for moderating. Um, my name is Janice from Aspire 55. Aspire 55 is a virtual retirement village in Singapore and we aim to create a spin on the idea of virtual retirement villages. So the concept originally started from the US where if you have a virtual retirement village, a lot of the activities take place on the online space and the connections take place online and okay and it's also a very non-profit environment. When I met the founders of some of the virtual retirement villages in the US, um, I, I talked to them about the business model and whether or not I should go the route of being a non-profit or a for-profit social enterprise. And we went the route of a for-profit social enterprise because we believe that um, aging is a social and economic opportunity. And in the long run, a village model like this could help to serve aging in place and to help more older people to age in an affordable manner. So we have three pillars of what we do. We hope to make older people stronger as they age, supported as they age, and happier as they age. So very much like a family environment. But what do a lot of older people um, who are not typical exercise bunnies hate? They hate walking into a gym and they hate seeing the big fitness equipment out there. So we, we, we created a family style clubhouse to support our village concept um, as a result. Aspire 55 has two clubhouses in Singapore and we hope to build more. The story started with grandma and when I looked at how different generations of older people were aging, I realized that every generation has different needs and expectations. And as we move from grandma's generation to my generation to my parents, the different generations that flow through will have different desires about how they age. And even for my grandmother, she didn't believe that as she aged, she would be frill and then end up in a nursing home. She wanted to age, be independent, be healthy, and maybe towards the end of her life, which she had um, just three months of palliative care and then she would pass away in her sleep, which was exactly the route that grandma had. And in order to influence her to lead a healthier lifestyle, I realized that a lot of time has to be spent to convince her to do the exercises with her and to put her in a socially interactive environment where other people were like-minded. So like-minded is one of the keywords of our Aspire 55 village to help them find like-minded friends. This is just some of the media coverage we've had over the years. And the BBC news coverage is actually featured on the uh, exhibitor listing in TBN Asia. So you can go inside there to have a look at the videos. This is the Aspire 55 advisory board. So we're very happy to have with us from uh, a variety of industries, uh, supporters, to help to shape the village uh, services. So let me talk more about what the village is. So we are catering to people who are age over 50. 
Um, and it's supposed to bring about um, an environment that allows like-minded people to age successfully. As you know, the concept of retirement villages is talked about a lot in many parts of Singapore and around the world. And can we have more retirement villages in Singapore for the aging population? But if we have more and more retirement villages, the cost of each retirement village and the monthly fees are going to be really, really expensive. And if people are going to live past 100, that's not going to be an affordable option. So instead, via this virtual retirement village model where we built clubhouses, all the activities surround around the smaller clubhouses and our members would actually continue to go home and, and live at home. So what happens right now in this clubhouse setting is that our members would come for twice a week strength training programs and they would do brain gym, health monitoring um, and supporting that, all the other services we have include over 100 events that we run for them using other facilities outside and even taking them on holidays overseas. And if they need help, just with a WhatsApp concierge service, they are able to contact us with any requirements they need from lifestyle services, nursing care services, home care services, transportation services. Um, they'll even message us on how do I get on Zoom? How do I use the technologies? So we help our members to be their grandchild or their son who is too busy at work to assist sometimes and we help to do all that small nitty gritty details. But at the end of the day, we believe that in order to successfully age in place, you need to have the health, which is why you see health at the forefront. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. These are the locations of the two clubhouses that we have. So each clubhouse is about a thousand square foot and it's designed to look like a very friendly um, exercise uh, facility for them together with kitchen facilities and dining facilities so that we are encouraged to eat together as well. This let's right now hear from one of our members about what she thinks. Should there be audio playing, Janice? Yes, there is audio. Are you unable to hear it? I did not hear it. Okay, let me stop the video. You'll want to click uh, to use the computer sound when you share your screen. Stop sharing. I hated to go into gym. Can you hear it now? Because over yeah. there, you know, this modern gym, it goes boom, 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 boom. And all the muscle men and muscle women. And me, little old lady, I'm 72. My goodness, I feel really uncomfortable. Until my friend almost dragged me by my nose coming here. But once I'm here, I tell you, it's just a sense of well-being, a sense of comfort because I know that when I'm here, nobody's going to laugh at me, right? We're all friends. And beside that, there is just so many activities that this founders of this organization has helped us. So it's really what we call a virtual retirement village. It's so small, and yet look at it, it's a village because we have activities outdoors as well as to build up our muscles so that we can go rock climbing, we might go canoeing, not me, but a dragon boat, and we have lots of food and fun. So this is my gym, and I'm very proud to show it off. So inside this clubhouse, we chose to focus on senior fitness because one thing we need is for them to build up the strength and their balance and to prevent falls, which is one of the biggest challenges of the aging population. Um, through this seniors fitness uh, concept and program, they exercise in small groups, enabling them to make friends very easily. And with this, we also look at the idea that Hey, you know, actually for every older person, they, they are very used to going to the doctors every, every quarter to get more medicine and that's to control their chronic diseases. But how about if we manage their fitness so that in future, they will take less and less medication for their chronic diseases, instead be stronger and stronger so that they can be more independent and less reliant on medication. So each session is always supervised by a trainer. Um, they will remember more about what the trainer likes to do and what likes to eat, what his love life is, than actually what their fitness program is. But what it is, is that, you know, it's very easy for them to do it, they enjoy, and it's very conversational. 
So at the end of the day, our attendance is full attendance, 96 times a year. And we've been doing this for the last six years in Singapore. So these are some of the measurements in their senior fitness. They also get a report cut on their fitness improvement. Within 10 weeks of the trial program, we're able to show them the improvements in their fitness status. Um, I think a lot of older people need some encouragement, but we also see that aging is not one homogeneous society. So older people come and exercise with us in uh, their different age groups. So we found that there's three specific age groups that come to us, the new ages, um, they, they are more into fun, they want to stay active and fit, sociable. And then the middle ages who are now realizing that could be aging a little bit, they, they get some aches and pains, but through exercise and through interaction, they can meet more people. And also a lot of husbands and wives come in um, because they are trying to help each other to build a social network before one passes on um, before the other. So it's to, to do a lot of advanced planning for that aging stage. And then the mature ages who are more like grandma's age, 75 plus, um, they, they have, you know, their strength has deteriorated quite a little bit, but through the regular activities, they find that they're slowly building all these uh, fitness back and their social environment. They live all over Singapore. And here are just some pictures. And our circuit breaker activities. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Janice. Thank you. That's really impressive. I think what really comes through is the enthusiasm of the members through physical well-being and certainly emotional well-being from the connections with one another. I think I, I heard something about uh, one of the members saying that she's not missed a single session in a year and, and most of them <laughs> do not. So hats off to you. Thank you. Okay. Um, next, we've got an entrepreneur. Let me just see. There's one question that just came, came on. With a possible new norm of a COVID-19 lifestyle, how do you provide your service? So instead of physical exercises in the clubhouse, we have live exercises with the trainers and via Zoom. Um, before we implemented the live exercises, we actually um, conducted exercise programs for them in the clubhouse itself. But now that there is uh, a COVID-19 period, we had to teach them all the new technologies, then teach them the exercises online, and then followed by um, a lot of Zoom sessions on anything from cooking to Zumba, uh, to dancing classes, um, exercise talks, um, doctor's talk, wellness talk. So we've organized, we basically brought all the activities on the offline environment directly to online. And as part of drive caters to the middle income market, um, because Singapore has so many other services out there, we wanted to differentiate and we did look for a very niche market, which is the middle income baby boomers. Right. So they are willing to pay a little bit, but not a lot. So we, we've charged something a little bit more affordable, but not overly expensive. Right, that's great. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Janice. Thank you. Um, next, we've got an entrepreneur whose childhood experience has informed his current venture. LiveFold is a life sciences company that attempts to tackle infectious diseases such as dengue and malaria with a very specific target that they aim to impact every year. I'll let Holden Basie who's calling in from uh, Atlanta to explain more. Take it away, Hogan. Uh, thank you, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here and get to present um, to the TPN family. Um, next slide, please. My name is Hogan Bassi. I'm the CEO and founder of Liffo, a biotech company on a mission to save 200,000 lives per year from mosquito and bacterial borne diseases. So the problem is we have a million people a year that die from malaria and we don't have a solution currently to protect those people. So we created a product called the Kiva and it gives people over 16 hours of protection. It's clean and it's incredibly effective to keep mosquitoes off for long periods of time. Growing up in Nigeria, mosquito-borne diseases are a way of life. I wanted something that didn't interrupt my daily life that would keep mosquitoes away. And so at 10 years old, right after having malaria, I got frustrated, went to my mom's bathroom and mixed some stuff together, and I ended up creating a mosquito repellent. And I was super excited. It actually worked. We are in the business of 
creating products that allow people to live life to their fullest. Uh, people can't live life to their fullest potential if they're dead or constantly sick from these easily preventable diseases that trap them in a cycle of poverty. There is no paid time off or sick days. These are people who, if they don't work, they don't make money. If they don't make money, they can't provide for their family. Each of those people has a name, a family who loves them and is going to miss them as they pass away from a disease that is preventable if we just keep mosquitoes from biting people. When I die and go meet my maker, what's my legacy? What did I do to better people here on Earth? So as Hogan described his life story to me, I understood and I said, we've got to do something to help. It's a God calling, so there's no giving up until that mission is accomplished. We, we have this vision that one day in our office we'll have this ticker up on the wall. The moment that one day that ticker hits 200,000, we'll know we've been successful. It's still amazing to watch that video to today. It's, um, it's been such an inspiring journey um, to this point. And um, it's amazing to see how we've matured over the years. We've moved from being um, just a repellent company into being a life science company. And what that video doesn't show is it wasn't making that repellent that made it a life calling at that point when I was 10 years old. Some months later, I saw this video of children um, suffering from sleeping sickness, taking this medication, I mean, it was an injection that um, felt like hot lava through the veins. I'll never forget how the commentator described that injection. And for whatever reason, there was a painless medication that the pharma companies couldn't figure out how to work with the NGOs that were taking care of the children to get the medication to the people who needed it the most. I remember that night when my mom got home, I barged up into her room and I told her I wanted to create a company that got the medication to the children. And that's what we at Liverpool are really passionate about. Next slide. You see, most of the world's, you know, most of the world's resources are used to design innovation for the wealthiest billion people. And so the rest of the world gets what I like to call trickle-down technology. At Liverpool, what we're really passionate about is designing innovation for everyone. We believe that if we design innovations um, for the hardest to reach places, the most resource constrained places, that the innovations are gonna be better off for everyone. Next slide. So we tackle this innovation problem and this access problem, not just through innovation, but also through distribution channels. So we wanna make sure that people who don't have access to traditional distribution models can still buy the best health innovations in the world. So we want to make sure um, that, um, that they don't get left out. They can make purchases. We want to make sure that the distribution, um, that people have access across the whole social economic spectrum, that one market isn't subsidizing another, that we have profitability across the board. And we also, we also want to make sure that we're creating jobs in each and every single context across the supply chain. Next slide. So the first innovation that we've done, which you saw in that video, is our mosquito repellent, which is the first innovation where, we, where we're applying this philosophy. And so it's a repellent without compromise. It's really the best repellent in the world, I kid you not. So it's nature inspired, it protects for 14 plus hours, is safe for two months and older, for two months and older, and is completely gentle on the skin um, and safe everyone in the family can, can really use it. Next slide. And so the technology quite behind this that we we'll feel like we've liberated for the whole world is this technology called StayTech. What StayTech does is a control release technology that keeps the repellent from absorbing into the body and slowly evaporates into there. You see most repellents, the way they work, the reason why they don't work so long is that they absorb into your body and they evaporate too quickly. And so our technology allows us to control that absorption rate, making any repellent that we use with this technology safer and more effective. Next slide. So now what I want to do is walk you through a few business cases on how we are implementing 
um, and, and distributing our mosquito repellent throughout the world and creating social impact. Next slide. So one of the things that we did is we partnered with an NGO um, in Ghana. Um, they actually work across all of Africa. They were facing a little bit of a challenge of getting donor engagement. And they really wanted to partner with us to see how we can solve them. And they got really excited when we told them about our business model and approach. And so we found a community um, of night workers, um, guards that were working at night to see if we could pilot a program and prove social impact get their donors re-engaged and see what could happen and see if we could create a scalable business. In that demographic, 73% of the entire population had malaria the previous year at least one time. And some of them had um, malaria multiple times. When we implemented the project, uh, the, by the end of the project, none of the guards had malaria um, after 100 days. It was really, after 45 days, it was extremely imp impressive. And then we also found a social entrepreneur that helped implement this. And that person was able to create a sustainable business, um, getting thousands of um, 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 companies and um, being able to protect thousands of people um, every month and now has a pathway to a profitable business um, by getting companies to sign up um, to protect their workforce, um, getting um, CSR programs, um, corporate social responsibility programs and getting individuals to subscribe to getting a daily dose of repellent. Next slide. We also partner with the government um, in the Philippines. Um, as many of you are aware, there's a dengue fever outbreak um, that happened right before COVID um, that is still continuing. And so they, they saw this as they were looking for a way to really be able to tackle um, this problem on an individual basis. And so they wanted to do it, they, they would like to do a pilot 700 schools and their family, all the children there, and they wanted to create jobs along the way. And so we implemented a project with them and were in the process of doing that and also creating micro manufacturing jobs along the way. So part of our unique solution in our distribution model is that you can either get business in a box, what we did in the previous version with social entrepreneurs working with the nonprofits that we've partnered with, or in this case, where we're creating micro manufacturing jobs. And so they want to create 70 micro manufacturing facilities all across this area of the Philippines. And so we're really excited about what's going to happen there, where we're going to be able to protect tens of thousands of people. And then we're also going to create 500 plus jobs. Um, this is a really groundbreaking approach um, in the fact that mosquito repellents will get to be used on a daily basis and being used in a vector control situation. Up to now, um, mosquito repellents haven't exactly been used in insect-borne con disease control. And so this is a very exciting um, opportunity. Next slide. Um, another um, case study that we did is partnering with um, a social entrepreneur, um, another SME in Nigeria. And so he has a company that had been struggling with marginal growth and he was really trying to accelerate his business by invigorating his, his product line. And so he partnered with us um, to take on um, our control um, release formulation, um, complete insect propellant, and then also use the excess um, manufacturing capacity that he has on his property. Um, so he manufactures a number of products of this, of this um, lot that he has. And so he added this and um, he's starting off. One of the things that is wonderful is that he has a reach into 300 communities across Nigeria, um, where he does a, a version of multi-level marketing and so he's really excited that the job creations is going to be able to have the possibility of expanding beyond Nigeria into West Africa and relationships he has um, with the government, with the local government in the state in which he, he operates from. And so this is a very exciting opportunity. And so it's not just this approach that we have for all our business, but we work from everything from multinationals to nonprofits, to governments, to people in academia, all of which are helping us move repellents into the world in a way that's really impacting um, impacting lives all over the world. Next slide. So we'd love for you to, to join us if you see what we're doing and you find it interesting and you would like to collaborate with us in some form or fashion, um, we'd love to transform the world together. Thank you. Right. Thanks, Hogan. We've got a question here. How long does the application remain effective on the skin? 
14 hours. So 14 plus hours. Um, we, we have studies where it lasts as long as 16 hours. And really 16 hours is kind of the limit we can test for. So on average, we've seen 14 hours of protection and we've seen people um, personally report more than 16 hours of protection. Right, that's great. Uh, let me see whether we've got any other question. I think that's about it, yeah. Thank you, Hogan. Okay. Thank you. All right. Jinglok, are you in? Jinglok, can you hear me? Right, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you all right. Yes, great. All right, next we've got a bioscientist company as well, based out of Thailand. They are manufacturing all kinds of affordable diagnostics. And I'll just let Ying Lok explain more. Thank you. Uh, morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Ying Lok, and I'm uh, on the board of Kestrel Biosciences Thailand. Uh, you'll find that uh, we promote ourselves as the experts in the development and the manufacturing of uh, lateral flow rapid tests. Next. Right, uh, basically this company was, uh, this business was founded in 2008 by this American uh, bioscientist, Jeff Bauer. And he started the business in California and uh, he felt that, you know, uh, he wanted to do uh, more to help uh, the third world. So he moved, he started a new operation in Bangkok uh, in about 20, 2010. And uh, the purpose was to actually not just do research and development, but actually to manufacture uh, affordable diagnostic test kits that uh, would be sold to third world countries. So that was the, uh, the, the focus of, the, uh, of Kestrel. So in the last 10 years, uh, we've, we've been developing from a very small uh, R&D uh, laboratory uh, to uh, starting to manufacture diagnostic kits uh, as OEM manufacturers. And if you look on this page, uh, there, there are some of the, uh, the kind of products and the services that we offer. Right, next. next. Right, so uh, coming to 2020, to date in the five months, what we've done is uh, our social metrics is to, to measure the amount of kits that we have assembled and on the assumption that these kits are going to go to developing countries, to poorer countries, where uh, it will be then used for the lower income and uh, lower masses uh, in the society. So in 2020, you'll see that in January, February, March, April, May, we've had a big ramp up of production. And if you look at the description of the, uh, the kits that we've produced, uh, you find that COVID-19 uh, test kits is at the very top. Uh, with 47,500 units. And uh, we're actually right now very busy producing uh, COVID test kits for uh, other companies. At the same time, we are also developing our own COVID-19 test kit because with our own proprietary COVID-19 test kit, we, are, we would be able to uh, expand and uh, move uh, the social impact faster. So uh, if any one of you is interested in helping us uh, expand and grow this COVID-19 project, uh, do contact me after this. Um, next. All right, now just to give you a perspective of uh, the social metrics over the past five years, uh, 2015 to 2019, you'll see that uh, it's been growing uh, steadily, uh, the exception of 2018 where you had a dip because we didn't have enough orders. Uh, but you'll see that the, the number of kits that we've been producing uh, reached uh, 41,777 in 2019. But in 2020, in the five months, we have already surpassed uh, this number. And again, if you look at the, uh, on, at the table, at the description of the uh, various kits, you find that um, uh, we, we make not just the uh, COVID-19 test kits, but we also have um, uh, fertility kits, we have infectious diseases kits, uh, like hepatitis, we do sexually transmitted uh, kits, like uh, HIV, uh, but I think we are best known for our tropical infectious disease kits, 
like dengue, malaria, filaria, uh, and also uh, parasitic infectious disease kits. Okay, next. Right, so currently, uh, these are the projects you're working on. Um, uh, the client, one of the biggest clients right now is Chulalongkorn University, and we've got three projects with them. Uh, the, uh, currently, we're actually manufacturing the COVID-19 test kits for them. But in addition to that, we're also working with them for their food and mouth diseases, disease viruses in pigs. Uh, we're also doing the kidney disease uh, test for them. And then the other two clients you're working for or <clears throat> producing for are James Cook University doing the anti-detection uh, uh, <clears throat> kits for liver fluke and for Konkan University uh, parasitic antibody kits. Next. All right, so in a nutshell, uh, if you look at the achievements we've, we've uh, achieved so far, uh, they could be categorized in the antibody detection, the antigen detection, the uh, <clears throat> COVID-19 uh, PCR as well as uh, serology, actually more serology than PCR test kits, and then the others uh, which come with the fourth category. So these are the kind of kits that we produce for our customers. And as I said, we're trying to develop our own COVID-19 test kit. Next. Right, these are samples of the OEM uh, customers that we have produced for. And uh, just to show you, you know, what, what, we, the, the, what the products look like. Next. And this, on the top left-hand side, you'll see these are the lateral flow assay test kits, uh, the ones that are most commonly produced by us. So like the, the pregnancy test kits, HIV, dengue, malaria, they're all there in the, uh, the top left-hand corner types, right? And the other items, you see the desiccants, the buffer bottles, uh, the backing cards, and uh, these are just materials that we also sell uh, to some customers. Next. Uh, here is a, a picture of our manufacturing plant as well as office in, uh, in Bangkok. It's about uh, under an hour away from Don Mung Airport, uh, north of Bangkok. And uh, we are sitting in the um, compound of Manika Thai, who is also our landlord and a shareholder uh, in Castle Bioscience. And we're looking for funds to expand our business to uh, to, to do more test kits and uh, there's enough ample land uh, for us to expand our uh, activities. Next. Uh, these are more pictures of our manufacturing facility in Bangkok. And uh, we have a very strong uh, assembly team, including uh, two research, research scientists working with us. And they've been there with us for more than five years. So we've got quite a stable uh, 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 staff. Next. Right, uh, these are some of the uh, uh, equipment that we use uh, uh, in, in, the, uh, in assembling the, uh, the products and testing and doing the lab tests for our clients. Because a lot of our clients come to us to ask us to do the uh, uh, research and development of uh, their concepts. Uh, and these clients are ma mainly the universities. Next. And this is just an I ISO standard that we've got. And we are now going for certification uh, and uh, standards for our, other, our COVID-19 product. Next. That's it. Um, so in a nutshell, that's what we do. And uh, we welcome any interest in, in our expansion plan. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Ying Law. There's a question here. Has, have the test kits been certified by health regulators? This is uh, the stage that we're at at the moment. We've already done the test. Uh, it's been successful. So we are now doing the field test in order to get the certification from the Thai HSA. Right. Okay. And how does a company engage Kestrel to custom build test kits? Is there an R&D phase before commercial trial or user trials? Uh, most of the time, the OEM, OEM jobs that we've done, the, 
the clients already have the, the clients have already developed their protocol, and they they only come to us for the manufacturing side. But um, half of the clients actually come to us to help them develop the protocol because they don't have the labs or they don't have the uh, the, the high end labs which we have. So we help them develop the protocol for them, and then uh, then but it belongs to them. The protocol belongs to them, and then we just do the OEM. But through the experience with all these clients, we are able to now develop our own, which is why we're developing not just a COVID-19, but we're also trying to develop the, uh, the mosquito-based uh, uh, protocols like malaria, dengue, filaria. And we're looking to, for partners to work with. And we're actually right now talking with Lifful, because as you see, Lifful is doing a lot of the malaria, mosquito-borne diseases. So we're exploring those possibilities. That's fantastic. Thanks, Ying Lok. I want the audience to go away remembering just one word. Test, test, test. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next we've got an amazing company based out of Vietnam by a British entrepreneur who aims to give those missing a limb a second lease of life affordably and with dignity. I will just let Raphael explain more. Right, can you hear me? Loud and clear. Excellent, so uh, thank you very much for joining. Um, so my name is Raphael, I run Vulcan Augmetics. Uh, we are a company that's goal is to basically make wearable technology uh, an everyday occurrence and event. Uh, and we focus primarily on developing nations. So uh, next slide, please. So at the moment, um, losing a limb is a, a horrible nightmare of an experience. It's an incredible shock. Our goal is to make that into a temporary inconvenience, something that is an annoyance rather than a life-changing event. Um, with the increase of uh, maker technology and additive manufacturing, we believe that it should be easy to upgrade and customize these body parts at will. We believe they should respond to our organic bodies, uh, well, they should respond as well as our organic bodies, and that the manufacturing systems are going to need to evolve to be more distributed to account for this and to work with developing nations. And this is especially true in uh, the age of COVID. Next slide, please. So we, um, we actually have a, a combination of a hardware product and a platform. As you can see, the, the business model can be a little complicated, but in essence, it's drawing all these people together to create win-win situations so that our users and beneficiaries can have access to prosthetics. So to give an example, um, we sell direct to clinics and hospitals who will sell on to the users or we get corporate partners to help provide sponsorship for a product that goes on to the users. Then the users who have our prosthetic hand, they can connect with fab labs or designers or institutions through the platform to buy extra accessories locally. So we're at a very early stage, but the end goal is to create a complex ecosystem where all of these different parties can interact and benefit from their own skills especially the amputees who are wearing the products. Next slide, please. So at the moment, there are 38 million amputees in developing countries who do not have access to care. Um, and they're stuck in a vicious circle because to have a good prosthetic, like one that functions, a robotic one generally, you need to have income to maintain it. To have that, you need a job, but to have the job, you need the prosthetic. So one, it's very difficult to get hold of them. And two, the existing prosthetics are focused on the Western market. They're highly priced. They're fairly low utility. They're high maintenance. So it's, it's very difficult to take care of them. And they're low access. It's a centralized industry. <clears throat> it revolves entirely around clinics that they have to travel for hours to get to. So there's no real practical solutions for them right now. Next slide, please. So for us, we combine this upgradable core product with a scaling ecosystem. 
So when I talk about an upgradable core product, what that means is we've taken the prosthetic and we've cut it up into different sections or modules. We standardize these so that we can mass produce them. And it also means that any accessories can be uh, standardized and manufactured cheaply and locally. We focused on technology that is more about what's functional for the user instead of technology for technology's sake so that we can have mass production of a core product and then an ecosystem that distributes it and supports it. Next slide, please. So this is the basic concept. The, all of the parts of the arm come apart. Um, if they need a single component replaced, then instead of them uh, taking time off work, traveling several hours to the clinic, booking a hotel, giving their product to the clinic, waiting there for a few days for it to be fixed and coming back. Instead of all of that, we just put the replacement part, even if it's like a whole hand, we just put that in a box and ship it to them and they take care of attaching it on. So the whole system is designed to let them uh, maintain it a lot easier. It makes it more affordable because they can just split up the different parts they want to buy and it means they can put on accessories. Next slide, please. So we have, oh, I think this is a previous slide deck actually. So um, we have a design philosophy that's specifically for these markets. Everything has to be uh, yeah, efficient, robust, functional, aesthetic, accessible, and adaptable. It's a very complex thing we're trying to achieve, not just to give them the product, but to give them pride in themselves and to give them income. So we work very hard to ensure that the product also uh, allows them to operate in different uh, jobs. And we make special tools to help them do that as part of our design process. Next slide, please. So this is where we have uh, gotten up to now. These are our very, very first basic prototypes. Um, and you can see a little bit about the, the evolution and the lessons that we've learned. Uh, but these are from at least 18 months ago now. So next slide, please. This is the more recent development that we have. The, on the far right, this is our final product that we're taking to market, the Mark 9. Uh, as you can see, it's a much nicer finished product than the other ones. And if you look at the packaging above, you can see the whole thing. That's the entire system. And it works with all uh, types of clinical socket. Next page, please. Ah, uh, yeah, this is my previous slide. So uh, I think they haven't changed over my deck. So I guess I'll just have to end it there. Okay, thanks, Rafael. Yes, I am sorry, there was uh, there was more information on things like market and longer term goals. For example, um, the prosthetics market is about $12.3 billion by 2025, but this does not factor in the 38 million people I mentioned. They're all in developing nations. They're totally untapped in its blue ocean. Furthermore, as for us, prosthetics are just the first stage. It's about everywhere technology connects to the body. So we're also talking about developing VR and AR control systems, uh, exosuits, wearable devices, and, and healthcare sensors. All of that is connected to the same thing. We just believe that people using prosthetics are the pioneers for this. They wear this technology all the time. They rely on it all the time. They are perfect for test beds. And to get the product to them, we have two product tracks. I'll, I'll end on this note. The first product track is we sell them the basic uh, unit for $1,000, which is less than half the price of our nearest competitor for like three times the functionality. And it looks amazing compared to what's out there. So we sell directly to the user, to the clinics, but also for people who cannot afford that, um, it doesn't matter how they get the product because it's modular, longer term, once they've got it, they're gonna be buying accessories, attachments and extras for their whole life. So we work with local companies to provide sponsorship and we take donations so that if somebody cannot afford the product, we will help them get that prosthetic and we will help them get a job placement in that local company. So they're now wearing our product, they're generating income, and they're going to keep coming back to us for life to upgrade and, and get more attachments and accessories. And that's basically uh, what we do. Just you know, connect people, put technology on the human body and make people better. That's the goal. Thank you very much for listening. 
Amazing, Raphael, it really is. Um, we've got a question here. Are you focused only on the arm or is there other limbs in your product design? So right now we do below elbow arms. That's stage one, like the very first most basic, simple thing to do. We are going to be doing um, above elbow, all of the arms, all of the legs. We will be moving uh, eventually into things like sight and hearing aids as well. Uh, anywhere that technology goes on your body. So it's not even limited to just prosthetics. We're also talking about other wearable devices, exosuits, assistive devices. The, the key theme is having something that it has a core quality product, but a huge range of customization and an ecosystem connecting a wide range of manufacturers and designers to tap into that and support that. That's amazing. You've told me, Raphael, that you call yourself a social enterprise. Why would you call yourself a social enterprise and not a traditional for purely for profit company? Um, because the way our business uh, model works and is designed is that we can only succeed and thrive if the product that we offer has the social impact that we want it to. So our product needs to make these people one, it has to help them generate income. It has to give them everyday functionality. It also has to make them feel pride and change how the rest of the world sees them. Because as far as we're concerned, these are people wearing some of the most awesome, good looking technology in the world as part of them. That's an incredibly cool thing. But they don't feel that way. And a lot of society doesn't feel that way. So the one of the reasons we're a social enterprise, I guess, is that we have a very specific social target we want to achieve. And our business model is built around and and uh, is designed to tap the value that the sort of ecosystem we are discussing can create. Everyone, everyone wants to create value. Nobody wants to be poor. And if you give people the tools, then they will generate that value. And you just have to find out where that value was realized further down the chain and tap it. And that's also an approach that we take with our CSR project because we get income, the user gets their arm and the CSR partner get workers in their company who are going to be, uh, have a lot higher retention rates. And we've already seen some of the evidence for this. I love that. I really do. Yeah. Um, Rafa, maybe a last question. Can you give us a sense of what is your current customer base right now? Um, could, you, could you explain the, the question a little more? <clears throat> like uh, so who are we targeting to sell to? That's right. Like of the people who have actually ordered and that you are customizing these limbs for, can you give us a rough sense of uh, where they've come from? And mm. So we are not in the market yet. We are going through licensing right now, but we have taken 25 uh, pre-orders for units through the Uplift project, which is the our nonprofit system that I mentioned. And we're doing that as a service um, so that we, we are still allowed to roll product out. We have so far fitted um, four people for the Uplift project one of our own users and um, we had uh i think about two weeks ago we had our first couple of people come in and actually directly buy the product um we've also had a lot of interest from clinics and from uh we've actually had already had people contacting us from thailand and india asking if they could put in orders for large units the guys from india were talking about having 300 units shipped to them which was mind-blowing for us because you know we're we're still developing and scaling up. Our capacity is about 30 units a month. Um, and we're going to be there for about two more months before we can really grow. So to have people contacting us and asking, you know, yeah, our clinic wants 300 hands. Um, that was quite impressive. Uh, so at the moment, it's our main, the, our main group that has bought has been the sponsors and donors. And we've got another 10 people lined up to do that in about a week. We'll be fitting them all in one day. Um, you'll be able to follow that on our Facebook. I don't think any company has ever fitted 10 fully functional robotic prosthetics in one single session before. Um, so that was Uplift. We've sold a couple directly to users who have been very excited by the product. We fitted one, no two, with UNDP as part of their pilot project for mine clearance. So NGOs are also a market. Um, and finally, clinics. We have three different clinics who are interested in buying the product when it first launches and has licensing in about two months. That's fantastic. 
Will you be able to leave your contact? I know you've got an ask as well. The company is currently trying to raise some funds mm-hmm. just to be able to accelerate some of these things that you guys are doing. So if you could just leave your contact so our listeners can get in touch with you, should this is... Should, should yep, sure. Should this I way? put that in the chat? Yes, please. Yes. Great. Thank you. So that almost concludes our healthcare section and I want to pass the time over to Melvin next for the next Sorry, sorry. Batch. Can I just clarify? Should I yeah. put the, my contact info in the chat? You froze it. Yes, that. please. Yes. Okay. No, there right. is a, Thank you very much for your time. To all panelists and attendees. Yeah. I, I, I see that Melvin is, is all ready. And I just want to, again, like James had mentioned earlier, um, give a shout out to PLUS who is the session partner for today, Social Enterprise Saturday. And then we've got a Meet the TBN Asia team session at 3 to 3.30. The people who have worked tirelessly, relentlessly in the background to put it together and also to meet some of the pillar heads so that uh, we can take this forward in an actionable way. Um, there is also the TBN app, the TBN Asia app that you can download uh, on your phones in case you want to learn more about some of these enterprises and connect with them as well. So with that, I just want to pass the time over to Melvin. Oh, thank you, Alex. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Thank you for logging in. I think we have like uh, more than 80 um, attendees joining in. My name is Melvin. I'm a current chairman of TBN Asia. And uh, for this particular segment, we have actually six social enterprises within the segment. Those, those is a lot, okay? The main concentration is really on uh, healthcare, all right? Although we have uh, uh, three new ones that came in from uh, Malaysia, and I want to uh, feature them first, all right? We have got uh, the Malaysian ones that just came in is the uh, Pantang Plus, which has to do with uh, mother care, uh, mother comfort and baby care and so on. And then we have uh, 71, which is a social enterprise that uh, reaches out using uh, tea as its base and uh, Picha Eats, right? Working with uh, uh, this uh, refugees and that cooks the food and supplies to corporates and organizations. So I'd like to uh, first acknowledge uh, PLUS, who is our, our partner in this uh, Saturday's program. PLUS is from uh, Indonesia, platform uh, Usaha Social. They are also our partners, so that's important. Uh, the other thing I really encourage you to do is that we don't have enough time for Q&A, really, uh, as much as we want to. So I want to encourage all of you to download the app, okay, the TBN app, because in the app, you see all the social enterprises, and this is an app where you can get involved with uh, connecting with one another. And then also, every of the presenter here, every of the social enterprise, they actually have the freedom to set up their own Q&A after 3.30, because this whole thing goes up to 3.30. So I want to encourage every social enterprise that are presenting to uh, get involved with um, getting a network done for Q&A, all right? And please use the app because the app, the TBN app will continue on uh, for some time for you to connect with each other and uh, and with others as well. The important thing is that uh, at 3 to 3.30, okay, the whole TBN team will gather together and uh, some of uh, the social enterprises and attendees, you have questions. Uh, and we're going to tell you, like, how do we move on from here? Where do we go from here? I think that's important because it's not just about a conference. It's really about uh, how do we follow through and make all these things happen. All right? So that's uh, important. Now, let, let me uh, ask you to put your hands together and uh, welcome. Let me see whether... Bantang. Okay, let's welcome 71. All right, 71. Uh, Mr. Lai. Yes. So basically, 71, we are uh, an autism center. <clears throat> uh, basically, uh, 
at our center, we, we, we train and hire uh, a group of autistic teens and B40 single mothers at our space uh, to produce local herbal tea, cookies, natural, uh, doing the natural handmade soap and also dried fruits. Now, yeah, that's my slide. So at the, at, the, at, the, at the moment, uh, we have got a systematic way of training this group of people. And uh, they are coming to my place at our center from 10 to 5 on a daily basis. And every hour they're at our place, we give them proper training and we pay them wages. So that is how we basically empower them and enrich them in terms of uh, sustainable living. So... Today we have about uh, we have 18, 18 and autistic teens and four uh, B40 single mothers working with us at our at our space. Now uh, moving forward, uh, we are in a very challenging time because uh, we are at our scale up plan basically before the MCO being announced. So before the MCO, uh, we actually uh, sign up a tenancy because we are moving. Uh, we're moving to a bigger space, uh, a new center, where this center will be Halal and Mercy Certified Center. And uh, we will be uh, starting our new center sometime in July or August. Yeah, so uh, our long-term plan will be to increase our beneficiary headcount. Today is 18 to 25 to 30 by next year. So that is our, our, our impact. Yeah. So um, you know, basically, uh, that, that is a snapshot of uh, our social impact. So um, we are purely a Malaysian uh, product where we use our, even our, our tea, yeah? our tea is basically sourced from our urban growers. So there are, group, there are a group of uh, urban growers who grow these uh, local herbs where we will then procure from them. So that's another way for us uh, enriching the community around our areas. So basically, uh, that is our social impact. Yes, Melvin. Okay. Thank you, Lai, so much. Because, uh, well, 71 was involved with us in uh, the TBN conference last year as well. I think that's important for us to uh, connect with them. I think they're, they're doing a great work. I think one of those things would be like how to scale up will be something that uh, perhaps you would want to tap into the TBN team because we have scale-up coach over there. Oh, that's good. Right. So uh, then, of course, we have the resilience program that uh, you might consider applying for and then we'll see whether uh, we can work with you on that or not. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Lai. Although... Uh, I have to show everybody, this will be the layout plan for our new centers. And I really, really hope all the people can support us to make this a reality. <laughs> okay. Okay. That's great. That's great. Now, although, uh, you know, there is not much time for uh, Q&A, the, there is one question I thought maybe I'll just ask you sure. that's being posted, Okay. How did you find capital to get started? I think that there are concerned uh, individuals, all right? Maybe they want to help. Yeah. So basically, uh, for the scale up plan, for example, we are, we are under a push program, which is uh, under MAGIC. And uh, uh, recently, we have got a grant from the government. All right. So that is where uh, the grant can be our uh, so-called the, the, the fuel for our scale up plan. And all this while, we are very much uh, skilled, uh, self-sustaining, where because we are actively involved in marketing our products, and also we also have corporate sponsors who are who are with, with us, then uh, uh, supporting us, be it financially or in material form. Uh, so that's okay. how we sustain so far. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, you can still connect with uh, other people. All right, uh, thank you, Lai. Sure. And Thanks. right now, I'd like to introduce to you uh, Picha Eats. All right. We have Kim from Picha Eats. And uh, it's, a, it's a great social enterprise that works with refugees. So over to you, Kim.
Uh, are you there, Kim? Hi, Kim. Are you there? Hi. <laughs> okay. I think she disappeared. Oh. Hi. Okay. Um, I thought I saw her in, but it doesn't matter. Hi. Is this Kim? Yeah. Hi, Kim. Hi. Yeah, you're on now. Yeah, I can't seem to change my name. So I'll just go Doesn't with matter. Doesn't this matter. Name. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, hi, hi, everyone. Um, so basically, um, I'm going to introduce a bit about what Pichat does. Um, so what we do is uh, we're a food business rebuilding lives of refugees in Malaysia. And uh, we've started since like 2016. Uh, the reason why we started was because myself and my two other co-founders uh, were actually volunteering in a refugee learning center and uh, a lot of kids uh, were dropping out of school. So what we wanted to do uh, was, is to make sure that the kids can still go to school and be able to um, uh, and, and still be able to um, sustain their families because a lot of them had to drop out because they had to sustain their families. So. Uh, refugees in Malaysia are basically, uh, they, they can't work in Malaysia because uh, Malaysia is not part of the 1951 UN Refugee Convention. So uh, these kids drop out because they had to find part-time jobs and odd jobs to support um, their family. And so this, this has caused like, um, a lot of them to not be able to get an education. So we started this uh, and we did our first sales. Uh, I think the, yeah, the, the screen is going a lot fast um, <laughs> and and we started our first sales being in a university and uh, we we went on to uh, like accelerate the programs with magic and uh, many other competitions and we try to refine our uh, business model and try to refine our operational model and uh, since we started to date with, um, I mean before MCO or before uh, the pandemic, uh, we've been able to like uh, garner around, um, I mean, in dollars would be a, a million dollars uh, in revenue. And how it works is that half of this um, revenue goes to the chefs that are cooking from home. Uh, and and we, we make them cook from home and then we deal with all the logistics and operations to customers. Um, and then the other half, of the 50% goes to us, we cover like logistics, operations, and transportation. Oh, I think I didn't mention how, how it works. So um, we, we essentially, we are like a food business and uh, we manage like uh, catering for events and uh, mini buffet deliveries and uh, lunch mailboxes for businesses as well. Um, so that is how we actually sustain ourselves for the past um, how long? Uh, four, to, four to five years. And um, we've been able to uh, also go to like different countries uh, to actually um, promote ourselves as well. Um, before this, uh, with our impact is more revolving like um, how many chefs that has been onboarded with us and how many lives we've been able to um, impact. So chefs, we've, 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 we have around 25 chefs since we started from um, six different countries. Um, and then lives are... Uh, around like 125 lives being impacted on a daily basis. It means they can pay rent, they have food to eat, and they can all go for um, education. So that's how we actually go about um, being uh, in, in, in this uh, sustainable model. So we brought this um, whole model out to other countries to try and pitch in Amsterdam and uh, Germany and, and US and UK. These places to tell people that, you know, like give, and um, refugees a chance and opportunity where they can actually showcase their uh, their uh, talent and culinary skills and give them that opportunity. So uh, I I I guess like this is this is very much uh, an exciting journey, and uh, we've been able to uh, let people know that you know such sustainable model can happen. And um, we've, we've been able to work with like the different different families that you can see now in the photos, um, in in from different countries speaking different languages and and 
um, practice different culture and background um, to, to get this going. So um, that's all about Pitch Up. And if you want to know more, then just like scan a QR code or leave, my, leave me, um, I'll leave my email down. Uh, so that everyone can, uh, I, if we want a Zoom call at 4 p.m. later, we can we can definitely do it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Kim, so much. You know, uh, it's really, you know, each of them can basically just take, uh, you know, at least half an hour to talk about uh, themselves. And so, so, unfortunately, we, we just have to uh, compress the time. But you get a glimpse of it. You know, uh, Picture Pro, uh, Project, previously now called Picha Ace, is one of the bright lights uh, in, in Malaysia working with uh, uh, refugees, okay? The Syrians, the Afghans, the Rohingyas, and uh, Iraqis, Iranians, and so on. So uh, it's a great uh, thing started by three girls who just came out of university and then that decided that's what they want to do. So please link up with them. And uh, right now we have got uh, another Malaysian social enterprise that is called Pantang Plus that deals with mother care and deal with uh, baby care. All right, so can I have uh, <coughs> Zamzana to hi. come on to share? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay, hi, good morning. Um, morning. Yeah, my name is Zamzana. I'm from Pantam Plus. So Pantam Plus is an online booking platform <coughs> for traditional and complementary confinement packages. Um, we are a social enterprise accredited uh, by Magic and Ministry of the uh, Entrepreneurs in Malaysia, uh, where we empower the B40 women to become the independent postnatal therapist. So, uh, Pantam Plus started when um, myself had the first uh, experience because I wrongly picked up the therapist, and uh, as a result, I was hospitalized because, uh, during my first uh, newborn experience. So, <clears throat> what we are uh, trying to address the cu customers is uh, if you have uh, the wrong therapist, so you will uh, get just like me before. So uh, what I did is, uh, we, uh, what we do is uh, we match the customers and the therapist uh, based on their location and packages the customer select. And <clears throat> our value is we provide safe uh, trust and assurance to the <clears throat> customers. Why? Because we curate the therapies, we certify and we train our therapies. Mm -hmm. the therapies are from B40 women. Okay, so currently we are based in Shah Alam and we have more than 200 mm -hmm. registered therapies and our services mm -hmm. we cover local, nationwide and some of overseas countries like Singapore, Australia and UK. Right. So what we do is we do the complementary services like, you know, the after mothers giving uh, birth, so we massage the mothers, we provide hot stone therapy, we take care of the babies and also the food. So how we uh, locate uh, this B40 woman or the underprivileged uh, woman uh, or urban poor woman, uh, we run our own road tours and we look for talent. Uh, then we provide training and uh, then we uh, give them some job, job employment opportunity. So, Santam Plus, uh, uh, I'm one of the co-founders. So, I was in banking before uh, and then I joined the wellness industries and my partner is an engineer by profession. So, uh, both of us uh, believe that we want to add value to the customers uh, by uh, selecting the best uh, and curated therapies. Last year, we raised funds through uh, equity crowdfunding. Uh, through pitching platform and we are preparing to uh, raise the second round uh, by third quarter of this year. So I would like to, I'd love to meet up with you and share more of our experience. Uh, my email is in the slide and thank you for listening because I think we are given only five minutes. Thank you, Melvin. All right, over to you. Oh yeah, thank you, Zamzana. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, five minutes, that's right, you know, uh, because we, we just have to compress them, but uh, it's a great work. By the way, you know, all the three of them mentioned, mentioned about magic. okay? magic is like the Malaysian Centre of Social Enterprises, yes. okay? social innovation. So, uh, TBN Asia, she partners with Magic, uh, especially in the Resilience Programme. So, you need to find out more about that. But, uh, you know, if you want to know more about them, please get into our app download our app, okay, because that's where you can actually link up with them and all the other social enterprises of which we have more than 75. However, uh, you can also get into a Zoom room or networking with them after 
uh, 3.30 because uh, this whole program of DBN uh, ends at 3.30. All right. Yeah. Right now, we have, uh, I want to welcome um, SG Assist. They are also in the case of, uh, in the sphere of uh, healthcare. Right. Let's uh, welcome Greg from SG Assist. Over to you, Greg. Hey, thank you very much, Melvin. Hi, everybody. Good to see you all. Uh, let's just run this up. Um, sorry, I'll, I'll take over the slides from my side to do the sharing. Um, sorry, can I just take over the slides to do the sharing from my side? Uh, hi, Greg. Are you able to control the slides now? I think I've given you the control. Um, no, not really. Um, maybe I can share my slides from my side, if you don't mind. I'll take, the, take over the sharing on the screen. Okay, sure. Thanks. Okay. Right, uh, so my name is Greg. I'm a co-founder of uh, SGSIS and uh, this is my family. I'm truly uh, fortunate that I have a uh, wonderful family that gave support uh, to one another, ensuring that everyone is safe and prepared during this pandemic itself. But uh, can I say the same for the others in our community? Are you currently under stay home notice alone with no one to support you? Are you part of a vulnerable age group and worried about getting your groceries? Do you know someone with a disability who needs help getting to their appointments? Or are you worried about your elderly parents who are living alone? Well, over 2,000 volunteers are there for you. And we are all over Singapore. Just download the app and sound out your need for assistance. And watch your help arrive. It's really as simple as that. Join our growing community and download SG Assist today. Right, so um, I think we can see from here that uh, <clears throat> we, are, we are actually connecting uh, many people together today. And SG Assist is a lot more relevant than uh, ever. Uh, in our mission to connect the communities to support each other, especially the vulnerable. And, in, uh, and just two months, uh, we have recruited more than 2,000 volunteers island-wide. And we've adapted uh, and turned our existing mobile app platform into a community-based and real-time support in response to the pandemic during what we do best, which is connecting people who need help with uh, those who can help. <clears throat> and uh, we see how warming events happening in our app, just like how Mr. Steven here, um, senior who ran our groceries during the lockdown period, I managed to get assistance from a neighbor who stays in the exact same block as him. And the most amazing thing is most of our requests are actually accepted by a volunteer on an average of about five minutes. <coughs> so um, <coughs> we also provide uh, professional trainings that is developed with uh, other professionals in the medical sector that uh, we put up a basic COVID training course right now to actually help our volunteers to assist others safely and sustainably as well. So that's, that, that, that's what we do. We uh, make finding good easy and doing good easy. We partner with uh, numerous government agencies and social service sectors, uh, agencies such as SG Care, MVPC, FAIR and more. And thanks to our thousands of social media followers who have helped us to reach out into the community. Um, <coughs> We've also recently been interviewed by Channel 8 News and shared by the SG United website, as, uh, as well as the Ministry of Social, Family and Development. And even uh, Madam Ho Ching herself shared a few of our several posts. And with that, we note that the uh, aging population in uh, APEC is ever increasing. We uh, envision uh, ample opportunities to replicate and adapt the SG Assist model to some regional countries where social service are uh, actually less developed and worsened by their traffic conditions. Right now, we are uh, we're seeing uh, as exciting innovation plans uh, through enhancing of the SGSS app 
and this algorithm to enable us to move forward to uh, from passive to active matching of volunteers um, to become a micro job platform with gamification as well as to advance into big data for insights that are beneficial to corporates and the public sector and so the opportunities are basically endless and in order to make this solution and business model with uh, with the with the market opportunities our team actually assists as the necessary corporate skill sets capability and uh, vast volunteer and budget experiences in making this happen so our vision uh, and goal will be to empower and socially connect the community from corporate to government to corporates and to and um, individuals from the community we hope everyone will join us on this journey to build a better sustainable community so for those who's interested uh, we'll put up that in the uh, chat where we can get connected right so for here I'll thank you and I'll pass it back to Melvin thank you Greg wow that's a uh, very uh, prom short and sweet well that's a question here and by the way uh, while I ask this question I would encourage uh, all of you to post your questions okay so that uh, we can get an idea of how to connect with SGSs. All right. Uh, a question here is awesome, awesome. How did you manage to get genuine volunteers and minimize risk of scammers? It's always a problem, right? What would you say, Greg? Yep. Uh, so for us on the platform, what happened here is that we still do um, screening, uh, just like any other uh, volunteers would do. But um, for us, the one the one most important thing is that we actually put in even a video call function on the app itself, such that uh, when the volunteer arrives to the location, uh, we not only be able to validate the person, but also at the same time, um, able to um, kind of look into what they do and how they help. So that helps to give a peace of mind to even the the users or we like the caregivers who actually render their assistance. And at the end of the request, there's actually also a two-way review where the users were able to put up um, their feedback uh, about the, the, vo the volunteers and as well as volunteers to put up a feedback about the users itself. So if there's any case of any um, so-called misuse of the platform, then we'll be able to contact them and uh, get in touch to find out what exactly the details are about. Yeah. Okay, okay. Now, uh, another question is, uh, how do the seniors find you? I mean, Right, they are not tech savvy. They are, it's so, so what network do you actually rely on and so on? Right, so um, you're right. Um, not, basically, not all the seniors will be savvy enough to use this. So for us, when we, uh, when we first designed this, um, the whole idea was to make it, keep it simple and easy. Um, not only for, is it easy to be used by the users and the caregivers themselves to promptly look for a request uh, to look for a volunteer, um, at the same time, we also touch base with um, various uh, social service agencies in Singapore, like we mentioned earlier, to uh, reach out to their network of uh, seniors that's under their care. And of course, uh, we, we've been working hard on our social media um, and as well as the uh, instant messengers like WhatsApp and trying to get out to them because those are the platforms that they use uh, frequently nowadays in, in, in the industry. Okay. Um, there's another question. Are you a uh, social enterprise or are you an NGO? Uh, how do you generate revenue and keep yourself sustainable? Right, so uh, we are a registered social enterprise in Singapore. And for us to stay on the, the sustainable side of stuff, as we just started not long ago. So uh, the only current revenue model we have right now uh, is uh, basically to help us sustain just for the early part, which is uh, giving part of the tips from the um, people that we help match them and get help during the, the situations. But going forward, uh, we have other exciting plans like introducing a marketplace where we can get more products for, to, uh, to help out with the caregivers, as well as uh, integration of our mobile app as a white label towards uh, different social service agencies as well. So um, yeah, that's, that's what we have coming along. And uh, in, the, in the marketplace itself, if I didn't mention earlier, um, basically we'll be taking more of, of the commission from corpus, that part of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. thank you. I, I think uh, as a tech platform, it's really uh, the potential for scale mm -hmm. is, is to be there. So it's just 
basically uh, to be made aware of. All right. And uh, for some of you who wants to find out more, please connect with uh, SG Assist. Uh, you may want to run your own uh, Zoom room after that for connection. But uh, for the rest of the attendees, you can actually also make use of the uh, TBN app. Okay, you download it, TBN app, because that app itself actually is, is quite dynamic. You can link up with Edgy Access, you can link up with uh, uh, one of the 75 social enterprises also. You can link up with actually the panelists, the speakers that has been on our webinars, as well as the same time you can basically just uh, link up with TBN itself. All right. So one of those things that uh, you might want to uh, lock into both for SG Assist as well as for all the attendees is that uh, the TVN team would actually give ourselves like uh, from 3 to 3.30 will be, will be up, all right, to uh, answer every question. And uh, we're, we're going to have follow through, for example, you know, where do we go from here? Uh, can I tap into the resilience program? How do I get use, make use of it? And uh, we have got funders on our site as well as, uh, as, well as uh, scale up the uh, people so if we can help i mean basically that's the same spirit of which we organize tbn that'll be great all right so thank you so much and uh you know say hello to adrian i think i uh, hope that he gets well <laughs> yeah. all right thank you so much uh greg and uh blessings okay thank you thank you hi everybody right now we have another health healthcare uh, uh platform and uh, that is actually based in Indonesia, and we, it's called uh, WeCare.id, standing stands for Indonesia. And uh, Gigil, who is the founder, actually runs uh, the uh, platform, and is one of our TBN Social Entrepreneurship Training Hub cohort. You know, uh, so glad to see Gigil. Over to you, Gigil. Thank you, Melvin. Um, can I get my video turned on also? Because like I cannot start my video because the host disabled this. Okay, but no problem. Uh, we're waiting my videos to be uh, switched on. Um, so my name is Gigi. I'm the co-founder of WeCare.id. Uh, we're basically a medical crowdfunding platform. Uh, we're based in Indonesia. We start off uh, since I think 2017 so far. Uh, early before that actually, but we start accelerating on 2017. So we started realizing that even though we have uh, quite good national insurance, but because our country is archipelago, uh, the outcome of healthcare uh, infrastructures are not equal. For example, if you are living in a re remote area of Indonesia, uh, like Eastern part of Indonesia, uh, you, will need, you, you will still need to get referred to like bigger hospitals or bigger cities, which cost, cost you a lot of money. So, uh, there are about 30 to 40% medical expense that you will still uh, need to uh, that need to spend from your out-of-pocket cost. And for that means a lot for some of the people in Indonesia. And at the other side, uh, which, does, which, I doesn't, which I don't mention here in the slide is that our country is like uh, the most generous country in the world based on the research. So there are, uh, so people would love to help each other actually, but they need like a very, a uh, strong and reliable platform to actually do that. So what we do is that we connect uh, patients uh, to the donors to our websites. Uh, we work with medical partners uh, across the countries. It could be hospitals, it could be clinics, it could be health departments uh, in the governments. They help us to verify and submit the information to the patients. After we approved, we post the, uh, the stories on our website. Uh, we let them know uh, how much they need uh, and, and how, What's, what's the disease and, and the photos. And then for the, for the other side, the donors can start donating uh, from as little as uh, one cent uh, dollars from to our sites. And next slide. Um, yeah, so also during this COVID-19 uh, periods, we also serve as a logistic hub uh, for uh, mostly for the PPEs. So basically we work with uh, our 
uh, medical partners, uh, we, we got their requests of the AP, uh, PPEs shortage. Uh, we post them and we do the campaigns and we also help them to source um, the PPEs. Um, and then we deliver them directly uh, to the hospitals and to the healthcare providers uh, across Indonesia. So, so far we have delivered over uh, to like 1,500 hospitals so far uh, with more than 250,000 pieces of uh, PPEs. So that's a lot and we are enjoying uh, our new role in this COVID-19 season so far. And then we hope we will be able to collaborate more uh, companies or government institutions or even nonprofits uh, to help us to, uh, to deliver more PPEs to uh, remote areas of Indonesia. So next slide. So during the past one year, we've mobilizing over uh, nearly two million US dollars uh, donations or medical funds. You can also say that uh, from 35,000 donors uh, with more than 1,000 patients funded. And also, uh, as I mentioned before, we also serve as a, as a, a COVID-19 logistic hub and we've been able to send uh, to over 1,500 uh, hospitals, uh, PPE is still, 1,500 hospitals so far. Uh, we work with the major partners uh, right now, including the national insurance itself, and hopefully we will be able to also uh, help people to pay in the national insurance as well. Because like even though the premiums are uh, are quite quite uh, affordable, but sometimes uh, there are so many of us who also still not be able to afford it. So uh, that's also uh, one thing that we also try to support. Next slide. Yeah, there are a lot of. Uh, there are a lot, lot of uh, institutions that also help us to expose ourselves. So uh, hopefully uh, one of you will also uh, uh, support us and then uh, we can work and collaborate together. Uh, next slide. Um, two co-founders so far. Um, uh, my other co-founder is medical doctor. So I'm more on the uh, technical side and also uh, the strategic sides. And hopefully we can connect uh, after these sessions, uh, letter in 2.30. Uh, for those who want to connect, next slide. I put my email here, it's gg.septiantowecare.id. Looking forward to chat and to explore uh, other potential partnership opportunity. Thank you so much. Wow, Gigo, you're a pro, man. Uh, are we playing your <laughs> video? Um, huh? No, I think, I, do, do I have video? I think I don't have video. You don't have video? Huh? Ah, okay, like, oh, yeah, oh, have yeah. video. Sorry, sorry. I have video, oh, okay. I, okay. So, I, th I thought it's like a video, uh for my presentation so no 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 i okay okay no i'm just talking about whether you have a video for presentation not, not an issue yeah. not an issue not an issue um okay there are no questions that are up here uh <laughs> that is that so i i have got one uh uh okay that's a that's a question that's up here okay it's posted on uh actually uh the chat instead of q a uh, doesn't matter. Um, so, do you take admin fee from the donations as your financial sustainability model? Oh yeah, uh, that's something that I did mention uh, in the slide. Of course, yeah, we take um, five percent to ten percent uh, management fee for every transactions that we uh, do to this uh, from mm -hmm. the website. So those five to ten percent is uh, depends on the partners that we're working with. Uh, sometimes we work with the uh, institutions. Um, for the regular price, it's like 5%, but for the institutions, sometimes we charge more because uh, they need more if effort from us, like including uh, the um, consultancy for, to how creating a, a good fundraising page and good fundraising campaign, so we charge on that. And also uh, for the logistic fee as well, as we are also working on that as well right now, so we charge 3% from the uh, total logistics uh, effort that the companies or institutions uh, uh, help uh, that we support that that the companies and and institutions um, donating to us. So yeah, so three percent to ten percent uh, management fee depends on the case that uh, we work on. Okay. Um, okay. There's uh, some more questions. So one of which is, what are some ideas you have for CSR program for corporate companies? I, I don't know whether that's directed at you. Oh yeah. Uh, okay. depends on the I think I think for the uh, for the CSR programs it also depends on the uh, on the vision missions of the clients or the companies that we work with 
uh, sometimes um, it's just simply uh, they want to like double the donations, for example. So for uh, so for example, so we support like like a groups of uh, cancer patients, and we do the campaign together. And after that, if there is like one donors donating, for example, like one thousand uh, or or one dollars, the companies will like double the donations. So it's like uh, so that's kind of uh, that's one of the ideas that we can uh, also try. And other things is like really depends on the on the on the on the vision mission and uh, uh, and the aims or purpose that we want to uh, gain together. So right now we also have like uh, so we so we have uh, these features in our website that a companies mm -hmm. or like small medium enterprise can also uh, some some kinds of uh, showcase their products um, so that people can donate in the uh, in the form of uh, products. So, for example, uh, it can be like a necessary foods or supplies uh, for the vulnerable communities. So, uh, the donors can choose uh, which products that they want to buy uh, from the selected merchants partners. So, that's kind of something that we also work on. Yeah, yeah wow, that's cool. As a social <laughs> enterprise that, uh, you know, uh, that's open for donations and so on. I think that's a hybrid model. Huh? Yeah, good, yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. One more question. Are the beneficiaries receptive to this idea based on tech and apps, or do they prefer face-to-face -face consultation? Uh, the, especially the patients. Uh, it's, 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 yeah, sometimes it's, it's a bit complicated. Um, most of the patients are residing in the rural parts of Indonesia, and they're not really, they're not really um, familiar with like, the dashboard models or mobile app. So sometimes we still do on call uh, or on text uh, verifications, uh, and also to uh, help us to get more information from the patients. So some, so it's a mix between like a high tech, super high tech with our dashboard, and also like manual uh, from phone, even face to face. Sometimes the patient even come to our office, or and or oh. also tech. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really, they come, come to your and, office. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we're not gonna be afraid of that because, like, <laughs> yeah, you can just call us. Uh, cause, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's interesting. That's interesting. But uh, thank you so much. Uh, I don't, I don't see any more questions. But uh, you know, that that's a lot to tap on. It's a cool company. All right. Yeah. Um, especially, uh, also Indonesian have great needs, but on the other hand, it's got a great potential as well. So. Uh, I want to encourage you to go and tap, tap on, uh, link up with uh, Gigil um, through the app and through uh, his own network uh, Zoom that sure. happens after that. Thank you so much, Gigil. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. take care. Yeah, yes. Take care. yes. Uh, all right. Now, now we have a final uh, healthcare uh, platform that is with us. I think this is a very interesting one. Okay, and uh, it deals with uh, how do you work with dementia patients, how uh, uh, people, how do you deal with uh, those who are struggling with autism, um, and yet it is in a very, very, uh, I thought it was a very, very interesting way. So to present to us from I'm So Ing is Michelle. Okay, let's welcome Michelle. Hi, hi, thanks Melvin, and thanks uh, TBN for having me. I started this uh, about six years ago because I realized that um, after my retirement, I saw there was a need. There was a need to keep active. And then I saw that there was a lot of stress, burnout, uh, caregiving, and this issue was loneliness and isolation. And then of course, fast aging populations and all. And it was that that is uh, not just developing countries, but everywhere in the world, this loneliness and isolation was translating to like stroke, hypertension, um, cancer, dementia, diseases, and also mental health. And I see like 14-year-old boys taking their own lives. It's just terrible. And the people who are affected, most vulnerable will be the elderly, disabled, but also those who are caregivers. The caregivers are affected, actually the whole community. So what I wanted to do in my next slide was that I found out about the fact that 
actually we needed to solve the problem at the soul level. That's my that's why my company is I'm Soul Inc., not I'm Music Inc. We actually enable everyone, no matter what age, what ability, where you come from, any status in life, to be able to make music uh, through our programs, through the technology, so that we could enhance health and well-being, create jobs that are more joyful. You learn the music, you pass it on to people, and then to be able to bring communities together because that forms the supportive network. And the best is that there's no musical background needed. Yeah? And so like this is um, why, why, why music? Because it's universal, non-drug, most important. And there's this healing power. And why make music? It's because neuroscience, and that's where it's fascinating for me. It actually means you, you play musical instruments, you create music. So you sing, you dance in our programs, you improvise, you create um, music. And it actually magnifies the power of music on your brain. And of course, the, last, the other thing was, uh, I saw a barrier. People cannot make music. There are only 3% in the world that are musicians. Most people cannot read the notes or find it too rigorous or can hold an instrument if you have a disability. And so with all this, I wanted to create my own sense of magic. And that was uh, multi-abilities, multi-generations and inclusive. So I'm so ink, actually the ink stands for inclusive. Um, so how, how do we reach out to people? Sorry, can I have the last uh, previous slide? So the thing with our programs and our technology is that we want to change people's mindset to say, uh, I can't do it, to, I can't do it. I can make music, I am creative. And then we give you the skill set to be able to do music. And then we have the technology that will enable you. So the next slide, please. So the way that we have worked when we first started was to go for the institutions. We, we, we engaged the beneficiaries. We, I have trained um, over the last few years, hundreds of occupational therapists, physiotherapists and all, so that they don't have to only depend on music therapists for music. And, and it means democratizing the access to music. And for people who cannot get to music, we have found it is so life-changing. We also help uh, our institutions to fundraise. And then we, since last year, sorry, <laughs> since last year, we also, we went to corporates for corporate social responsibility. And then uh, next year, we, because of the COVID and people are losing their jobs and all, we want to bring our service right into the homes. And this model is sustainable, replicable. We actually have clients who have expanded to the region and we have many clients across uh, in hospitals, daycare centers, special needs schools, uh, even preschools like Julia Gabriel and all uh, as our clients across Asia. Next, please. So validation, if you look at most of the time, people before a session, they are, they are sleeping. But this lady apparently has been there for like 17 years in that kind of position. When we went, this is how she is. And um, I may not have time to show the video, but if you go to the video, you will see her so animated. By the way, yeah, a little bit. She's blind. She's blind. And I didn't know until after the session. Next. Yeah, so this project we launched last year too for corporate social responsibility. And what we want, wanted to do was that because the technology was a bit high price point, I wanted to lower it. And I wanted to address the problem of loneliness and isolations of people living in the heartlands. So I got to Comfort Del Gro, and they are supporting me for four years. And I train their bus captains, I bring them into the community, and every week, not just one off at the end of the year for Christmas or whatever, but every week we will go to Angmokyo, to Topayo, to Jalan Bursa, and make music with the elderly. And in this, um, and, and, they, and the bus captains tell us that from now on, when they drive, they actually look at who is boarding the bus so that they can recognize that they are in that group. Next. For homes, this is where I'm most excited. This, we want to bring our music making into homes. And in March, Channel News HR actually featured us. I went into the home, never met the family. Lady has dementia and bad mood swings. 
and uh, we engaged her and the family. She was so lively. The video again will show. And uh, the, what was best was that the, late, the daughter wrote back and said that not only did she sustain that good mood that day, but for weeks and, you know, after the session. And that's why they bought the equipment and are now training to become our music ambassador. Because we're going into homes, we want to, we will have the ability to hire a sales force and to create jobs for people as our trainers, as our salespeople, to get into every home and allow this um, to be with everyone. Next, next please. So the social impact we make is that we enable the underserved, those who cannot get to music the conventional way. We empower, so we create and enhance jobs and we engage communities, all abilities, all ages. Next. We have been very fortunate that our work has been recognized. So like we won the Asia for Good um, uh, Award from DBS Foundation and also Elder Care Innovation Awards and International Awards among some of them. Next. And we actually enable people to actually showcase um, this intergenerational um, celebration, you know, at Para Games, at Inclusive Countdowns, even the President Star Charity. So we're very, very fortunate. And I have uh, gone around many countries uh, to speak and share about this issue. Next. So our board has been very active. Um, I really want to thank my chairman, Mrs. Kami Lim, and you know her as the principal of Raffles Girls School. Fantastic in terms of musician and creativity and all that. For me, I've spent many years in innovation, education, and also bringing about transformational projects. We have got people on our board who's a medical doctor, surgeon, uh, innovation, and finance. Um, next. So the final slide I have is that we were actually ready to scale and then the COVID hit us. So all our community uh, events have to just come to a standstill. But um, this year, we have now got a plan where we would be moving into the next phase. We're already in the region. We just want to expand and deepen. That's all I have. Thank you. So if you want to reach me, uh, next slide, last slide. Uh, at our websites, inquiries, and I'm Michelle at I'm so Thank you, Thank Michelle. You. That's very inspiring. By the way, I was just wondering, you said you didn't have a video or you have a video? We have the videos, but if I were to show all the videos, they will take... Oh, no. uh, so I did show one video where uh, we made an impact oh. like on someone who's like inactive for 17 years and they come. And we've got people who cried after the sessions and it's, it's, right. it makes me get up out of bed every morning. Right, right, right. It's, uh, it, it's an incredible platform because I, I, I was there and so I saw how the uh, music is being made through and it's not a, it's not a kind of like a, you know, a high-end kind of thing where you need to learn music. No, it's just making the musical sounds that itself. I think that's a great help for those whose family uh, struggling with dementia, mm. you know, struggling with uh, uh, Parkinson, autism, stroke. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Actually, not only that, it's also the caregivers, Melvin, because very yeah. often um, for people who are um, the caregivers, they, you know, they they find a hard time trying to to come home from a day's work and then mm. having to uh, look after someone who may have forgotten who they are. Or, um, yeah, or a corporate social responsibility. We do that because many of the foreign companies tell us uh, the language was a barrier. Yeah, yeah. That's so for thing, music, I mean, it's universal. Correct, correct. I think this, this uh, uh, platform really gives hope because yes. very often, even for those who are grappling with uh, the dementia uh, in the family, it's basically trying to maintain and, uh, you know, that, that actually sucks out their life rather than, you know, uh, bring life to them. Okay. It's about are, quality of life. That's, that's right. That's right. It's great. Now, there are uh, a few questions here. One of which is, what three tips will you give to people who want to start social enterprise for serving elderly in their homes? Oh, right. Uh, I think number one, you really do need to 
have uh, the understanding of the language. Actually, the dialects and all that are very important um, for them. Um, that's number one. Number two, also understand their situation in terms of the, um, the caregivers, their constraints. Like they may be left at home alone with a helper and, and all the caregiver themselves the stress. And third, I think in terms of uh, they're non-tech savvy, most of them, mm. most of them are non-tech savvy. So the technology has to be so simple. Like ours, you just have to move. You don't have to do anything. You just have to move. And the movement will be translated to music. That they get. And when they see people doing it with them together, for the elderly, a lot of it is about isolation, connection. And so they don't want to be passively listening to you or someone asking them, how are you? How are you? How are you? You may get the same yeah. story 20 times. They want yeah. to do something. So if you can serve the elderly by Getting them involved in doing something together with you. I think that's the key. Wow. And uh, is there a, a certain level of like training or just basically, you know, uh, the, the instruments are being brought to the home and then they try it out? No. So we do have to build capabilities, <laughs> which means that if you have no musical background, you too can learn to make music. And so you gain Right? So we will train you um, mm. free of charge if, you know, for this COVID period, we wanted to extend that to people. Uh, when we sell to institutions, we train their staff. Then you then have to, yeah, and it's about making music and a lot of improvisation. So the community that we have is that you can always come back to us. You can always like learn from us. So once you attend the, the first session, you're welcome to come back to refresh um, at no at no charge. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. There's one more question. How do you uh, link up with uh, the present health facilities or the health ecosystem, or, or do you do that? I do, I do, um, but not not as much as we like to. I think, especially now during the COVID, <laughs> we can't even go out uh, at all. Many of this. Um, require face-to-face -face. but we are now starting uh, the online ones but it's still live stream so it's linking up with the ecosystem I present um, and then they find me in a way oh okay okay I mean just now we have SG assist yes uh, yes I, you yes, know really yes, can link up because yes, the whole yes. idea is networking yes. and uh, you know helping yes. It, it struck me that, the, um, especially when he said white label his act, I was like, hmm, that, that I could, you know, either work with him on that platform or even white label. I mean, I, I was going to reach out to um, SGA Assist. Thank you. Yeah. And, and do you, uh, or rather, have you capacity to deal with like Malaysia, Indonesia? Maybe. Uh, uh, yeah. Actually, if you look at the last slide, I... Have, um, I have been invited actually by Hannah Yeo at the previous, ah. uh, I presented to her in a parliament and then she uh -huh. set up a session for us in um, Putrajaya. So I presented to about 80 uh, special needs homes and, uh, and, and their therapists and all. It was very wow. successful, but then the COVID and then I can't, yeah. and, and the Malaysian government changed. So, so I need to restart Malaysia, but I have one of my board directors is actually based in Malaysia. Yeah. Right, right, right. So okay, we are, we, we are starting. Yeah. Yes, yes. I think, I think the networking, the connecting is so powerful, right? I was Malaysian, you know, Melvin. Oh, I, oh yeah, I yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, <laughs> I couldn't for, I, yeah. I couldn't remember. Oh, yeah. by the way, uh, SG says they, they, they'll be glad to help. So please link up. Now, I will. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, we'll just uh, call an end to this segment. But, uh, you know, go into their websites, SGSS, uh, uh, I, I'm so ing, and uh, Picha Aids, and so on. Get into their website, then you get a, a more detailed uh, connection with them. And uh, again, you are welcome to connect with the TBN uh, Asia team because uh, we can actually connect you with others as well. So 3 to 3.30, just half an hour, you're welcome to do that. And uh, for the rest, 
uh, of the attendees, you are welcome to do that too. So thank you, uh, all the panelists. Thank you, Michelle, you know, yeah. Greg, and, and so on. Really appreciate that. Um, okay, right now, I would hand over the time to another of my moderator, who is part of the TVN uh, uh, team, and she's the Executive Director of uh, SMU uh, Lian Foundation, or Lian uh, Center of Social Innovation, Christy Davis. All right, the next segment has to deal with women social entrepreneurs. Or, you know, now the fashionable term is gender lens. <laughs> I, I think that that is uh, really up a sleeve. And it would be interesting for us to tap on, to listen to uh, how we can uh, mobilize the women social entrepreneurs. Because women makes up at least 50% or more of the uh, workforce. And yet in many of the countries, uh, they are not harnessed. So every country that's not harnessing the woman, you basically miss out a, a certain dynamism that you can have. All right. So thank you. And uh, can I hand over the time to Christy? All right. Have a great weekend. Thanks, Melvin. Yep. Welcome. Hi, uh, I think Christy and uh, the other uh, of our panel are still going through the dry run coming in as well. So uh, we'll just wait for a little while, but it's very important for uh, all of you who are attending. We've got, you know, about 80 people attending. You are very welcome to uh, come and link up with us at the TBN uh, team level from... Uh, uh, 3 to 3.30 this afternoon because that's our wrap-up. And then we also want to introduce to you what, what are some things that we can follow through. And then it's about where do we go from here? Because uh, not only are we taking the initiative in uh, running our resilience program, which will be ongoing, which will help social enterprises that are uh, struggling in the midst of COVID-19, in particularly Indonesia and Malaysia, we're open to network with uh, other countries as well. But right now, that's our bandwidth, okay? So you're welcome to do that. But uh, in our panels, we've actually got scale-up people. We've got uh, uh, people who are concentrated and focused on equipping the social entrepreneur, uh, not just the social enterprise, because it's so important that the social entrepreneur works and he's in good uh, you know, health both physically, emotionally, and spiritually, I think the social enterprise can move on. Otherwise, it will be affected. All right? And uh, is uh, Christy on now? I think she's getting setting some difficulty. Would you like me to, to start first in the interest of time? Ah, okay. Uh, all right. So... I'm already online, so you're already online. He's trying to why, on currently. Why don't we do I, that? I do understand you have, yeah. Yeah, why don't we do yeah. that? Uh, Alan, right? Alan Lai from yeah, uh, Alan here. Profile Print. Uh, we're glad to have you here. Sorry, Melvin, you have to take over as the host for the time being. <laughs> no and problem, no me problem. On behalf of Christy. <laughs> no problem, no problem. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm chairman of TBN Asia, it means Pao Ke Liao. Okay? <laughs> yeah, Pao Ke Liao. Okay. Uh, Everybody, let's uh, welcome uh, Alan live from Profile Print. Alan, over to you. Thank you so much. 
Um, let me just use this opportunity to share my screen as well so that you guys can um, see the screen. Yeah, um, got it. All right, got it right. All right, let me just do some. Okay, all right. Christy, are you almost there? Do you want me to wait for you or should, should I just start? If not, I'll go ahead. All right. Um, very, very good afternoon. Um, one thing I must share is amidst rapid digitalization, what we saw over the last few days, um, that technology can enhance business processes during pandemic, as well as making people work closer together. Of course, we saw the rise of e-commerce. Online marketplaces, Taobao, Amazon, GrabFood. I think we are all encouraged that smallholders are able to leverage on technology to reach out to more buyers. To be honest, it has been more than 26 years since Amazon started. Today, farmers are still held ransom by middlemen, bulk buyers, and conglomerates. Why? Because farmers do what they do best. They grow and they produce. They're not trained in marketing and they don't want to spend time managing customer requests, small buyers, having buying 100 grams of each product. It's just too much work for them. So during this pandemic, we saw many farmers had to throw away their crops because they were decomposing, they were spoiling, because the supply chain was disrupted. People could not work, you know, ports were not open, logistic companies were overloaded. So we saw good companies like Lazada, Pintoto, starting onboarding these farmers to help them reach out to the consumers. Again, these are all small purchases. Farmers don't really want to work on such a basis. They want to work on bulk purchases. So this is where over the years, we realized that the main challenge we face is that farmers are not able to transact because they are still very reliant on middlemen. And is there a better way to enhance digital commerce without middlemen? So we saw Amazon trying to sell direct to consumers, but is there a better way to sell direct to bulk buyers? And that is what I'm going to share with you today on what Profile Print is able to do. So over on the screen, Profile Print is a patented fingerprinting technology that allows matching, sourcing, and selling better online. The machine you see currently in the picture is about 20 cm tall, um, lightweight enough to carry to the farms, to the wholesaler, as well as to consumers. All you need is a laptop or any mobile devices. The problem today we face really is that we want downstream buyers to get authentic products with more choices at a better price. And we want upstream sellers to access to a larger market, receive fairer deals, and displace low value adding middlemen. So, with profile print, traveling and physical exchange of samples is no longer required because we are able to now qualify and quantify the quality of the products for B2B businesses. So, the problem we face today anybody between the farm to the broker processor to the wholesaler to the manufacturer, there is no common practical standard, and there's heavy reliance on human judgment. We touch, we taste, we see. We can also send it for expensive lab testing or the party certifications, which is often subjective and non-comprehensive. We're talking of billions of man hours and dollars lost because right, the farmers are not able to sell direct to the big conglomerates who buy. They still depend on exporters, blender, wholesaler, who will do the grading, marketing, and finally sell it to the real buyers. So what we have done is combine chemometrics with AI and sensor technology to create profile print, where every scan takes about three seconds, cost-effective because it's subscription model web-based, and every time you scan, the fingerprint is repeatable and consistent. So the process, as you can see in the picture, all you need to do is to put whatever farm ingredient into the little dish, close the drawer, press a button, and we capture a fingerprint similar to what a human fingerprint is. Meaning that if, for example, Coca-Cola has been buying certain ingredients to make into their drinks, now they are able to, instead of going through the middleman, go directly to the source as long as the fingerprint matches, which allows them to have the assurance that taste, the quality, the texture would be exactly the same. So the platform 
very simply looks like this, where you actually have a physical analyzer. <laughs> you have the platform and the users access the platform that is online for them to firstly match, for them to buy and for them to sell. This is one example that I just want to show you how it actually looks like um, a customer that wants to buy tea leaf. As you can see in the uh, picture where the customer has a required taste profile, which is in blue in color, and it recommends two matches on the platform based on the digital fingerprint. And you can see that the tea on the left-hand side matches almost exactly the same in terms of taste profile. And the tea on the right-hand side, though physically looks very similar, it's black tea, but you can see the taste profile looks different. And this is being generated because of the ability to identify the molecular structure directly into the farm product. And by doing that, a buyer no longer need a middleman to taste, to touch, they straight away can now purchase that tea that matches better. At least request for a sample before they commence onboarding process. And that speeds up a lot of processes because there's no longer the need to do marketing between the farmers to the end buyer, skipping a lot of expensive middlemen. So this is an example of how we are using Profile Print as an online platform to reach out to directly to the farm so that we can help them sell faster at a higher price. Just want to go through a few case studies so that you guys have an example of what products we can do. We actually work with Scopy, um, the sustainable coffee platform of Indonesia, and they gave us a, a few, um, the few raw green bean, where even if you taste the green bean of the coffee, you're not able to tell any taste difference. But we are able to very accurately identify whether is it a Benamera, a Chicore, a Kolo, a Gunung Halu, just by scanning it and do the prediction. And the prediction result is, is in the range of 97% and above by just looking at the raw green coffee bean. This is wine, and we all know that wines often, what we get in the market are blended. And because it's blended, right, actually big brands typically buy from small farm producers of raw wine and they do the blending. So instead of now needing to taste this, you can effectively scan your fingerprint such that you are able to buy and know directly without having the samples being transferred and hence commanding also a more accurate pricing of your products. So for wine, this is an example that we are very um, accurate in terms of telling a, a Cabernet Sauvignon with a Syrah versus a Merlot. But what was more interesting is when we actually got a better quality Capsef, we can also very accurately tell the difference between a good quality Capsef versus a regular quality Capsef. And what I did not show in this slide is also about blending. We are also able to help predict the blends to achieve a certain taste profile. For people who like Grange, we know a bottle of Grange from Panful costs easy $1,000. And why Grange is expensive is because of the blend that has made it so consistent in taste. And potentially, we are able to recommend blends to achieve that quality even without the brand name or without the master taster doing this blend. Um, beyond natural things like coffee and wine, Artificial flavoring is some of clients who have been trying to ensure consistency because when flavorings are put in the food products, a slight deviation can create a big issue in the end product. So we actually are able to have a quick scan to tell whether artificial flavoring are actually within the range of taste profiles. Um, tea is something that is very laborious, takes a lot of effort for human tasting to be done. And what we have done is with a client in Sri Lanka, instead of physically tasting it, now they scan what the customer wants, they scan their products that they have, and they find the closest match. Because typically, most exporters are dealing with, we're talking about 10,000 of different tea samples from plantation. So drinking, taking so much time with such a technology, now they're able to use Profile Print to sell direct to the customer. A latest example was a classified client in Singapore that required us to do an analysis of a face mask during COVID pandemic. We were always doing food ingredients, but because they ascertained that because we can do material, then likely we are able to tell the inner layer of face mask whether they pass or not. So obviously, after spending some time building the model, um, we are able to achieve 100% accuracy of what government deemed to fail or what the government deemed to pass. And typically such tests takes about five days. It's um, a range of tests that has to send to labs. And what we are able to do is by just scanning this, like how you see in the picture, we are able to tell whether it passed the grid or not. And one of the main 
reason why that classified client asks us to do it is because not for regular usage, it's but for frontline workers. We want to protect the frontline workers to ensure the masks that we provide them are of a certain quality. This is the team, uh, some of the awards we won and government support that we had from various ministry. Uh, I just want to take the last um, minute to show you a little video clip from Channel News Asia that did a, a small mention about um, profile print and I thought it's something that would be useful at this point in time to share with everybody. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have to share the sounds first. It's a cat and mouse game between counterfeiters and law enforcers. But one company is developing a machine that may be the key to outsmarting at least some counterfeiters. Dubbed Profile Print. The scanner uses artificial intelligence to authenticate products in mere seconds. It was developed in collaboration with National University of Singapore and the Republic's Agency for Science, Technology and Research, or ASTAR. It's been successfully tested on face masks, tea, as well as beauty products. As long as we have any suspected sample, all you need is about 4 to 5 grams of the product, put in through our machines, and our machine will be able to identify the molecular signature. And to verify against the true source, so when we scan a suspected sample and the results fail, it tells us that the molecules in the sample do not match exactly to the molecules in the true source. Uh, for two samples here, right, of suspected quality, maybe you take a look and see whether you can do a quick rapid test. Comparing these two products, the packaging definitely looks a bit different. Uh. Maybe because it's from a different packaging company. This one is in lower caps, this one is in upper caps. Why don't we do a quick scan using our profile print scan? And this product failed. So it seems that even though these two products are very similar and they even smell the same, our scan shows that they are indeed different material. Alan Lai invented the machine in 2017. He was inspired to do so after his mother was struck with cancer. About four years back, um, when I was still based in London working for a corporation, um, I received a phone call from my family that my mom had a very rare cancer. Um, so I left my company, came back and spent more time with her. And during this period of time, I started researching and was very surprised to realize a lot of things that we've been eating does contain ingredients that we don't know or there has been a lot of mislabeling on products. And so we came up with this to help both the producers and consumers to have more trust in the food that we consume every day. So you see, Alan is still in the process of expanding his database so that his scan can be deployed to authenticate even more products. All right, that's the last of the um, the video clip. Just wanting to explain that we don't just do um, food products, but we're able to help customers reach out directly. Um, also for non-food products as well. Yeah, thank you, Alan. Fantastic, fantastic. I I just saw Christy. On the um, line. <laughs> Christy, I tell you what, can I hand it back to you? Yeah, yeah maybe you can, uh, you know, take care of the... Uh, Hi, Christy, you're back. 
Hey, yeah. you guys. Thanks. Very nice to be here. Hi, everybody out there. Yeah, we had a little bit of issue, but uh, we're already all good to go now. So, Alan, really great to hear your presentation. Very exciting. Thank you so much. Thanks for getting started. So I am um, actually, hi everybody. I'll save some of my, con uh, some of my comments for, for after the next couple of presentations, but we're very happy to have you join us. Um, and I'm gonna turn it over to tomorrow with Liberty Society next to share a bit about Liberty Society and the very cool stuff that they are doing. So tomorrow over to you. Um, mm -hmm. um, Christy, there, there's yeah. some Q and A for Elena. Do we have time for that? Uh, sure, thanks Melvin. So Tamara, hold on. Let me let me just pull things up here a little bit here, just a second. Yeah, I think there are three oh, questions. This, okay, actually, Melvin, can you see those? Because actually, I cannot see them. Okay, let me ask those Thanks. questions. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, okay, Alan, uh, what you are doing is fascinating. Uh, just curious, what's your background before you embark on uh, profile print? Oh, so I um, I'm an aeronautical engineer that does uh, F six. F-16s and F-15s uh, in the Air Force. That F was my very... F and F-15. So I was uh, in the team that brought the F-15s back to Singapore um, in uh, more, than, more than two decades ago. Oh, okay. You're my favorite, man. I love planes. <laughs> all, of that. all right. Uh, another question is, uh, help us understand how Profile Print is a social enterprise. In other words, what's your impact? Uh, yep. And what kind of impact do you track? So there, there are mainly two impacts uh, that Profile Print brings along. First is that because of technology, we no longer require trained, capable staff who are domain experts. We are now able, in fact, currently we are located in the enabling village because we hire um, staff who are limited in terms of experience and also in terms of attention span. So what we use um, as the way to train them is for them to actually do the scanning of these products. And it's the AI behind it that actually oh. recognizes the profile, even though the person who scans it doesn't need to be trained. So by doing that, we offer them uh, opportunity for training and employment. Second KPI we track is how many of these direct source that we help to sell to consumers. And over my screen behind is the um, Future Tea Coffee. is one of the largest um, exhibitors, Sam's Private Limited, that actually organize trade shows every year. This year, they canceled 12 of their trade shows because of COVID. And what we do is we, they, they seek our help to support them to allow now all the sources, such as the farms, to sell direct to the big boys, even without a trade show, because we want their business to go on. So by allowing the physical sampling to be replaced by actually a digital fingerprint, buyers are now able to source the correct products based on what you see digitally online. So these are the yeah. two main areas we help. Fantastic. In the sense, I can see that it, you're just uh, getting the buyers and sellers to go directly and cutting out the middleman because uh, there's, uh, otherwise there's a lot of, uh, uh, you know, along the way, the supply chain that's affected, right? To, to be very honest, there are value in middlemen and I don't totally think that what we are trying to do is to replace all middlemen. But there are also many low value added middlemen who are just pricing with yeah. arbitrage and yeah. paying the farmers badly. So these are the areas where we want to penetrate to help the farmers sell direct to the buyers. Okay, thank you. I mean, uh, great. Everybody, you connect, continue to connect with uh, Ellen uh, via uh, Q&A that could be something that uh, Ellen will post also that you can follow through. After 3.30, uh, my, uh, my uh, recommendation, because uh, this whole thing is still going on until uh, 3.30, all right? And uh, use the app, the TBN app as well, because that's where you can actually uh, network in, in the larger extent. Thank you so much, Ellen. And right now, handing over the time to Christy. Thank you. Okay. Uh, can you guys hear me? Thumbs up, please. Can, can I be heard? Yes, you can. Okay, yes, yes. thank you. Just making sure. You. Sorry, we've had that tech issue, so I just want to make sure. Okay, thank you, Melvin. It's so nice to be here. Thanks for taking care of that. Um, hi, everybody. <coughs> okay, so Tamara um, and Alan, thank you so much. Love what you do. And now a more smooth segue over to Tamara, who also has the most amazing business. So Tamara, uh, rescue me here and take control. Thanks. Will do. Thank you so much. Cool. 
Hope you all can hear me fine. I am actually honored to start off the Fashion Impactful Retail before um, amazing panelist later, which is Erin Duanyam. So I'm just here to tell you about my passion and what we do that reflects into it. There's me, the Chief of Impact. There's Karen, my partner, Sharon, and Bon, who's in the team with me. But um, so Liberty Society, what it is, it's a fashion social enterprise that aims to inspire society through the stories that we craft, the designs, and even the causes we support through um, more eco-friendly and sustainable options. We provide livelihood opportunities for refugee women through our House of Freedom, located currently in Bogor, Indonesia. So this is really the focus point and the entirety of our business is focused on these refugee women. Um, this is just one story I'd like to highlight. So her name is Narki. She's one of our seamstress, 35-year-old from Afghanistan. She's been living in Indonesia for three years. Refugee woman, four children. I do want to bring your eyes here. She's not sure that her children can achieve a, a future because life in Indonesia is very hard. So refugees in Indonesia, they have no basic right for education and work. Her youngest daughter's hope is to become a doctor and help refugees. Her hope is to become a kind mother and help children with their future hopes. But she feels very weak and she can help her children with their hopes and dreams. She has lots of pain in Indonesia because no one gives us value as a human. That's what she said. So this is where it stuck up the most. She feels that she isn't even a human. No one hears refugee voice. One of her daughters is sick and no one helped her. Only God helped her. So this is a real testimony of what her life was like a year ago when we first did an intervention program for these refugees. The problem is there are about more than 15,000 refugees in Indonesia without access to basic needs such as healthcare, education, and livelihood. There is a gap between customer trends that value sustainability and lack of impactful fashion in Indonesia. So where we really want to be is to upskill, give an upskilling opportunities for these refugees and access to market for them. And also at the same time, satisfy the needs of multinational corporations looking to procure social impact merchandising. Let me just show you a really awesome um, ladies here. These are the faces of those who make our shirts. Oops, sorry. There you go. Every day, people struggle to find purpose. Second chances hardly ever come when they're needed the most. But when they do, they come in the most unlikely forms. All of us are treads waiting to be woven into something big and beautiful. All it takes is a heart willing to love and hands willing to serve. Our hands have the ability to craft change. The ability to make us more than we are. I'm reminded that every day I have the chance to pick up a needle, paint some threads, and it was for me to stitch together something beautiful and unique. To put a small scrap of fabric to the story, to the story of God that will be retold again and again for me. These hands craft our stories, and Liberty Society allowed us to share it with the world. So the word freedom, the word liberty, is because we want to have this vision of freedom for education and freedom for hope for these refugee makers. This is our tailor and tailoring center. They are making t-shirts, also the one that I'm wearing right now. Um, Target market, we are providing basic wear and workwear alternatives for the urban millennials. Market size, about $200 billion market itself. We do B2C and B2B. So very briefly, these are some of our clients. Um, we have our store as well. I am very honored to be here actually because Earth Air and Duan Yam is actually way above us. Um, we started a year ago, but really um, kind of like people 
we really want to tap into that everyday wear that is affordable for the millennial itself who are rising to be more socially conscious. We use knit products. Um, let me show you. This is some of our mood boards. So knit products that refugees can eat make from the comfort of their own home. So think about cloud production. That's what uh, these refugees uh, actually can make. For B2C products, more so a lifestyle brand, where does our social enterprise model comes in? So we give employment training, we give a community of support to our house of freedom, uh, English class, a makeup class, psychosocial support class, and then we also train them not just with tailoring skill, but also with leadership development skills. So far, these are our impact. We've trained 40 women. We impacted about 100 people by giving them access to health care. Um, we call it Sambako in Indonesia, but um, we also help with their livelihood, basically. And uh, really, my focus with this business is to gain the awareness of their story um, of humanity that we all should care about. We increase their productivity hours. These are the ladies that usually stay at home 24-7. Their husband are not doing anything um, and they have to be the main breadwinner of the family. So this actually helps them with their mental health support as well at the same time income. Um, started May 2019. Um, and we have four retail stores location by now in Jakarta. And we are also in set cohort. So I'll just breeze through this, but the future plan is to employ more refugee women and makers to be a part of this impact intervention model. A lot of our revenue is actually from B2B corporate products and the rest is retail. So I do want to spend time for Q&A and as you know, we are a brand that has just been there for a year. We would love just advice on sales, production, inventory needs, and also HR that we're expanding the team now more than ever. And also network probably in just company, com company who care about sustainability. So that's all from us. Um, thank you. Thank you, Tamara. Fantastic. Um, we do have a couple of questions. We got one that's a um, couple of that's popped in already. Um, so first question is from Nathan and how far can your model scale with a follow up question of how large is your market access. So how far can your model scale. How scalable are you um, and how large is your current market access. For sure. So the number that I've shown you in the slides that we want to have about 160 refugee makers in four years, we actually already have the pipeline of makers because we work with local organizations on the ground who are able to, they have the pipelines and they have the HR ready. It's just that currently we, it's a basket chicken and egg kind of thing. We need the demand to be ready first so that there's order consistency and before we employ more. In terms of the regional sales strategy itself, we're looking into B2B bulk order, uh, for example. So in the next three to five years, looking into social impact supplier, looking to be social impact supplier for companies like IKEA um, and a lot of these major companies that actually looks for um, empowerment in their supply chain. Mm, great, thanks. So next question coming in for you, Tamara, is from uh, Saristic Asia. How much are the makers paid? And is it per hour or per piece? They are paid per items, per piece. And we pay above the market rate of sewing, usually in Indonesia. It would be five Singapore dollar per item. Okay, got it, great, great. Excellent. Okay, that looks like those are the questions coming in. And Tamara, anything else? We've got just a couple of minutes left. Anything else that you just you want to impart to everyone that's out there that you want to share? Um, well, I, I think j I went to TBN three years ago, and that's where all these ideas start. I look at Xiao Cheng and uh, Duan Yam, and then I got inspired. And a lot of the help that has been from TBN actually allowed me to create this dream together mm -hmm. with the refugee community. So yeah, I think it's just What would that. you say, so what would you say, what, do you have any advice for those that are out there? I mean, because you are, you're young, you're dynamic, you're working in a really hard competitive area. Uh, what advice would you have for others that are looking at you saying, gosh, I wish I could try and do that? 
uh, I don't know, just get a lot of mentor probably and just start it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and you've got an amazing mentor, don't you? So yeah, from TVN. Indeed, indeed. Wonderful. Oh, I've got one more question that's popped in. And that's it's again from Nathan, who's oh, so you got somebody out Nathan out there who's uh, quite interested in you. Um, what is the average income for your beneficiaries? So beneficiaries, Nathan, does that perhaps mean average income for your beneficiary? Maybe that's your rep. Maybe it's your, your, your employees, perhaps your, your refugee women that you're employing. Okay. Um, unfortunately, we haven't really done an impact measurement. So we don't know how much we increase their sales, their income level by in the percentage mm -hmm. level. Mm -hmm. But they all were jobless before they start working with us. Yeah. So definitely it's an income level that enables them to sustain their living per month. Okay. So it's so they can provide for their families. How about yeah. volunteers? Another question is, um, do you have any volunteers that also support Liberty Society? We do. We have uh, three volunteers coming from a high school. <laughs> so they're usually handling the content creation and the more marketing side of things. Mm, On the mm. production side itself, the center is fully run by the refugees and our tailoring teacher, production community center manager, they're all refugees. My admin person is refugees. Mm, um, mm. So definitely open for interns who are willing to help more in the kind of oversight role or the internal team aside from the refugee production side. Okay, marvelous. Great, okay. Thank you, Tamara. It's such a pleasure. Um, any, any final words? Otherwise, we're going to move on. For sure. Thank you. Thanks so much. Take care. Thank you. All right. Next up, we are going to uh, welcome Earth Air, uh, which Tamara just mentioned. So before um, I welcome Xiao Cheng to uh, the platform, just want to share just a little bit um, with those of you who have just joined us. We've got uh, quite a an invigorating couple of hours of social enterprises that you're hearing from. Just for those of you that are just coming on board, we just want to make sure that we say thank you to PLUS, who is our session partner um, for Social Enterprise Saturday, which is today. Um, don't miss the TVN Asia team session um, from 3 to 3.30. There's, just, there's an amazing team behind everything that's happened all week and that's happening today, and we'd love to to share a little bit about more about what we're doing and how you can play a part in our pretty cool and dynamic ecosystem. We'd love to welcome you. Also, we have an app. It's called TBN Asia app. Just go on and uh, download that and you can follow the exhi exhibitions. It'll be live for quite a while longer. So you can find out a lot more information there. Um, and just so you know that um, the social enterprises will also be hosting um, Q&A networking sessions after today's session. So that's that's through this platform, um, but we are not, TBN Asia is not facilitating that, but it's a wonderful way to connect one-on-one uh, -on -one with the different um, social enterprises. So um, thanks again. And I'm, I'm a fan of Earth Air. I was just telling Chao Cheng, I'm, 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 a, I'm in possession of one of their bags. So I'm really excited to have you present. So over to you. Thank you, Christy. Um, hi, everybody. And Tamara, you did very well. And, and I remember meeting Tamara, yeah, three years ago at TBN in Jakarta. And, you know, Tamara is one of the young, courageous, gracious social entrepreneur that, you know, I'm personally also inspired by. Uh, so, hi, everyone. Today, I'll just share with you about um, Earth Air and also some of the things that we've been doing since the crisis COVID happened and uh, what is our future plan and what are the things that we're looking forward to from today's session. So I'm just going to share with you my screen. Um, yeah. Um, Earth Air, we started in 2013. Uh, it started off because uh, Sassy, uh, our, my, my uh, co-founder, um, you know, we started off by engaging with some of the uh, rural weavers who were being exploited and we really just wanted to make sure that, you know, people with very beautiful heritage skills can also get appreciated and being treated fairly and not, not being exploited by unethical middlemen. Uh, so we started from there and um, we positioned ourselves by showcasing their beautiful, the beauty of their craftsmanship and the beauty of the, the skills that they have uh, by creating modern products uh, that are 
between medium to slightly premium range, uh, which will be appealing, which can appeal to more uh, wider audience um, in the market. So these are some of the jewelries that we've been producing with our refugee artisans. Uh, we started off by just working with some of the weavers, but um, at one point when the, when the word gets out, uh, we have refugee artisans coming to us and say, I can sew these, I can make these, I can do this, I can do this, why don't you, you work with me? So we started engaging with them and realized that, you know, there are certain skills that we can train them to, to do. And this is one of the results from our partnership with them, uh, also as a partnership with UNHCR. Uh, these are some of the bags that we designed uh, from from the, with the artisans that used to weave very traditional basket, but we really wanted um, their skills to be ap appreciated by the modern society. Uh, we also do a lot of corporate gifts prior to uh, COVID um, when corporate events and when people gathering and door gifts were still a thing. Uh, one of the things, one of our best seller items was actually the bookmarks and we actually supplied like uh, more than thousands of them for events and they are all woven by local indigenous people in the villages. So our business model is very simple. Uh, we engage with them, we work on the design, we train them to make products which usually takes about a few months uh, and then we will purchase these items from them uh, and and it's we are now certified also by World Fair Trade Organization so that means our all our documents and, and, and our trade with the artisans are, are, are audited and we, we just want to ensure that, you know, whoever that is purchasing from Earth Air have this security that, yes, it is indeed fair trade and, and we are here to give a dignified um, income opportunity for our artisans. So since we started, we have generated more than half a million of ringgit in income for the artisans that we served. And we are currently serving more than 100 artisans across Malaysia uh, in six, five to six states. And every year we also donate 10% of our profit to the NGOs and the uh, organizations that support the welfare and, and also the environment in Malaysia. We are extremely transparent with our supply chain. We publish our pricing transparency breakdown on our website. So every single dollar you spend on with, by purchasing an uh, other item, you actually know where your money go to. These are some of our portfolio. Uh, we are very thankful um, to be a partner of World Fair Trade Organization. And just two weeks ago, we are actually certified as a social enterprise plus member accredited by MAGIC. Uh, so we are extremely thankful for that because that will also mean that we are currently uh, allowed to approve uh, for tax exam st uh, status for all our donors. Uh, we actually launched our studio as a fair trade, first Malaysia, first fair trade boutique in Malaysia in February, uh, which we, in one, uh, we, we had to close it after one month due to COVID, but we are still operating uh, from there. Uh, it is still available and also we made our products online as well. So we are already serving uh, customers internationally from US, Europe, Japan, Taiwan as well, uh, as well as China. And since COVID started, actually, we were just we were thinking, what can we do to pivot and continue to support the income for our artisans? Uh, so one of the ideas that came up was um, making reusable masks, uh, which we started on the first and second week of um, the lockdown when the lockdown happened in Malaysia. And today we have so more than a few thousand pieces of the masks already uh, to retail customers and, and corporate clients. And another thing that we started doing was uh, we really wanted to support the frontliners as well as the refugee communities in Malaysia, uh, especially the refugee communities. They became the most vulnerable group uh, when this whole thing happened. Uh, the first was they, they, are, they are excluded from Malaysian government stimulus package. And also we began to see a lot of tension from the xenophobia 
from xenophobia community, from people who, who started um, having, having um, unfair treatment for the migrant workers and refugees in Malaysia. So we started very small. We started by raising some fund and make some PPE uh, uh, to be donated to frontliners. And everything was work, um, every, every, of, every one of our artisans actually have to work under very strict SOP uh, on sanitizing, sanitizing the workshop, their equipments, everything um, under the World Factory Organization guidelines. So we slowly expanded our, uh, our uh, PPE project and actually within two, within two weeks, we raised about 40,000 US dollars. Uh, which allow us to uh, support 27 refugee families to sew PPEs for the past two months. And this is a picture of me and Sassy packing uh, 1,000 pieces of PPE sets. We've been also featured on um, the local newspapers and we really want to send the message of hope out there that we are all in this together and, and none of us is above and, uh, other and this is the time where it should be it's even more important for us to come and help those who are in uh, desperate needs so we're currently still looking uh, we're still raising funds these are some of our milestones that we achieve um, we are currently still raising funds for our PPE uh, projects um, and we are just very thankful because um, one of this is this is um, a, a message from one of our refugee sewers who said he's just very proud because he can contribute something back to Malaysia in this season. So we feel like aside from uh, creating income for them and uh, supporting the donating the PPE to frontline uh, heroes in, in, in Malaysia, um, the need for the society to see them as fellow humans in the society is very important. Uh, this is our team. Our team has been extremely uh, resourceful and, and, and adapt super quickly when we had to make the pivot in the past two months. Uh, so without them, we couldn't have achieved this. And one of the biggest achievements that we achieved from this pivot was within two months, we actually generated the income that is as high as the total income in 12 months last year to the community that we serve. So we are extremely blessed and thankful and we, continue, we hope to continue to work on this project and as well as expanding our online projects as well. Um, so yeah, let's stay connected and if you have any questions, ask now and I can answer you. If not, I have scheduled two Zoom calls. Uh, I understand that you might be having a lot of Zoom calls today. So there's one session today at five o'clock that I'll be online as well as on Monday, two o'clock. That's all for oh, my sharing. Amazing, thank you. That's a great presentation. So actually it's interesting because um, Sajin, one of the questions that came in was about your annual revenue pre-COVID. Um, but you, in a sense, you kind of answered that questions in the sideways. I mean, do you share your revenue numbers? Uh, we do. Our, our annual revenue is actually still currently below 1 million ringgit Malaysia. Mm, mm, uh, mm. We were aiming to achieve that this year, but yeah. we are, um, in terms of income for artisans, we definitely have uh, achieved, uh, we, are, we are way above our goals. Uh, uh, but in terms of overall company revenue, we are still... Um, we're still trying to, to achieve that. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the ways that we are looking to achieve that is number one, by expanding our PPE and mass range for okay. corporate clients, especially. Yep. And secondly is by uh, continue growing our e-commerce because our e-commerce sales have actually increased over the mm. period of lockdown. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's phenomenal. That is really interesting. I, I was just, you just answered my question. I was just going to ask you a little bit about that, the pivot you described, your, how, what is your, your how you are, your pivot plan, I suppose, how you are adapting. So it's offering new products that the market is now demanding, which you, we didn't even think about before, correct? Anything else you would add to that? Yeah, I think, I think one of the, one of the, one of the questions that we asked ourselves at the beginning of the lockdown was, um, are we offering necessities for what the world is facing right now? Mm. Uh, obviously, we are offering some fashion lifestyle mm. products. Uh, 
it's it's a nice to have products but we, when we are thinking of what are some of the necessity products that we can produce um, mm. the first thing that we started off was with masks you know we just started by experimenting we started by sending out some google form uh, and ask oh you can pre-order but then we didn't want what we, we received quite an overwhelming response and then that's that's when we decided to to continue selling the mask right, right. Uh, and the same thing happened to PPE as well uh, even though on the news we, we kept seeing that um, there's enough PPE in Malaysia but when I actually try to make some phone calls and try to find connections to uh, frontliners themselves and then that's when I realized that all of all the frontliners that I contacted none of them have said that they have enough PPEs. Uh, in fact, some of them were even using raincoats to protect themselves uh, and they're so desperate. And that's when I realized that um, I can't fully trust the news. <laughs> I know what's on the ground yeah, and, yeah, and we started yeah, there. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So another question for you is, um, do you donate the PPEs before getting donations or do you wait for the donations to be able to fund them and, and, then, and then provide them? How do you, what's the model for that? So we've been quite blessed. Uh, when we first started fundraising, we actually just took some, we just invested in some of the materials and decided to make, but within half an hour, we raised enough money for the first batch that we wanted right. to make. Right. And then within two weeks, we raised enough funding for enough work for two months. So, so in our case, the funding come first, but now we are at the stage where uh, we are looking to continue to expand this work uh, or at least allow our artisans to continue working and that's when we are we are, we are still open for for fundraising basically okay okay um, got another question for you from joy is your model mainly b2c um, and would the social enterprise accreditation help in accelerating partnerships with corporates um, our model is quite well balanced between b2c and b2b yeah. So we have served our corporate clients, uh, even internationally, by uh, sending door gifts or VIP gifts. Um, we are one of our key strengths is also in customizations. Right. Uh, however, I think the B two B side has dropped quite significantly because of COVID, and and we can't have mass gatherings now. Right. So we are definitely looking at providing employee packages, care packages that involve like masks, reusable masks, for example, for the, mm. for the corporate client. Right. Um, sorry, there's a second part to this question and I forgot what the second part is. Um, is, it, oh, is, it, is, is the accreditation that you've just received, is that helpful in accelerating partnerships with corporates? Um, we don't know yet. Uh, we just received that, but we are hoping that corporates who are looking for tax exemptions from their mm. donation uh, can also, we, are, we definitely welcome partnerships uh, that way. Right. And since now, we, 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 we can provide that. Yeah. Okay. I guess, um, oh, we've got another question that just popped in. Um, so I'll do that one instead of my own. Um, are your clients mostly one-offs or do you have a, sus a sus substantial returning customer base? You've got a lot of repeat business? Um, we have repeat, uh, however, uh, I have the percentage on top of my mm -hmm. head, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. especially yeah. our corporate clients and, and a lot of our local businesses also are from referrals. So okay. our customers actually bring other customers to us. Okay, got it. So I'll just ask you one other question, um, since we've got a minute here, and that is just in these, I mean, you, you guys have clearly embraced this, um, you know, just having to adapt to a new, a new, a new normal out there. Um, anything else that you would share or any other advice you would give to others that are looking at this period of, oh my gosh, what we, do we do? The, the world has changed. Um, anything um, else you would share? Yeah, sure. I will share something very close to my heart. Um, mm. It was at the beginning of when, when all this happened, um, I was just trying to understand and, and, you know, just get my head around uh, everything. And, and it was during one of the sessions when I was pondering, I saw an eagle in the sky and that gave me an understanding that, and, and when, I, when I looked into what an eagle means, actually mm. when a storm is coming, an eagle will actually use the opportunity of the storm to rise above the storm. And an eagle will use the wind of the storm to rest its wing and, and glide higher. So, I would encourage all of you who are looking for opportunities or trying to 
or even feeling pressure and it, it is a very stressful time but um when we look at an eagle that that's where i draw my inspiration from and and we can come out stronger from this crisis mm. yeah terrific thank you so much wonderful thanks for joining us thank you Christine. Xiao Cheng. Thanks Thank so you, much. everyone. I will send our contact here. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Thanks so much. All right. Take care. Bye. Okay. So next up is Juan from Danyam. And uh, we'll get that loaded up here. And I think he's on standby, ready to go. Yes. Yes, I Juan. Welcome. Welcome. Yeah. Welcome Thank to the you. showcase. I'll yeah. turn it right over to you with no further ado. Introduce yourself and your company and uh, tell us more. All right. So maybe uh, we can start from the video. Mm. Uh, can you play the video first, maybe? All right. Uh, uh, there we go. Yeah. Mm. Uh, this is our video to tell about the, the forest and please enjoy the, our video. Okay, uh, uh, good afternoon everyone. Mm. We have you in the forest and this video talk about the, the, the how to unique the forest and and how how we doing the, the good things in forest. Uh, mm. Can I open the slide? Yeah, I think uh, Josh, there, I mean, uh, Juan, they're working on the backside. There we go. All right. Thanks so uh, much. Uh, yeah. Mm. My name is Yuan. Uh, I'm the business development and account uh, manager of Duanyam. Uh, Duanyam is a social enterprise uh, that produces and distributes bigger crop to empower women and promote culture and improve livelihood of women in rural area in Indonesia. And Nash. And Duanyam is established in 2014 and over the past five years, uh, we have grown from working with only 10 women in one villagers to empowering over 100 uh, people across 50 villagers in Forest Island, increasing their income by 40 persons. And so far, uh, we have sold over 120,000 products to more than 200 companies in Southeast Asia. And then, next. The reason why uh, do I am access is uh, the chronic maternal health issue. Our malnutrition is often of Indonesia. Uh, they are the three socioeconomic uh, factor that cause the chronic health issue here. Uh, the first one is lack of year round cuts. The average of women income per month is $16, which is happily uh, dependent on agriculture sector. And we understand uh, the average uh, of women income, uh, the average of, from the agriculture is unstable throughout the year. Uh, there is growing season and hard scooping season in which is the woman cannot get stable stream in income in the end. And the second factor is lack of income uh, option, the product because most of women, they are able to do weaker uh, weaving, which is part of tradition that has been passed through generation. Uh, the women uh, usually use the craft product for traditional ceremony and offering. So uh, do I am come up 
maybe the solution that will first we connect existing scale with the resource to the market. Uh, this way, we can give the woman opportunity uh, to monetize weaker weaving. Uh, we will also promote and preserve local culture. And then the second one is how we empower women to financial security uh, by providing regular source of cash year round. Uh, we increase their access to better nutrition and education for them and their children. And lastly, uh, we provide a platform to introduce further social impact. With our in deep relationship with our women, uh, we become the natural partner for other organization to provide uh, health intervention, scholarship, and technology for the rural women community. Next. Uh, today, uh, do I am work with women in three provinces in Indonesia? Maybe you guys are familiar is Nusa Tenggara for us, and the second Papua, and the last was Kalimantan. Right. We have the two type product uh, home decor of living collection, like basket trays, compressors of basket and indoor sleepers, as well as the fashion or style collection, uh, compressors uh, of bags, clutch, or wallet, and small accessories. We offer high quality, functional, and of course, modern design for every product in our collection. Next. Uh, we also collaborate with the designer and established lifestyle brand, coming up with the design that combine modern look and of course function with the traditional touch. Uh, we launched our first uh, retail collection uh, in the runway of Jakarta Fashion Week 2016 and winning the few international recognition awards afterwards. And next. And Acti, our SaaS comes from B2B. Acti persons, our SaaS comes from B2B with hotel and research. Uh, including international hotel chains being our major client. Uh, we also serve corporation and institution supplying gifts and merchandises uh, for their events and promotion. Overall, uh, for now we have partnered with over 200 wholesale well clients, supplying more than 4,000 uh, 4, product monthly and providing not only the product but additional co-marketing value for our clients. And then in 2018, uh, we are very lucky because Duanyak is selected to be the only one social enterprise as one of the official merchandise ASEAN Games and also the official souvenir for World Economy Forum. Next. And uh, also we have export to a country globally such as the United States, Japan, Belgium, Hong Kong, and few other since 2017. We start our export mostly in home decor collection, and we are extending the product offering in style or fashion collection as well for international buyers. Next. Uh, as mentioned before, uh, the ASEAN Games, one of the, our big achievements. This is the exclusive range of uh, merchandise that we produce for ASEAN Games 2018. Everything you see in the picture is customized, is fully customized to support the event from coaster, luggage, handpan, and where we embed the hammer tweaker part to each of the product. Next. And we partner, uh, maybe before, next, all right. Uh, so, uh, so we have the program for the social impact to our weaver. So we have the three pillar, empower women, promote culture, improve livelihood. In every day, our pillar, we always to stay with, uh, with our vision and mission and 
so how to make sure that our impact still uh, sustainable and next and we partner with uh, various foundation JSR and government to deliver further impact for our weavers and their children uh, we have distributed more than 179 scholarship to the children of our weavers and also we have provided more than 4,000 4, locally sourced nutritious meal to women and children as well. Um, on top of that, we also distribute solar lamp plus lens glasses and trainings such as financial literacy, English and computer lessons for the women. Next. So in 20,000, uh, 20, 2014, uh, this is the, our team, uh, the three co-founder of Du Anyam, gathered together to come up with a sustainable solution to address the social issue. Uh, with their diverse and complementary background, uh, we are able to balance the social vision and the business approach. Uh, Hana, our chief community officer, has worked with an international NGO in small medium enterprise development program in forest, while Melia, uh, our chief of marketing officer, has extensive experience in real estate, wholesale and retail family business. And the last, uh, our CEO, Ayu, has a mixed experience in public health, family business, and private sector consulting. Next. And Duanyam has also received support and recognition from the government. Thank you so much for government of Indonesia, such as being created to participate in Indonesian good like in Milan, New York, and Paris. And we are also uh, wanted to be the best social enterprise and small medium enterprise supporting in startup in Indonesia in 2019. Next. Next, uh, and also we receive support through through positive media coverage in national TV newspaper and magazine here in Indonesia. Lastly, uh, Duanyam is now looking to scale its business and impact to disturb crap and small medium enterprises in Indonesia. Uh, how we connecting them into an ecosystem where stakeholders such as market, uh, designer, uh, checks and fund, and craft small medium enterprise can work together in a digital platform that Duanyam is preparing right now. And thank you very much for your time to listen to Duanyam Junior today. Uh, thank you, uh, Christy, uh, and everyone. If you want to support our cast empower women, promote culture, and improve uh, livelihood, as simple as to purchase our b 2 Net product. You can visit and go to our website, www.duanyam.com, or as simple as you follow our Instagram at duanyam, <laughs> or send us email to sell us at duanyam.com for further inquiry, because so many product is very, very cute, is very, very unique. And also, uh, after this, we also stand by in the virtual TBN app to talk with you all, to share and to talk uh, anything if you want to know more our product. And uh, also, we provide the uh, Zoom link. Thank you so much. Uh, Juan, thank you. Thank you very much. Excellent. Hey, I've just I've got a question for you um, in the chat, um, and it's actually something that's rather near to, uh, dear, near to my heart as well. And it's talking about, you talk about your craft artisans. How yeah. do you... I guess kind of a two-part question. How do you find them? And then how do you build a trusting relationship with them? Is it what are the challenges and, and how have you done that so successfully? All right. Uh, basically, yes, very challenging how to get mm. the, their uh, their trust, uh, how to the, our mother uh, uh, really trust with us because uh, they live in the small island, then they don't have the access like the money, uh, like the cash. So, uh, so many NGO come there, but they they don't need to like the hope and yeah, the, the future. 
and the first act, uh, the first we come we come there uh, of course we get a decline and rejected okay okay no no we don't need you and then we need we need to the money so how many how many how much money you will give to us because in every NGO come here only for give the money we don't need to training we don't need right. to give the you know like how to weave in the weaker part but uh, step by step we we train we to open their my the mindset because we if you want to get uh, if you want to get the, the good economy the good nutrition yeah you need to start from the small thing like because you weaving is very good so this this product have the market then we tell one by one and yeah this is very challenging but because we have the team and then we trust to each trust each other we always uh, approach one uh, approach slowly by slowly and deep relationship of course Sweet. let me ask you another question so let's say so you you provide the provide the training for them so that they're 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 creating products that you that that meet your quality standard. How do you how do you manage perhaps when they're when they're creating some products that don't quite meet your quality standard? Well, the hard question for me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, actually this is one of the challenges every social enterprise right in yeah. small medium enterprise. Yeah. As you know in Indonesia actually so many small medium enterprise they have the good product, the unique product when they have when they got the, the order from the government for example from the company but they don't know how to manage the quality how to make mm. sure each the product have the same quality mm. and the first things maybe uh yeah do i have the same problem but we always do you know like the how to uh, improve one by one to tell the, our mother because uh, our mother different culture different language uh, you know uh, how to communicate with the local language right right so it's very challenging for for us right. when we talk in jakarta like how to measure, measure the sizing like the 16 uh, centimeter how to calculate and how to tell the, our mother we are using the like the local language and right. the, our team learn about that and tell one by one and also uh, we have the standard uh, procedure operations and we uh, teach one by one. That's why the all our mother, our master weaver learn like the English computer, mm. how to operating Facebook, how to operating WhatsApp Messenger, as simple to how to operate the, the technology and yeah. how to our mother catch up and open to, yeah. to know. So do you? Uh, there's another question that popped in here for you, and that is. Um, are you are you a, are you able to make some pretty substantial margins? And um, just from a financial sustainability perspective, uh, how do you manage that? Uh, if we talk about the, the margin, how because the forest island is very far from Jakarta, it's really quick, uh, quite uh, to arrange. Uh, but we have the strategy to to collaboration and. Uh, to collaboration and building the relationship with the local local you know like uh, local uh local supply chains mm -hmm. uh, for example they have the good they have the, the 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 system they will work with them and we tell about we help the mothers so can you give the cheap pricing and then mm -hmm. after that we work with the like the uh, forwarder uh, how to manage the our shipping from the forest to Jakarta mm -hmm. and make sure that our price not really uh, expensive but uh, match with the our segment uh, mm -hmm. market um, mm -hmm. uh, and then how to make sure the our sourcing the our material uh, how to get the good material but also how uh, also our team to manage like uh, oh this is a good uh, pricing to the yeah. to our margin and this is good to the quality too got it all right Wonderful. Thank you so much, Yuan. Anything else you want to share? This we're in the middle of so much uh, change and the world is shifting around us. Any other pieces of advice you'd want to share with our audience? Yes, yes, yes sure, sure. Actually, the last hour uh, my speech is I wanted to tell about uh, in every in social enterprise in the world, especially in Indonesia, we fight together for uh, COVID-19, especially for Du Anyam. We always 
to think, to making different uh, idea, to collaboration with the social enterprise brand, how we still to fight and stand. We still live with our dreams and you know, we make it so happen. Uh, yeah. So many things we doing good, like the making hampers in Lebaran. Yeah. We, we make it like the clutch mask. We never do that, but we do it because we, we know we, we need to help each other. Mm. We don't need to we don't need to to know our company, but how do we sharing each other with another mm. social enterprise? Mm. Because yes, this has happened. This COVID nineteen situation, we need to hand 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 to hand to mm -hmm. help. And yes, we need to support each other. Like maybe like uh, Tamara's mentioned before, yep. you you yep. know what do I am. I'm so happy. We are, we need to that. Uh, we need doing uh, more than that. Yeah, yeah, together we are stronger. Believe that too. Yeah. Great. Yeah, Thank yeah. you so much. All the You're best to you. Welcome, Chris. Thanks. Thanks. Really Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. All right, everyone. Next up, we're going to move from the from the land of uh, of retail products and, and cool stuff into the aroma, the smell of fresh baked goods. So imagine, if you will, with me, just kind of close your eyes and make that shift so that you're smelling something amazing coming out of uh, perhaps not your kitchen or mine, but certainly out of this, this chat room. We've, we're going to welcome Ibu Prunier now, um, and uh, they create and bake the most amazing treats. And so is it Ida that's, gonna, that's going to share? Yes, that's me. I'm here. Okay, welcome. And I know you've Thank got a you. couple of your team with you so yes. i'm just going to turn it right over to you share yeah. with us if you would um can i have the slide please zoom tech all right all good all right i just want to say thank you for everyone for being here with ibrapreneur today um next Oh, before that. Okay. Um, so I just want to start. I'm Aida. So I'm the CEO of Ibupreneur, and I'm pre presenting on behalf of my team, Ming Chi and Wei Chi. So just to give you a start off, um, when we began first in September 2019, we found that there were 4.8 million of women out of the labor force here in Malaysia, and it's for two main reasons majority feels like they have to they have major responsibility for household works and 8.6 percent of them are retired and when they're retired they don't have a proper social security framework and our research shows that more than half of them have less than 50,000 saved and to and for that to sustain in the next upcoming years up to 30 years it was very challenging but then when we found amongst these women they have talent and they have really unique talents in baking especially in unique products like you know cake lapis which is known for a cake of thousand layers or steam cakes is up the steam up to eight hours so we know that this is the kind of talent that not everyone has but they do try to run their businesses but we found the problem is that their businesses is very traditional and you know to keep up with today's trend of digital technology and also the you know the business trends, that's what they're lacking of because they are elderly mothers, mostly retired from you know, late 40s and 50s, mostly 50s and above. And they found that you know, they know how to bake these products, but who can sell for them? And that's what they're looking for, a proper platform to generate uh, continuous demand. So that's what Ibupreneur is. We are an integrated marketplace and we aim to empower women that are financially dependent um, and vulnerable mothers that are often single mothers, they're depending on government pensions or just on their family members. So in our marketplace, we help them to brand, package and market to get more, uh, more sales for them. But beyond that, we also organize workshops that can help them to upskill their business skills and also their baking skills. Um, and overall, what we aim is to holistically provide financially st financial stability for them. So next, so our vision is to become this university for mothers. And right now, this is a brief assessment of our impact assessment. 
we have onboarded eight mothers up to this point, but growing, we want to ensure that mothers are in every supply chain, you know, from baking, packaging, offline and digital marketing, and logistic deliveries, and also, you know, upskill their opportunities to have customer relations. Um, in terms of business model wise, 60% of the sales revenue goes to them and because we buy the products up front and we mark it up around 30% to incur the packaging costs, you know, marketing and branding. Um, beyond that, we have impacted 45 lives and we aim to, you know, grow the ecosystem larger. The added value that we aim to, um, to bring is, you know, educate them on how to have premium products because this is what people are looking for and this is what's lacking in the Malaysian market and also making sure that they are consistent and have high quality. Next. Next. So here are some testimonials from some of our mothers. For example, Ellie, uh, when I met up with her and she's been baking for a long time, 64, you know, um, her husband recently just passed away and she's depending on a pension fund and she just battled cancer and, but she adopted this little girl that she truly cares for and to take to take care of her she found that baking is has motivated her to get up and support her little and angel and beyond that also our newest additional mothers is laura and helena they are um laura here is married to a malaysian citizen which is helena's brother and ever since she lost her job she found that baking, you know, she needs to grow her EPF because she solely cannot financially depend on that because one day is going to run out. So she feels like, oh, this baking is sustainable for her and she's also doing something that she loves. Next. So this is how we, this, these are our milestones and this is how we aim to grow. We first met at the Youth Leadership Academy initiated by McKinsey and Co. along with th my three other teammates. You know, we started our pilot projects with four mothers, developing some cr products and we really seeked out there. You know, we met up with Picha Eats to learn more about them. We met with Kim. You know, we really get, need to know how does a social enterprise work and how to make sure this is going to be sustainable for us. And then we, as a team, we developed our online store, we raised funds, we went to the market, collected data, and you know, we engaged with Magic and raised some funds. And now where we are is we want to change a bit more of our um, business model because before we were focusing on customers, but we found that if we um, reach out to corporates, we can get consistent sales you know, every month and they tend to buy in bulk as well for their gifts. And we believe that this is a great starting technique for marketing, right? And so to grow, we really, we really, you know, see this, we're really thinking big for this project together. We, to, because we have demands from corporates, but we are unable to cater to them. For example, if corporates want a hundred gift boxes, you know, we don't have enough mothers. We don't have the right place. So we want to onboard more mothers so we can empower are more women and we want to have a central kitchen or at least a central packaging place because now you know we are young entrepreneurs hustling we're still doing it at home and we want to enter retails like cafes you know to have more of our products out there and of course you know this is our tradition tradition we want to go global go ASEAN have our products in hotels and airlines and see hey guys this is our kick lapis this is our country all right okay next and we've this is our impact assessment since eight months um this does consider the times when we're downfall because before we did have a restructuring in terms of our routine um this oh um we we've generated 57 this is not an updated version um and that goes to 32.8k for the mothers so at least 60 percent of sales and this is impactful because the mothers find it very worthwhile doing it from home and it's enough for example during Raya alone this season they were able to generate five to seven k and for them that's they find it sustainable for the next two or three months you know they don't have much demand so until the next season which is Raya, Raya Haji they find that oh wow you know they're doing something they love and they're earning they can support their family without thinking oh where to pay you know the bills so it's great and we have collaborated with more than 17 collaborations 
And with the seed funding that we got from Magic, we were able to generate 5.3 times of it. We've also um, collected feedbacks to get to know because we consistently want to improve more. And gladly, 89% of them is positive feedback, but we want to increase that higher. So we're still collecting, you know, trying to ways to improve our products. Next. Here are some of the customers that we have served. Um, you know, we were happy that we were able to target Time Diary Property, Lenovo, CIMB, which were able to, you know, generate bulk uh, impact for our mothers and for us as well to grow as an initiative. Next. So we do aim to raise more funds for us to grow because we see that there's potential, you know, and um, since this is not the updated slide, you know, we want to expand in terms of getting ourselves properly registered, you know, because like Cindy and Berhad, since we're only a partner uh, enterprise right now, you know, we want to develop more partnerships with corporates and oftentimes they require like vendor registration process. So we want to be, be able that we can, you know, we are, you know, properly, properly set in terms of that to, to meet their guidelines. And we want to expand in terms of human resources. We want to build our team more because, you know, more work, more demand, and we need more people. But with that, we also want to make sure it's a sustainable strategy for additional members. Um, moving on, we want to get, when, when we onboard more mother, oh, next, go back. When we want to onboard more mother, um, mothers, we want to get them certified, but, uh, certified and conduct more workshops to make sure you know their baking skills are hygienic that they themselves are practicing poor quality control uh, uh, positive uh, quality control and with that we have collaborated before with Sunway Education Group at the UNIS Business Center you know in their social kitchen series so we're really looking you know future that we can work together um, next we wanna oh, go back uh, we also wanna you know, it increase our equipment, capital assets, so we can get more ovens to meet more capacity demand, um, proper logistics, you know, structure, and also have a centralized packaging place. And um, yeah, and globalize. We want to raise funds for that as well, because that's, you know, there are requirements for more research and development in our products and a service. So next. So here's my team, that's me, Ida, and Ming-Chi, and wei Chi's here as well. Um, thank you for listening. So we're gonna open the room now for a Q&A session. Go next. Yeah. Uh, Ida, we thank you so much. Yeah. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, no go ahead. Hmm. Okay, sorry, we actually had one slide that shows our Q&A session, but we'll post it on our chat group. Okay. But we'll still open it up for Q&A and actually I'll, I'll start with the, with the first one. Um, if there's uh, any questions that come into the chat, we'll grab those. But um, I guess it's, uh, it's similar to kind of a question we were talking about before with you, with uh, your mom, your mother is wor working on quality and consistency you talked about and that they mm -hmm. have to get, um, you talked about a certification and how do you, especially because you don't have a central kitchen, right? Um, right? How do you manage that? Well, you know, before we onboard them, we try to get their specialties in a particular product. And so we know that they're very good. Mm. For example, like Ellie, we knew that, you know, she'd done this for years, but she just doesn't know how to market it. But her product is phenomenal. Mm. So how we manage that is that they, they, before we send it to the end buyer, the products still come to me. So I make sure that, okay, this is great, quality control, this is right, and then we send it out. Because we're still relatively new mm. in September 2019. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Um, sorry, Wei did you want to add on to that at all? Uh, I actually uh, saw a question, which is, uh, what is our strategy to recruit more mothers to join this platform? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I was uh, actually, to answer to that question, we are planning to onboard more mothers, especially also in the packaging services. So how we are doing that is we will sign up, we, are, uh, we have curated an application form for these mothers to um, sign up to join as an ebookpreneur. And mm -hmm. then we will go through, we will screen through what kind of talents do they have, uh, be it baking, packaging, or off marketing skills like photography. Mm -hmm. And then we will see whether or not it fits like whether, mm. what are their struggles, understand better of their background, and then 
After that, we will send them an agreement which states all the procedures and all that. And then they are officially on board. So that, that's basically mm, the recruiting mm. process. Are there, just, and, and then you, you recruit, recruit the mothers, you know that they can, they bake amazing things. What, what else, what other, there's a question here about what else, what other kind of education um, and training um, is required to help them uh, succeed? So right now, you know, we are, we have been aligned together with this one company called EQ Quality Training. So mm. we really look at Okay, Ministry of Health, for example, they require a food handling course, and that's the basic requirements before you mm. serve people and, you know, getting the typhoid in, in, um, injections, and that's the most necessary. But then beyond that, we're thankful that, you know, Eunice Business Social Center at the Sunway Education Group, they're providing us mm. the space. You know, mm. they're providing us the people, like the chef who's like a pastry World Cup winner who gets to mm. teach them, like, look, this is what you have to do. This is how you set yeah. the oven. So the technicalities to have these people is our support. It's, yeah. you know, we, we save money and we save costs, but we're collaborating yeah. and we think we yeah. impact more. Right. Got it. So would you consider, um, Yoon is asking, would you consider collaborating with other NGOs or other um, perhaps social enterprises um, on, on, to help grow and expand your business? Yes, definitely. You know, mm. we, have, we have demands. For example, if we see a mother, this is what's great about TBN because you get to see a like-minded people like we saw Tukang Jahid and we're like, wow, these people are great. We can, uh, you know, we can, great, we can connect with their mothers and empower them and if they can help us with our packaging, yeah. there's just a lot of options and yeah. I think TBN, that's what it's great for. Oh, yeah. yeah, it's amazing. The ecosystem, actually, it's been amazing just to watch what's happened uh, even just since COVID. Um, yeah. The last three, four, I mean, just, it's just sparking and it's, it's, it's encouraging to see how everybody's coming together to help every to help everyone else yeah. right that, that generosity of spirit is really special yeah. i think yeah. yeah so that's crucial for us but collaboration is the way forward that we see at this point is kind of time yeah um so there's one more question back to kind of the nuts and bolts and that's on hygiene um mm -hmm. i guess it's back to the fact that there are i guess these are home-based largely home-based uh bakers mm -hmm. how do you ensure that you know the hygiene i mean of the kitchen and just the the cleanliness and all the things that have to go in with with baking from home okay so when we first onboard them definitely taking into account their kitchen you know we go there we have like some standard operating procedures we mm. audit their kitchen and you know monthly we check in on house everything do you need help um you know they they go for that food handling course that means right. they learn what they need to learn but we are we are looking to make it more concrete that's mm. why we want to have a central packaging place and that way you know it we can we can like have pest control coming in um mm. all those other right. you know like you know they have other registration and certification right. Right. yeah right got it wonderful all right yeah guys thank you so much um I think there's a lot of folks out there that'll be really keen to uh, to have further conversations with you. Thanks for putting up your your QR code earlier, and I know you'll put your in, your contact information into the mm -hmm. chat. And um, all the best. Thank, Thank you. You Thanks, got the tasty stuff. Absolutely. Take care. <laughs> Great. Thanks, guys. All right. Bye, guys. Bye. Thanks. But as we know, when we're eating, um, for everybody, when we're eating um, tasty treats, what do we want to do with those? We want to drink a lovely cup of coffee. Um, so from now, we're going to go back to Indonesia, and we're going to welcome the Sustainable Coffee Platform of Indonesia, folks. And I think I've got, is it, uh, who I got here? I got uh, Paramita? Hi. Hi. Hey, welcome. Hi. Welcome. Good to see I'm, you. Good to see you, too. And uh, please. I'm a, I'm a big coffee drinker and I love what you do. So let me turn the floor over to you and uh, please share with us. All right, thank you, Gusti. All right, um, hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Paramintam Tari, you can call me Tari. Uh, we're based in Indonesia, as Christy said. Uh, our office is based in Jakarta, but we are working in 15 provinces. So I'm here with some of our team members. Um, uh, we're representing Sustainable Coffee Platform of Indonesia. We've been established um, in Indonesia since March to, uh, 2015. So that's about five uh, years ago. Okay, next. We're basically um, a legal entity in the form of um, an NGO, but we are also a platform for, uh, we, so we have members and we have partners and so on. 
uh, who would like to promote and enhance public par uh, private partnership in sustainable coffee production. But before explaining who we are, I would like to give you an overview about the Indonesian coffee sector. So basic, uh, basically in Indonesia, uh, our coffee is uh, maybe different than what other countries. We are the uh, four largest producers in the world, but our strength is our diversity. That's different because uh, or uh, as an analogy, if we plant one uh, coffee tree in, let's say, in Sumatra Island, and you want to plant it in uh, Borneo or Papua, they will grow differently because we have a very a variety uh, of climate, seasonal changes, soil condition, and so on. So we have thousands of single origins stretch over 5,000 to 100 kilometer. As uh, you all know, uh, we have the longest uh, coastal line in the world. And we have 2 million smallholders in the coffee sector. Uh, so next, please. All right. So uh, there are five coffee producing provinces. The top five uh, in Indonesia. The first one is South Sumatra, as you'll know in the top left corner on this slide. And then the second one is Lampung, which is the largest producer of Robusta coffee. And then there is North Sumatra. Uh, and then East Java and Aceh. Maybe you've heard about Gayo coffee, that's where it comes from. And then, as I said, we have about 2 million smallholders uh, in Indonesia, where uh, 96, uh, it made up 96% of the uh, ownership in the coffee uh, plantation area, and where about 2% is owned by state, and then uh, the private sector only uh, own about also 2%, surprisingly. So the Indonesia's coffee climate itself, well, we also have a similar trend and, and culture, maybe because most of us, uh, we are the largest, um, we're not a Muslim country, we em embrace diversity, but we have the largest Muslim population, right? So coffee is like um, a social beverage for all of us. And um, you can, if you come to Indonesia, you can see in any places we drink coffee instead of alcohol beverage. Maybe that's one of the reason we have uh, like an increase of consumption. The domestic consumption is about uh, one hundred percent each year, while the production is, uh, we can say, it's a bit stagnant. Although you can see there's an increase in the number of the tons uh, within the past ten years. The numbers quit quite similar, but uh, it doesn't really align with the, the increase in the consumption. So this is a problem statement for us. The coffee productivity in Indonesia is actually questionable without us realizing it. And then uh, in terms of export, it has been decreasing as well in the past decade. Also, uh, but imports have been going up tremendously, as you all can see. Okay, next. So this is just to give you a, a picture, an overview for those of you who I'm sure from Singapore have been coming to Indonesia, hopefully, but for those who not, um, we have a very also diverse <laughs> consumer uh, profile. So you see on the, on the bottom left, corner of the slide, there is a, what we call the Starling. Starbucks clearing is like <laughs> the Starbucks who go on a bike, selling coffee in the sachet. That's where the commercial coffee going in, commercial grade coffee produced by the large off takers and uh, producers. And then, but of course, the specialty coffee and the premium coffee um, has been increasing in the past years. And it has been growing really well with our youth, um, society, the millennials, almost, uh, most of the people that I've met, they want to be like a barista or a youth um, coffee entrepreneur. They would like to open coffee shops everywhere. That's where the premium and the uh, specialty grade coffee coming in. As you can see, this is just a port, uh, portraying uh, different brands of coffee shops uh, locally. Okay, next. So this is, come back to Scopy, this is our working area, but this is not only ours because we have about 40-something uh, partners who consists of uh, international NGOs, local NGOs, also more than 20-something local government representative, and also the provincial and uh, central government. Um, we also have members, uh, now about 44, 45 members, uh, also, uh, now we work in um, the, uh, these 15 provinces, uh, 
we only know that there are 15 coffee producing provinces in Indonesia. And if you see the colorful buttons there, I know it's a pretty small from here. Um, it's a, representing the programs that we patch in those areas through our master trainers. So what are our master trainers? I'll, I will explain it to you later. Let's see next. All right, so for now, until now, Scopy has been fully funded by the membership fee and also the Scopy donors. We have been supported by the Global Coffee Platform, which is based in Bonn, Germany, uh, Ford Foundation, Rainforest Alliance, uh, IDH, GIZ, Ricolto, New Zealand, and, and the Islamic International Trade and Finance Corporation, as you can see on the top left corner. And then uh, these are examples of our partners and our members. Maybe you know or you might not know some of them, but I'm sure uh, you can identify uh, certain logos that you know. Okay, next. So um, this is um, the picture, maybe um, you might not know who these are, but this is a, the Minister of Cooperatives and Small Medium Enterprise who came to our uh, discussion, our coffee discussion session, we call it DISCO. <laughs> Uh, because it's called Discussy Coffee in Indonesia. So we'd like to, as I said, uh, promote and enhance PPP in coffee production and trade uh, to achieve economic opportunities, uh, food security, and environmental sustainability, of course. Um, so this is some of the efforts that we have. We would like to um, have alignment. One of our pillars is have the alignment of Scopy with the government policy and program. And also the other uh, two pillars are uh, linear supply chain and price transparency. And uh, one more is the improved coffee productivity because um, in Indonesia, I haven't explained to you before, um, although we try to emphasize in the implementation of good agricultural practices, uh, but the coffee trees itself, they need replanting because most of the coffee trees are already um, older than 50 years old, while the coffee trees are uh, themselves uh, is most productive until 20 or 30 years of age. Okay, next. So we build partnership with the local governments to instill those um, GAP, good agricultural practices, in the form of national sustainability curriculum. So since five years ago, SCOPI has developed the what we call National Sustainability Curriculum for Robusta and Arabica Coffee, uh, which is uh, distributed by this master trainer. So I'm coming to the master trainer section. Master trainers are here are their field counselors and also the workers employee of the local government at the local level who disseminate the curriculum included in module. So the module itself does not belong to Scopy because Scopy is the facilitator and convener in um, developing it, but it belongs to the Ministry of Agriculture who, of Indonesia, who has been our partner ever since. Now, uh, up to date, we already uh, train uh, so from our program, we trained about uh, 190 master trainers, but now we have about 186 active master trainers, right, um, in 15 provinces. Uh, through these master trainers, they uh, have been assisting and providing training on the GAP, which is instilled in the NSC, to about 20 some uh, 23. 453 uh, farmers, where about 6,000 of them are female farmers. Okay, next. Now, this is just to uh, give you a depiction about uh, how the training has been done. It goes uh, from the seedling and then uh, choosing green beans in the pruning. And of course, there is training also in the post uh, harvest technique because. Uh, when you do the post uh, harvest technique differently, the quality of the coffee itself can be very different. Okay, next. All right, and um, in order to do that, so as you can see, our program goes from upstream of the supply chain of the coffee until downstream, right, with uh, the involvement with our partners and so on. We would like to have more community outreach uh, since this year because we would like to uh, be more aspired, not really 
inspiring uh, because from the training we try to inspire, inspire, but now we'd like to hear as well to capture what are our stakeholders are saying about the virtual coffee production productivity itself in Indonesia because we would like to um, see how this term sustainable coffee belong uh, can be belong to uh, public at large as well. And so we do like a community intervention through this uh, disco activity, coffee discussion activities, by um, featuring uh, certain teams that are about coffee sector that is uh, really of the interest of the public. And um, we are happy enough, even uh, in times like this in COVID-19 pandemic, last April, we managed to do, uh, we do a virtual disco and it was participated by about 140 participants yeah, from uh, all over Indonesia, which is, uh, the animal is there by the public. So we are happy to say it. And in the like Indonesian Trad Expo uh, event, it's like, uh, it's called TEI, Trad Expo Indonesia. We also hold um, Pasar Kopi, maybe you've, uh, familiar with the pasar term, right? Also in Malay. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's like a coffee market where the farmers who are assisted by our master trainers can uh, feature and showcase their coffee products to the uh, buyers and also the coffee lovers like you, Christy, in Jakarta. <laughs> so come, please come when we do hold such events. Okay, the next. Okay, so this is just to summarize what uh, I've uh, said earlier, um, just a bit, a quick number, about nine, uh, 190 master trainers, 15 provinces, uh, 23,000 uh, farmers, and 6,000 female farmers. But we would like to, uh, towards next year, we want to do more on the impact measurement because we would like to be more confident as well, Christy, when we claim that we have been training this kind of farmers, like, how are we going to outreach them? And um, is this really work and so on? So we need also a lot of support in um, like the monitoring and evaluation itself. It's like the measurement activity to really figure out how we can outreach these farmers and whether this training has been useful for them and improve their product uh, livelihood. Okay, next. Now, um, of course, because we are here, <laughs> I would like to just uh, present to you uh, some of our coffee products. Uh, we will have uh, a Q&A &A session. I think uh, one of my colleagues, the communication manager, Sweeney, have posted uh, or not. <laughs> uh, can you please uh, post it, Sweeney, later? Um, we have a Q&A session later at 2.30 uh, p.m. at uh, Jakarta time. It will be uh, 1.30 sorry, yeah, in uh, Singapore time, uh, we will uh, portray uh, coffee products from uh, our farmers and master trainers. So uh, we bring along like Arabica coffee. I know this is virtual. Yeah, unfortunately, you can taste it <laughs> too bad, but uh, we have a lot of pictures, so don't worry about that. So we bring along Arabica and Robusta coffee. So um, if you have more questions, uh, please do feel free to uh, come to our session later. Okay, next. So this is uh, just to portray, maybe for coffee lovers will know about this, like the difference between what a Robusta, there's cherry in the natural process, full wash, pea berry, and uh, so on. Okay, next. Yeah, these are the Arabica coffee. Okay, next, I think that, kind of wrap up my presentation right now. So I would like to give time if uh, any one of you have uh, questions. Mm, Me Tari. and my team also on board. Tidy, thank you. Yeah, you've got a couple that is, oh yeah, I can just like, I can smell the aroma from here. Uh, looks fantastic. There, we've got, Hendy's got a question for you and that is what techniques and technology do you use to educate your coffee farmers? Okay, so usually we would, we do like a direct training uh -huh. it does that explain um but the, the program itself the msc as i told you national sustainability curriculum it in, uh, involves a certain number of programmatic topics 
right? Uh, which is uh, they can choose uh, what they need, such as like fertilization, pruning, mm. um, post harvest technique. Um, building Rorak is like something like an irrigation system. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so on. It's very yeah. technical. Yeah, yeah, no. Yeah. So then, so his follow up question is, you know, what are some of the challenges, and then how do you overcome them? Yeah, I think one of the major challenges for us uh, and Scopy is, well, as a convener and enabler, also knowledge management is we need to be continuously uh, gathering people, um, also instilling the uh, the idea of the important sustainable coffee productivity itself in their mind, because right, right. somehow uh, for me itself, I don't come from a coffee background, but I come from like a social worker background, right. but I realize um, the coffee issue itself, maybe, maybe, I, um, this is just my assumption, can be uh, say it has been uh, for years belong to the coffee people. Yeah. Well, of course, I'm also a coffee lover, a consumer, yeah. but not many people know about the real situation. In Indonesia, they, we consume coffee every day, but we don't realize, oh, apparently the production is like, um, well, you can see it's alarming, but also uh, when we see a challenge, we can see it as an opportunity, right? It means, well, with the increase of consumption and also with the COVID-19 situation, I can see that there's actually a lot of potential still yeah. there yeah. for us to improve our coffee production. Yeah. And I'm surprisingly uh, have learned uh, through, uh, from this uh, few months during this pandemic that apparently our coffee farmers um, are still uh, productive. Uh, some mm. exports mm. have been like, uh, yeah, They've been doing really well in terms of yeah. like robusta coffee because yeah. it's a commercial grade. Yeah. Uh, and you can see in the headline news, uh, exports still um, can be made to Egypt, tripled, and so on because of the also the currency exchange. Uh, yeah. Yeah, mm. we, we, yeah. We might have some advantage with that, uh, but of course some players in the specialty grade uh, commercial uh sorry not commercial specialty and premium they might be impacted yeah okay. from yeah. because the hotel restaurant and cafe industry has been um mm. yeah it's quite severe mm. the impact mm. on the COVID itself so right. we cannot see that oh it uh the coffee itself will be like very damaging to all the coffee sector but okay which one and what are we going to do about it mm. um yeah i think now uh, the challenge can be focused more on how are we going to deal with this situation, um, not really in terms of oh how are we going to execute the program. Right. Um, okay. One of the thing which is very um, interesting from Indonesian uh, coffee farmers because uh, they also uh, have the polyculture in terms mm. of when they yeah do the planting and so on um, with having the intercropping uh it will increase their chance as well during this time this hard time mm. to um increase their livelihood from mm. other um like you know you can plant other commodities next to the coffee you know because coffee which is planned under the right uh tree canopy will mm. Be, mm. You know, have better quality mm. fruity taste and so on and you can plant uh, like ginger, yeah, you know, something mm, like right, that. Right, right, absolutely. Yeah, and you can yeah. sell the ginger mm. right now. Mm. Yeah, although yeah. Uh, the logistics might be problematic right now, but mm. I think many people are coping, and the farmers are still out there, right. not like us who is in the urban landscape. Right, right. But yeah. it's forcing all of us to think creatively, right? And yeah, exactly. to, to try some new ideas. So, oh, Tardy, thank you so much for sharing with us. Great presentation. And I know you've got your, uh, your session set up later. So anybody that's got questions can join you then. All right. Thank Wonderful. you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thanks. Um, all right. So next up, we're going to travel from Indonesia back to Malaysia. Um, and I think we've got Asli company um, getting queued up. And I think that's Jason that's going to be um, sharing about the handicrafts that, uh, that you are, that you are uh, selling from women in, is it Orang Asli in Malaysia, correct? Yep, that's right. So. All right, yeah. welcome. The, the platform, the, the, the platform, the floor is yours. 
Thank you very much, Christy, for hosting. So first off, my name is Jason from the, the company is called the Asli Co. Stands for Ora Asli Women. Uh, stands for Ora Asli, sorry. So um, yeah, let's move on to the next slide. Okay, so we, we are a social enterprise, not an NGO. And our whole mission, mission is to improve the lives of Ora Asli women in Malaysia. All right, so next slide, please. Uh, we'll come back to this one. We'll move to the next one first. So how we, how we started was, interestingly enough, we were volunteers with uh, Epic, Epic Homes. So we built houses for the Oransley, and through that, we built the relationship for many years, 10 years, in fact. Um, so it's, it's through these relationships that, uh, that allowed us to see firsthand, you know, the struggles that they were facing. You know, the houses were falling apart, roofs were leaking while they sleep at night. Uh, some of them were skipping meals, uh, children dropping out from, from school, from primary school even, uh, to, to help their parents go to work and earn, earn money. So beca because we noticed all these things, uh, we, we thought, you know, instead of building them just houses, we can also start impacting them economically. So we started bringing work to them. Uh, let's go back to the previous slide. Eh? Yeah. So what we noticed was uh, a lot of kids were dropping out of school. And in fact, this is statistics from uh, the star. 25% uh, actually drop out from school. This is just ORC children. And that's 84 times higher than the national dropout rate, which is just 0.29%. So our, our goal is to help the mothers earn an income to put their kids through school. Yeah. So how we do that is by creating, yeah, we go to the next slide. Uh, how next one we we'll go to so how we do that is we, we create uh, products we teach them how to make products from home so they can be sustainable they can earn on their own two feet you know and earn with dignity and these are the sustainable development goals that we, we target uh, no poverty decent work economic growth and responsible consumption and production that's because we you our first project we utilize uh, bubble tea cups uh, next slide please we utilize bubble tea cups to make, uh, to make handmade cement pots. So from that, we've uh, recycled, upcycled and recycled 2,000 plastic bubble tea cups. And through this one year, we've been in operations for one year. Uh, we've helped 10 mothers and four more in training. Actually, uh, five are in training right now, learning how to make, uh, how to make a handmade, sorry, how to make a reusable mask. Yeah, so my partner is in that training right now. So out of these uh, 10, for 10 mothers, uh, 50 individuals are impacted, 50 individuals around them impacted. So what we do is uh, we, we help these mothers, we pay them two to four times the average uh, hourly minimum wage. So that means they can work lesser hours, take care of their kids, send them to school, and get paid a decent salary per month. And it's safe to say 100% of uh, children working with them, uh, 100% of children of our mothers working with us right now are still attending school. Yeah, so these are just a few of our mothers. Uh, they all have uh, kids. That's Anissa and Ayu, the first ladies who started working with us. Uh, so something very interesting that we see is they, they are very, very enthusiastic working with us and they would tell their friends, their family, their cousins, and they would share their tools, the, uh, the equipment that we give to them. And, you know, they even share the, uh, the income that they gain from making these pots and soaps and even sanitizers. So it's something that we can learn from them as well. You know, their, their sharing mentality is of the next level. Um, okay, uh, next slide. Yeah, so these are how our handmade pots look like. They're made from cement and they're molded in bubble tea cups. Yeah, uh, next one. And these are handmade soaps. So they are fashioned like uh, Malaysian kuih. That's how we differentiate from other regular soaps. So we've uh, sold more than one, one ton of soap so far in one year. Actually, six months. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so our soaps, uh, what's special about them is uh, they're made from very... Uh, good materials, uh, sorry, good raw materials, no SLS, no parabens, uh, virgin coconut oil, castor oil, that's the main ingredients, and we use 100% peppermint oil, 100% uh, essential oil. Uh, next slide, please. So now during uh, COVID, uh, we 
actually stopped making uh, pots for now uh, and we shifted over to making hand sanitizers and we're teaching them to do masks. So hand sanitizers have been selling really well uh, since uh, before MCO we started. So we actually got about eight more mothers to work with us. Yeah. Uh, now they work from home instead of in a, in a day one. Yeah. So for sanitizers, I just want to put it out there that we can do uh, big bulk uh, purchases, big bulk orders of thousands, and we can also do white labeling. So you can put your company's uh, logo, your company's brand on the sanitizers itself. Yeah. So we have 50 ml, 500 ml, sprays, pumps, surface disinfectants, all sorts. Yeah. Okay, next slide. Okay, cool. That wraps it up. That's my five minutes. <laughs> Thank Zoom you, boom. Jason. That's great. Oh my gosh. I can, I can smell the, param the peppermint. I just, I have to say those, those soaps are the coolest ever. I, lo <laughs> I love you. the soap. So, I mean, I know you, I just have one quick question on the, the upcycling the bubble teacups. Yeah. Um, just that is really interesting because that is such a massive, massive industry um, and that's just so great. So can just, just one quick question and I know we're almost out of time, but can you just talk a little bit about where you got that idea and how you do that? Um, okay, so succulents were, was a hobby of mine and one day we just made a nice arrangement and people were like, oh, can I get one? Can I get one? So we were like, okay, let's go find some pots yeah. and we couldn't find cheap pots so we were like okay why don't we make them and you know we're pretty good with our hands so we started making them from cement and there came the brilliant idea hey why don't we have our Oransi friends make them and yep. then we got it for them yeah so that's how it came about that is great yeah. I, I love and, the creativity and the funny thing is we we had no idea that these bubble tea cups or even mcd and starbucks they were all thrown out none of them yeah. recycled yeah yeah. So we were like dumpster diving at the start and thankfully now we have a small partnership with, uh, with uh, Tea Life. So we do collect their cups. Cool, they watch cool. for us. Marvelous. <laughs> well done. Well done. I love it. So thank, thank you, you so right. much. So if anybody's got questions uh, for Jason and the Astley company, you can follow up later uh, and put those in the chat. Thanks, Jason. Yeah, I'll put up the chat. Thank you very and much. Please put your information. Me. Thanks. Okay, so I have the pleasure of turning the, uh, the floor now over to Melvin, um, who is our fearless leader, actually. And Melvin, you're going to take us um, into the next uh, group of social enterprise prizes, correct? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> wow, you know, we've got so many people just uh, staying on. You know, we started this from... Uh, uh, the morning, nine o'clock, all the way here. Thank you so much for uh, supporting this social enterprises. And uh, we're into our final segment. So uh, we want to welcome you. Uh, if you are just uh, kind of like logging in, you know, all this uh, is made possible because we have a collaboration with uh, PLUS from Indonesia. And uh, that stands for uh, Platform Usaha Social. And uh, they are our partners as well. So I want to welcome all of you here. Now, uh, this panel is made up of uh, four social enterprises and they are from like uh, four different nations, right? Singapore, Indonesia, Malaysia, and we have uh, Cambodia. So we're talking about really a good rep ASEAN representation, okay? Now, this is what we're going to do. Uh, this four we will uh, introduce them one at a time. The first one will be Ink Animation. Very interesting social enterprise that operates in uh, Cambodia. And uh, that will be followed by Soristic, uh, which is really an impact measurement. I think that's important because we talk about impact. We talk about uh, making you know, uh, changes and transformation, but how do you measure that? What, what do you, we look for, right? The third one has to do with uh, Dana Didik uh, in Indonesia that uh, really deals with uh, you know, empowerment, enablement of uh, scholarships and uh, help for those who need to go on study uh, for tertiary education, Dana Didik. And then finally, to wrap up, we have Sidling that deals with uh, seaweed. It's a seaweed technology, okay? So without uh, further ado, it's, I would like to bring them on, but it's so important for us, even though they share, but there's a lot more they can share. The only thing is that how do we uh, have time more than just the normal Q&A? I would uh, really encourage uh, these four enterprises 
to have their own what we call the Zoom room or their networking. Okay, they will post on so that you can actually visit them and have a dialogue with them if you are keen to uh, further explore how you can collaborate with them or support them. Please do so. Okay, and then the, uh, I think one other way you can do is that tap into our app. The TBN app features all the social enterprises that are uh, not just presenting here, but they are present in the TBN conference. We have 75 at least of social enterprises and you can use the app also for linking up. And I, I just want also to highlight that at the end of this session, we're going to have a wrap up, okay, where the whole TBN team will be featured and uh, to um, answer some of your questions and then to tell you where do we go from here. I think that's important because a conference does not end just like uh, today. All right, even though we have gone for a week, but it, it, it builds upon it. And so we've got things that are being built upon. We like to share that with you, all right? Without further ado, uh, let's welcome Justin uh, Stewart from uh, Cambodia. Actually, he's, uh, he's from Australia. Okay, over to you, Stewart. Hi, Melvin, how are you? Hi. Hi. Um, All right. Yes, I'm, current, I'm, 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 an, I'm an Australian. I've been living in Cambodia for the last uh, 10 years and I'm um, just currently back in Perth at the moment uh, you know, during COVID-19, so to be with my wife and, and two-year-old son uh, while our operations in Cambodia continue. Um, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about our studio. Um, Ink Animation in Cambodia is a 2D animation studio. We provide outsourcing services to um, North American and European uh, animation studios. Um, I've lived in Cambodia for 10 years. So although Ink Animation started in April 2019, there was another company previous to that, which is now an IP holding company, which was really my proof of concept where we wrote a, an animation curriculum, a fine arts curriculum. We trained um, youth at risk or marginalized youth with no skills uh, into employment on a feature film which was Cambodia's first co-production with France, Belgium and Luxembourg. And that went on to win um, like the major award at Annecy, which is like the Oscars for animation. When I um, started Inc. in 2019, it was really to scale up aggressively. So within one month, we scaled up to over 50 staff. And you can see some of the IP on the slide at the moment. So we have been working over the last 10 months um, on uh, Warner Brothers Animaniacs, Star Wars, um, a Netflix series, a DreamWorks TV series. And a big achievement for us actually was working on the, the Netflix film Klaus, which was Oscar nominated. So having credits on an Oscar nominated film um, just kind of uh, builds to the credibility of our, our training program and the impact that we can have. We, we are a for-profit social enterprise, and um, I strongly believe in, in, in the potential um, of you know, job creation to alleviate poverty. And that's why we're in Cambodia. That's why my wife, my teenager, and my two-year-old have lived there for the past 10 years. Um, is really, I had been visiting um, Cambodia on volunteer trips. My wife is a teacher, and she wrote the curriculum for our studio. But the impact, um, the, po the poverty I saw there really um, challenged me and the businesses I was running in Australia. And we effectively um, packed our suit suitcases and moved to Cambodia to live and, and try and make a difference um, in this kind of area. So job creation in, in industries that young people want to work in. So um, we are targeting largely unskilled um, staff who come into our studio and we train them internally. Um, there is a global boom in animation and a shortage of artists globally. There are traditional outsourcing uh, locations like South Korea, India and the Philippines, and we believe we can compete. We have very strong market credibility. We are a low cost emerging market and we have a very high quality um, of like internally developed skill sets um, where we use our fine arts curriculum paired with software certification to train people very quickly. Um, so yep, yeah, next slide, please. Um, again, significant um, like kind of production credits in our first 10 to 11 months of operation and a letter of intent from one of the biggest um, studios in, um, in the US to, to scale. So currently at 50 staff, we, we have uh, immediate demand to scale to over 300 staff. 
that's the scope of work that we can secure from one of our clients, but we have several clients um, looking for us to, to provide the services that we provide because of our reputation and the quality of our work. Um, next slide, please. So some of, um, I guess, you know, the, the, those three points reiterise, and I, no point talking about the low cost emerging market. We know that that's, Cambodia has a, a strong GDP growth every year. There is a large uh, demographic of youth, so we, we, want to, we want to create jobs that young people want to work in. It's one of the first things we do, and animation is a fun and, and creative industry to be a part of. Our model is replicable. We want to take it into the provinces and really have impact in, in the provincial areas of Cambodia. And we actually think uh, replicable in other countries through cloud-based work solutions um, into Laos, Myanmar, and other developing countries globally and have a really large uh, outsourcing studio that actually creates impact in people's lives. So obviously we are a social um, enterprise and um, just some of the numbers in this social impact slide over here is that 84% of our team that we recruited in April of 2019 um, were internally developed without any formal training in animation. Our animators are on average 24 years old and we have over 30, about 34, 35% of female and we have a target of hitting 50% gender parity uh, within our studios. But the fact that we, when I say we had 84% um, without any internally trained, the remaining um, uh, staff that we had recruited into the studio, maybe they had used Photoshop once. We really do not have a labor pool to draw from in Cambodia. We are creating a new industry. We are training internally. It's, it's, very, um, it's a vocational training model. We, in it, we choose character and we teach skills and we provide the salaries and we upskill while we are working on actual projects. Um, next slide, please. So you can see here, just a, I mean, not maybe ideal for this scenario of presentation, but we do have a, a tailored curriculum that my wife wrote. It's ESL based, outcome based, and it takes our, 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 young, our young staff members or, or artists through fine arts training into software certification. When we bring a team onto a project, you can see the graph displayed below, we had a 40% increase uh, in productivity across the course of a project. Um, and that's just how we train from low skill to high skill animation, and that's how we in increase our profitability. We start with uh, low billable service lines, and then we, we train in studio, and we create high billable service lines effectively at scale. It's a low volume, it's, sorry, it's a, it's a low cost, high volume business model. Next slide, please. And just uh, actually, I will just mention that we do with our education model, although it's an internal studio training program, we've identified that we'd like to separate that to be a, a creative arts um, uh, school, an academy of arts in Cambodia that would feed our studio model. But that's a that's a second round kind of a pitch. So a little bit of background on animation. It is a $270 billion industry. It's growing every year. Um, particularly during the pandemic when most of us are at home watching Netflix or Hulu or Amazon Prime, Disney Plus. Um, animation has not really been impacted uh, via COVID. All the major studios uh, went straight to a work from home model. That was difficult for me to do in Cambodia because of the nature of our, our, our staff where they come, their homes. I mean, they're from poor backgrounds, poor areas, and it wasn't feasible to do a work from home model. Um, with um, with the protect with while while protecting our clients' IP, so COVID nineteen has presented some challenges for us as we were scaling. Um, but in general, the industry is booming, and our clients are waiting to give us more work. We have instant demand now um, to scale, and we're looking to scale aggressively mid September. So we certainly haven't stopped um, during COVID nineteen. We're we are in production now. Next slide, please. Just a little bit of background about Titmouse, but they are one of the largest studios in the US uh, based in uh, LA, uh, Burbank now, New York and um, Vancouver. It's one of our client studios. So for example, if we do five series in one year with 50 staff, uh, Titmouse alone have probably 25 series a year that we may be able to service with 300 staff. So that's just one client only. So we see a lot of um, growth potential in scale up to provide the services, not only for Titmouse, but for Cake Entertainment UK, um, Flying Bark, which is part of the Studio 100 group, they have all seen the, the attention we um, put on our work and the quality of our work, and they, and they love the impact. They want to work with us because we're not the usual BPO business model. We are a social enterprise business, uh, BPO kind of outsourcing model. Um, next slide, please. 
why Cambodia? Um, there's a long story to that, but I basically I was impacted on that trip and I moved my whole family there and with three suitcases and, and that's where we've lived for 10 years. But I really do believe that developing countries are an untapped uh, human resource. We have, Cambodia has young people in villages, they may not have finished high school, they don't have degrees, all they are lacking uh, are, are an opportunity. They just need an opportunity. We choose character, teach skills. If they want to work in animation, it doesn't matter if they can't draw, it doesn't matter if they don't, have never used a computer before, we will hire them and teach them in studio. And that's what we've been doing for the last 10 years. Um, over 90% of animation is outsourced to Asia from North America. Um, so we know that we can compete with the Philippines, India, um, and you know other traditional outsourcing countries and, and compete aggressively on price point and create impact at the same time. And that comes to our purpose slide. We are basically, the only reason that we do what we do is to create jobs and to give our artists economic um, stability and strength and, and be able to lift those families out of poverty. And we partner a lot with NGOs because we want to make sure that the recruits that we're pulling into our studio are coming from those uh, marginalised backgrounds and that we can create that impact. So we have very strong NGO partnerships and internship partnerships overseas. Uh, next slide, please. So again, just following the UN SDGs, um, sustainable development goals, no poverty, quality education, gender equality, um, and decent work and economic growth. We want our, our staff to love the work that they do, and, and they do, they love work. Um, they don't want to leave, which is a good thing. So um, next slide, please. Oh, we can, uh, that's okay. This is just a HR slide, and maybe just skip through to the next one, um, because I can wrap up now. Uh, next slide. All of these slides are available on the um, TBNA app. We have a studio overview, we have an introduction letter, which is where we're seeking some uh, debt financing to help us through COVID. And we also have a, our first social media impact report. Um, but we can slide through onto the next slide, please, just through to the, through to the final slide, just to see some of our team. Um, and the next slide. And that will be my contact details. Uh, best to contact me, uh, Melbourne, through my email, justin at incanimation.com and or through the TBNA app. Um, that would be great. So that's uh, pretty much what I've been doing for the last 10 years in Cambodia. Yeah, thank you so much, Justin. I think it's quite exciting. Uh, it's, uh, it's different, all right? And yeah. it's good to hear uh, from a work in Indonesia because we referred a lot of work that is in uh, Singapore, Malaysia, uh, as well as Indonesia. All right, there's some questions that are posted. I suppose yep. some of this, this question you probably have answered somewhat, but uh, let, let me pose it again. How do you select which Cambodians to join your training program, especially sure. if they have no prior background? Well, it's, it's fair to say that uh, we don't, we'd have zero um, human resource pool to draw from in Cambodia. There are simply no animators, no animation schools. So we are very much um, having to train internally to get to this level of skill sets and um, providing these services overseas. Most other outsourcing locations do have education facilities to, to draw graduates from. We don't. We have intern relationships with um, Swedish design schools and I'm, I'm building a relationship now in Perth with an with a animation school to try and have internship models. They actually fly into Cambodia and work with our, with our artists. But um, effectively, recruitment is basically, again, it's choose character, teach skills. If the young person is, is interested in animation, has always wanted to work in a creative industry, but never thought it was possible to do so, that's all they have to express to me for me to hire them and put them on the job at a low skill level and they're paid a salary and then they're trained up internally through the course of the project uh, into higher building service lines. And so we are vocationally training on the job and then we have our fine arts curriculum, which is an after hours uh, online curriculum. Um, and then we do additional, um, you know, take a half Saturday off to do drawing classes, et cetera. And we just keep developing our staff. We invest in them, invest in their development with software accreditation, et cetera. And in terms of making sure we do have NGO partnerships so that we're recruiting from areas that we know are areas um, of, of poverty, basically, uh, and people where the, where the young people are marginalised or at risk, we have strong NGO partnerships to make sure that that, that framework of recruitment is there. Um, so we have MOUs with NGOs to, to recruit. So they might take kids from primary school through to high school, 
and then we can take them straight into our studio um, as staff and train them internally into into careers in animation. Yeah, yeah. So actually, there's a there's a great great potential to have someone uh, partnering in terms of running an academy or, or training school or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. We we basically have the educational framework and the software partnerships to launch an education um, facility external to the studio, which would become a feeder to the studio, a feeding program in terms of recruitment HR. Um, and that's certainly been on my you know heart for the last ten years. Is you, you you have to have the education model with the with the actual for profit business model. We have to. I don't want to train into unemployment. So I don't want to start the school first and charge people to come to the school and then have right. no jobs for them in Cambodia. We went the opposite. We just started the business. We employ people. We built our credibility internationally uh, as a studio working on award-winning films and TV series. And that reputation now will carry us through to the launching of the education model. Um, and again, that, that requires probably pretty significant capital to launch that, but huge potential in Cambodia. Yeah, okay. All right, thank you. Now, two quick questions. Yep. Uh, one is, do your clients pay market rates for your services below? Uh, do they treat you differently as a social enterprise? In other words, that's a <laughs> pity or compassionate kind of angle. Uh, I think that's where I, it is. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, actually, we, don't, we do not have a website at the moment. So I have no sales and marketing spend. I have no uh, positioning in the market other than my credibility through work delivered. And reputation on, on that on that work and my client relationships I've formed over the last ten years from that work. So our clients treat us as a we are a for profit. I always position myself to clients as a studio Absolutely. that is the best in the world and what we do. And um, yeah, look, it, it comes out that the social enterprise is is why I do what we do because often the question is asked why Cambodia, and I tell them the story. And they get excited about that because too often they outsource to locations where it's a little bit exploitive. So the first thing in the client's mind is the work has to be there. Uh, and I will not deliver, you know, I, I don't sell them on the social impact. I sell them on the quality of our work. And so right. we are the best at what we do and the best at what we do and the services that we offer. And the upside to the client is that, and, and our market rates are comparable. So, you know, we're not undercutting other outsourcing locations significantly. We know the price points and we, we rely on the quality of our work and delivery on time. They are the two main priorities for me to my client is the quality of our work is international standard and it's delivered on time so that our client studios don't incur penalties from Netflix and HBO, et cetera. And that's really yeah, important. That's great. One last question is, uh, yep. uh, what do you pay your animator? What kind of salary uh, average? <laughs> that's, a, that's a good question. I mean, like uh, in Cambodia, the minimum wage is $185 per month US. And that is set by the garment sector. And we have consistently, in animation in 2019, our salaries of unskilled staff started at 300 US, went to four, five, six, and 800 US per month. Um, so we were creating significant salary, you know, economic impact in their lives just uh, when they weren't really skilled to receive that kind of a salary. So we would start unskilled staff at 300, which is you know, two times the minimum wage. Um, now, as we scale, we have to look at other ways to supplement that with our NGO partnerships. And during COVID, actually, we've been able to form an, a, an agreement with an NGO to remove all of our fixed overheads, office, lease, uh, you know, electricity, internet spend by working with their recruits to train into animation. So. You know, you have to be creative during a, a crisis like this to one, keep production going, which we have, but two, look at ways, I'm looking at ways to reduce costs and fixed overheads. And for me, cloud-based uh, work solutions are the answer and giving yeah. artists more empowerment with an online learning platform. They can learn online as they increase their skills at their pace, their salaries go up incrementally. So it's really, I wanna, I wanna pair the online learning platform with their career development um, and, and their, and their salary increases. So, right. Okay. One last question. That's, yep. Sorry. Go ahead. No, we're considered a high, a high salary uh, payer in Cambodia. One of the reasons for that is that there is no withhold. The companies pay the withholding tax on salaries to the government and uh, most, and if any salary below 300 does not incur salary tax. So most of the private sector try to stay at, at 300 or below. We don't, we don't look at those kind of scenarios. We want to make sure we're, we're paying livable wages for our teams here. Yeah, I, I, that's what this question is from me. Okay, in yeah. one sentence, if, if I ask you, what is your ask 
in terms of uh, your platform? What would you say? Yep, it's it's one hundred and forty five thousand dollars <laughs> right now. <laughs> okay, <laughs> because okay. It, it, so that's on the TBN uh, app, our letter of introduction, where I have All a right. request, and that's a that's a COVID nineteen specific request because we have been impacted by the pandemic, um, but we have a demand for work starting mid September. And so that that request is for debt financing to make sure we sustain through operations. Um, but we were we were doing a capital raise. We were in the midst of a capital raise as COVID hit and all investment talks ceased. And we were requesting a, a three million uh, at the time, which we've since dropped to two million to scale up to three hundred staff over three years. So yes, all my right, immediate ask right. is one hundred and forty-five. We'll keep our team going, and three million would would blow okay. us out of the water. We'll remember that. And, and that's what's the important thing because we want to sustain social enterprises during this time so that they can survive and then thrive. That's the, that's the theme yeah. of it. Thank you so sustain much, Justin. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for the time. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Let Appreciate me bring, uh, thank you. Let me bring on to, uh, Pauline from Soristic. Okay, Pauline, over to you. Yeah. Thanks, Melvin. And thanks everyone for staying around. It has been a long day, I think. <laughs> yeah. So Soristic is a social enterprise. We were formed in 2015. So our purpose is to support poverty elevation and reduction of inequalities in uh, communities in ASEAN through research. So we enable businesses, nonprofits, and communities to achieve higher impact work through our core focus work, which is in uh, social sector research, um, uh, impact monitoring and evaluation, CSR consultancy and capacity building. So currently, um, some of the uh, social sector research that we are doing includes the impact of COVID-19 on young children and uh, early childhood development in Asia Pacific. And we are also working with uh, British Council and RACE uh, to do the research on the landscape of uh, social enterprise in Singapore uh, and also specifically on um, the landscape of social finance in Singapore. Yeah. So in terms of uh, impact monitoring and evaluation, which is really one of, which is really our core work, uh, we do a lot of uh, evaluation for charities as well as corporates. So for example, right now, we are in the midst of a three years uh, evaluation program for two charities on their, uh, uh, on their programs for youth at risk. Yeah. And then we are also working with some corporates to help them to come up with a social outcome to kids so that their grantees can use it to measure um, uh, outcomes. So um, we also do capacity building. So we have workshop on effective giving like this, uh, give wisely, select great charities and make your philanthropy meaningful and impactful. So these are for um, individual philanthropies as well as uh, CSR professionals. Then we also have workshops on um, um, storytelling for the impact of your CSR program, as well as uh, workshops related to uh, social, social outcome evaluation. Um, and then next slides, please. So beside um, the, our core work, which is in research and impact evaluation, um, this is another work that we do on our own and actually it's really based on our own resources. So we also do a lot of advocacy. So since we started, we have been creating a series of sharing sessions to raise awareness among public on social issues and challenges in ASEAN. So it's all related to the SDGs, um, um, the 17 uh, Sustainable Development Goals. And um, we try to bring socially conscious individuals together to learn about these social issues, um, as well as to brainstorm innovative uh, solutions. A lot of times through this, um, we provide the platform for emerging organizations um, to, to um, share what they have been doing to the socially conscious individuals. Um, next slide, please. So this has been uh, some of our Social Connect series. So since we started, um, initially, it was like rural healthcare, peace reconciliation, and then we do like economic opportunities for refugees. And uh, our, our latest um, series um, just a few days ago was on where basic needs are not met in Singapore. So this will bring in a few uh, charities that has been working in this area to provide them a platform to share about their work, as well as we also provide some of our research from our interns and volunteers. So through all these um, sharing sessions, we actually managed to connect many um, volunteers, potential volunteers to all these charities, as well as potential funders to all these uh, charities. Yeah. 
so um so this has been our uh, in 2019 so this this is like um what we have done so we through our social connect talks we have uh, 230 participants and then we did capacity building for 81 uh, individuals and we have consulting project for uh, seven organizations so um a lot of our projects are very uh, resource intensive because when we do uh, our impact evaluations, it is very customized. So we have to talk to the charities like to learn about their, um, their operational cap uh, ca uh, capacity so that we can customize the data collections that we can do for them. Yeah, so um, next slide, please. So uh, generally, um, the kind of help we are looking at is to get connections to corporates and philanthropies. We are looking for social sector research CSR support or philanthropic giving support. Because uh, in the past, um, our clients are through referrals or returning clients. And also we meet our uh, potential clients through uh, networking sessions in conferences. And um, since COVID-19 and actually since the start of this year, there haven't been much conferences. So we haven't been able to meet so many corporates uh, to, you know, to uh, come up with, I mean, to line up our potential projects for the for for this uh for the end of this year as well as for next year and then we also are looking for uh, mentoring in terms of business development to advise us on how to make um our advocacy work sustainable so currently um the advocacy work which just now i i, I shared with you all which is the social connect series so this is really based on our own resources so we are trying to see how we can make this uh, sustainable while trying to do advocacy on social issues that touristic is interested in and another area that we are looking for support is also to help us to um, link up with co uh, organizations in ASEAN that might be looking for work uh, in this area. Yeah. So yeah, that's all for my presentation. It's a quite a short presentation. Uh, any questions that y'all have? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Pauline. Appreciate that. Um, there, there aren't any questions as yet, but uh, let me just uh, um, ask a question of you. So, in a sense, Sorisic is more an NGO. It's, uh, it's uh, not so much a social enterprise. Or, or do you plan to uh, head towards sustainability? Uh, so, Sorisic is actually a social enterprise. So, we're not looking for funding at the moment. It's just that um, uh, we, we do get paid projects through our uh, core work which is impact evaluation so actually um currently our clients are like foundations um like also like um a community foundation of singapore they hire us as well as corporates they hire us to do uh, impact evaluations on their grantees yeah so so we have been sustainable through this way and our research work has been like um our clients include like british council and and usa uh, yeah yeah. So it's just our advocacy work, which is uh, mm -hmm. what we are doing on our own, which is not sustainable because that is based on our own resources. And we have been doing quite a bit of advocacy work over the years as well. Yeah. That's great. Okay, thank you very much, Pauline. But one of the things that uh, I would want to advise the uh, attendees is that please connect with Pauline. And uh, Pauline, you can actually do your own network uh, gathering. Okay, you can send your email to the chat and then you can post your Zoom as well. Uh, I suggest you do it after 3.30 because uh, that's where the what whole conference ends up. Then yeah. the other thing that uh, I suggest that you would do and also for the uh, attendees is that go into the TBN app because in the app, you can actually connect with uh, uh, all the social enterprises and that's great uh, for networking. All right. Thank you sure. so much, uh, Pauline, Thank for you. taking Thanks time to share with us. Yeah. And uh, right now, we have uh, moving from Singapore, we go to Indonesia. So we have Depot from uh, Dana Didik to share with us uh, the platform. It's, it's a great platform of uh, uh, empowerment, especially in, in the area of uh, education. Okay. So hand over to you the time, Depot. Thanks, Melvin. Thanks, Melvin. Appreciate it. Uh, make, can I go to the next slide, please? So hi everyone, I'm Deepo from Dana Didik, uh, the CEO and the co-founder. Uh, and what we are, uh, we're practically peer-to-peer uh, -peer lending uh, for student loans uh, for underprivileged students in Indonesia. Um, uh, right now we have a strong focus in healthcare students uh, and that includes nurses, midwives, doctors, uh, even before COVID-19, uh, but especially now 
now more. Um, and uh, I think Melvin mentioned that we're a scholarship provider before. Uh, I just want to correct that. That's actually not true. Uh, we were planning to become a scholarship pro platform at the beginning. Uh, but as we were learning, we realized, oh, it's not sustainable, it's hard to grow, and it's, it's, it kind of limits us on, on how many people we can impact. Uh, and our mission has been always been impacting as many people as possible, uh, especially in terms of income. Um, so this platform was actually uh, set up by me and my co-founder, uh, who were, we were both having problems, uh, sorry, my co-founder was having problems with paying for his higher education, right? Uh, in college, he was always, like, every semester was like, oh, can I pay next semester? Oh, can I pay next semester? So it's always this, this scare, uh, he, he's always scared of like being dropped out because he couldn't pay. Um, my mom had a difficulty paying for her education. So this is something that is quite real for us. And when we launched our platform, we realized, hey, there's a lot of people that have this same issue and, and let's do something about it. So if I could go to the next slide. So as I mentioned, we, we started in 2015 and we're quite focused in healthcare since last year. Uh, almost 70% of our portfolio are for healthcare students. Uh, we work with uh, international, local and international lenders. I think some of the big names include Johnson & Johnson. Um, with Johnson & Johnson, we've actually set up a nursing fund uh, for Indonesian students. Uh, and the fund is dedicated for nurses. Uh, and it's, it's a very cool program. I'll probably talk about it later. And the, um, anybody can join that if they're a nurse. And there's, uh, we structure it in a way that we can forgive the loans uh, if the student works in, in any remote area in Indonesia. Just to go to the next slide. Um, we're registered with uh, OJK, the Financial Service Authority in Indonesia, um, the Menkomia for the, the techno Technology Minister, uh, the Higher Education Minister. Uh, and so uh, we have all of that checked off settled. Next. And so maybe just to give a context, I'm not sure if a lot of people are aware, but in Indonesia, going to higher education is truly uh, a privilege. Um, there's a research by USAID that says actually 19 million youth in Indonesia do not attend higher education. Um, and the biggest reason of that is because of financial. And for those who are in school, actually a lot of them do borrow money. So this is a, quite a real problem in Indonesia. Um, the dropout rate is, is at all levels, right? So from elementary to middle school, middle school to high school, high school to higher education. But still, uh, higher education is truly a luxury for, for most people. Um, and next slide. Um, so even the president, uh, he, what he did actually, he asked Indonesian president, he asked uh, a lot of the traditional banks, uh, one of the largest banks and the state owned banks in Indonesia to issue student loan. Uh, but even for them, it was quite difficult. So right now the, the student loan market is quite new and it's run mainly by FinTech like, like us. Um, next. And so um, I just want to clarify this at Danadiri. So we really believe in vocational study, even when we started back in 2015. And the whole idea is that we really believe that, oh, um, uh, vocational studies can really get you a job. It may not give you the best job, right? Uh, but you will get a job right after. And so what we, what we focus on in, in Danadiri is we really focus on blue collar jobs, right? And because of that, that's why we do a lot of nurses. And so even before COVID-19 uh, this year, Indonesia already is already lacking capacity, uh, especially for nurses, doctors, and, and uh, the technicians. Um, and it's a problem even before COVID-19. Now with COVID-19, we expect more, more uh, need towards uh, especially nurse. So, so we're quite bullish going forward. Next slide. Um, and this is just a, a quick brief report from WHO. I think it's more talking about globally, but um, the, and I, I, I'm pretty sure a lot of countries are having the same issue, but like the, the frontliners, right? The nurses, the midwives, the doctors, uh, they're, they're in high risk right now, especially in this current situation. And I think uh, this will be a global problem, right? The whole nursing lacking. Uh, we've already seen some countries, right? Uh, already needing nurses from overseas. Next. And so this is just a bit about us and what we do. As I mentioned, we do a lot of healthcare students. Um, we, we basically fund students uh, that are in college, uh, but we also fund students that are, uh, sorry, not students, but basically uh, working nurses or working healthcare professionals that need additional certification or training. Uh, for example, in Indonesia, if you graduate from a nursing school, um, it, it, it's, it's limited what you can do. So you need to take, always take additional uh, training and also additional certification to be able to do certain type of jobs. 
Next slide. Next. Next. Um, next slide, maybe. Next, sorry. It's a lot of detail. So I think I just want to talk about this quite briefly. Uh, this is a fund that we did together with Johnson and Johnson earlier this year. Um, and the whole idea, again, uh, it's not a scholarship model. It is a student loan. Uh, it is, it is a, a, a cheaper student loan. Uh, and the whole idea is that uh, we, one of the problems that Johnson & Johnson saw in Indonesia is that uh, Indonesia was lacking healthcare professionals, especially nurses, uh, and especially even more nurses that is working in rural areas. And so we designed this program and basically anybody could apply for this loan. Uh, the loan is actually priced at market rate, uh, slightly below market rate, slightly cheaper. But uh, if one of the nurse works in a remote area or rural area for uh, six, for, sorry, between three to six months, then the loan can be forgiven, right? So they don't have to pay the loan. Um, and I think uh, this is really good considering a lot of the nurses in Indonesia are, are blue collar type, right? So they are from mid to low family. Um, so this really helps them kind of upskill their, their skills. Uh, it helps them as well um, in terms of they, they're getting a job and all of that. Next slide. And so I think just since it's an impact investing, so apart from our regular business KPI, we do track some social KPI as well. And here are some of the three things that we track. Uh, first of all, obviously uh, we have a high majority for female borrowers. Uh, and that's because really we fund nurses, to tell the truth. Um, and, and we have some doctors, but the nurses is our biggest part. And there's a lot of male nurses, don't get me wrong, but <laughs> there's, a lot of, there's a lot more female nurses in Indonesia. Um, one thing that we really care is about income, right? Um, and so well, we, we track two things, right? So we track how many of them are first in their family to enter college, right? For us, that's actually a very important KPI. Um, and the whole idea is uh, someone, in their, someone in the family goes to college for the first time, uh, he, his or her income will increase. And if his or her income will increase, the whole family income will increase. And that is our bottom line. And, and our data shows that 73% are first in family to attend college. And if it's actually a, a older uh, brother or sister, usually the younger brother or sister would go to college well. And so the way we look at this, this is something uh, we, we believe that it's quite a systematic way to break poverty, right? So that's why this key for us is quite simple. I think it's quite in line with TBN as well, that it's all about increasing income, uh, moving the, the, the lower class to middle class, right? It's really along those lines. Um, another KPI that I didn't put here uh, is actually when the student applies, we ask for the parent's income. And when they graduate, uh, we usually do a survey and what's their income. And we've seen income increase between like two to maybe up to three and a half times for a lot of students. So when they, when they graduate, we've seen students' income increase by two to three, three and a half times uh, more compared to their parents. And I think that's important, right? Um, to show what, what we're doing. Next slide. Uh, this is just the team. Uh, we're uh, funded by Guardian Impact and also Plug and Play Indonesia. Next. Um, next. Uh, maybe I'll just kind of wrap up with this, just a short, quick uh, case studies, because we have so many of these case studies. So this is Karizon. Uh, Karizon is from a part of Sumatra, right? And uh, he was working, he was studying in, in Jakarta, actually, uh, for, for an additional, like an operation certification. Um, and I think being from middle class, like you do have to work when you're in school, right? So Karizan was actually working as a parking attendant in one of the, near like one of the train stations in, in, in Depot. Um, and I think he was having, you know, nearing his last kind of final semester, he was having a lot of problems just kind of, because Indonesia has a specific, sorry, I'm kind of jumping around, but, um, Indonesia has quite a specific uh, tuition structure, right? So there's a big entrance fee when you enter school and there's a lower semester fee. But when you're about to graduate, there's all these extra expenses. And for a lot of the healthcare students, these are certifications, right? And so he was having problems with certification, uh, paying for his certification. So we lent him a loan. It was a small loan, right? It was only 10 million rupiah or $700. Uh, and because of that, right, now, now he's graduating. He's actually working as an operating nurse. And, you know, as I mentioned before, in this case, right, we've seen his income increase by almost two times. So I think that's it. Just going to wrap up my presentation, Melvin. Thank you, Dipo. Yeah. Oh, okay. We have a question here. 
Can you talk about term loans, uh, your percentage? What is the average loan amount a graduate will owe and how long does it take for them to pay it off if they don't go to the rural areas? Sure, so I think for us specifically, right, um, our loan average is roughly 10 million or $700, right? Uh, now we're doing more and more like nursing certification. So that could go up to 2000 or $3,000. The tenor is about two years, right? Uh, the tenor of the loan. Uh, so that gives them plenty of time uh, uh, to repay. And in terms of the, I think there was, uh, you, when you say percentage, is that the, the interest? Um, I think so. Yeah, so I think, so we have, in Dynadidic, we actually have two products, right? We have the commercial lending product and the non-so commercial ones. So our rate is between 0.8% per month to 2% per, uh, the 2% is like slightly below the market, especially for a longer tenor. But the 0.8% is really cheap. Uh, you wouldn't find that uh, anywhere in Indonesia, okay. that kind of pricing. Yeah. And the reason yeah. we could do that, right, is uh, so I, I kind of skip that part. So some what we've done a lot is actually, we've actually converted scholarships into soft student loans, right? Because at the end, what is the borrowing cost, right? The borrowing cost is just really the source of fund, right? Whatever the, the investor or the lender in the platform and our platform fee. Right. Mm. And so we've had uh, lenders who are like, oh, we don't need a lot of return. Right. We only need whatever. And then we just added our platform fee. And that's why we could we could have that like 0.8 percent per month. Uh, there is nowhere near that in the market in terms of. Price. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So. Yeah. Thank you. Um, all right. Uh, you know, you have got Johnson Johnson who comes in as partner um, and then health care because of all this uh, COVID-19, uh, the issues of health and, uh, you know, the medical stuff is really very important. So I think it's so much potential. Um, let me just ask you one question. That's from me. Okay. In one sentence, if you have asked, what would that be? So uh, before COVID-19, we were trying to raise uh, equity. Uh, obviously, I think our platform, unfortunately, does not allow lending, uh, borrowing money. Uh, just because of the regulatory requirement. Uh, before we were trying to raise two million, but now we've kind of lowered down to one million for equity. Um, I think, uh, so that's one side, um, but also we're always open if there's any um, uh, foundation or CSR that, that, that has that scholarship, right? And they kind of want to convert it to student loans. I think the problem with scholarship, it's you always have to fundraise every year. It will never become sustainable, right? And, and at the, the problem, right, the scholarship, it will never solve the issue. Right, scholarship at maximum they can only do like three or four percent of the need. That's right. So you know, I'm more than happy, and we've done like the various structures as I mentioned before, right? With Johnson and Johnson, we've done, we've done like a endowment fund type with a, with the university, right? And they used to do scholarship, but now they do a cheap student loan. Um, so we're more than happy to discuss if anyone. And I'll post my my contact details and feel free to email or WhatsApp me. And you know, on the app, you can contact me as well. Yes, thank you so much, Tipo. I really appreciate you taking time uh, despite your busyness. So uh, we we'll want to thank uh, Deepo for that. Uh, so if you want to stay connected with him, go to the app and then also look at the chat where uh, he may start a, a, a networking group or a Q&A time with you, all right, after this. All right, thank you. And uh, hi, everybody. Last but not least, but uh, the one who kind of like uh, end up this uh, panel is a seaweed company called Sidling from uh, Sabah. And it's interesting, some of you may have heard his presentation, but let's put our hands together and welcome Simon Davis. Simon, over uh, to you. Thank you very much, Melvin. Uh, hi, my name's Simon um, and I'm, uh, I run Seedling. We're a seaweed biotechnology company. Um, and before I start talking more about what we're doing, I just want to run through a few statistics for you. Uh, could you go to the next slide, please? So 80% of the world's fish stocks are currently fully exploited or overexploited. Uh, right now in the ocean, there was a crisis. <laughs> and uh, next slide, please. The interesting thing is that 97% of the world's fishermen live in developing countries. 
This means that right now there is hundreds of millions of people whose livelihoods are in a precarious position and not just their livelihoods, it's also the food that they bring home to their families. Next slide, please. At the same time, we need to increase the world food production by more than 70% within 30 years. You know, how are we going to do that? Where are we going to find it? Um, next slide, please. Now, here's the interesting thing. The ocean covers 72% of this Earth's surface, and we don't use it for anything except fishing and dumping. This is a real opportunity. Could you uh, finish the slides, please, and go to the video? Um, so, why seaweed? Um, seaweed is a perfect solution um, for, first of all, it creates great, healthy, nutritious food. Secondly, it, uh, it's fantastic for creating jobs in, uh, in poor communities. It's very easy for people to adopt and particularly taking fishermen and giving them new skills and very easy for them to start. Uh, lastly, uh, seaweed is fantastic for reviving marine environments. It gives habitat for fish. It, de um, it takes carbon out of the atmosphere and it deacidifies the ocean as well. Uh, seaweed is, su is supportive of the SDG goal 14 and it's a booming industry. You know, there's, it's more than a $6 billion industry right now. So the seaweed industry has so many benefits, both for the people working in it, the consumers using the products, but also the planet. So it's a perfect triple bottom line industry. Um, and that's why I got involved in it. You know, I, I said, okay, how can we take this industry, which is decent, you know, it's $6 billion now, and how can we increase it a hundred times? How can we bring benefit, you know, all across the world by making new products out of seaweed? You know, how can we turn the ocean into a landscape for agriculture? You know, where we grow multiple different species of seaweed and make multiple different products. And at the same time, take hundreds of millions of people who are now fishing, but soon they won't have any employment and reskill them into a new industry where they can still work with the ocean, which they know so well for generations, and they can still have livelihood for them and their families for the future. And at the same time, rebuild marine ecosystems. So the mission of seedling is to create abundance on this planet, both for the people and also the planet, by the restorative farming of the ocean using seaweed. And at Seedling, we've got very, uh, we've, we're very bold. Um, our objective is that by 2030, we'll be producing more than a million tons of seaweed a year. We'll be rising at more than 100,000 farmers out of poverty, and we'll be reviving 100 square kilometers of ocean space. So we've got a lot of work to do. Um, I started Seedling a bit over a year ago. Um, I hired a team of young researchers um, from biotechnology and marine biology. I hired uh, one of the world's leading biotechnology experts in seaweed. Um, I leased laboratory space from one of Malaysia's you know, top uh, biotechnology universities. And I put together a board of experts from biotechnology, from agriculture, and from oceanography. So we've got a really, really um, high skilled team. And for a year now, we've been working flat out. And I'm really, really proud of, of what we've created. You know, the team's worked really hard. We started off with a species of seaweed called Capophycus. And this is the main species that's grown in countries like Indonesia and Philippines and Tanzania. And we chose it because, you know, it's grown in poor countries, but also there was the greatest opportunity for us to improve it. No one had done any work on improving the growth or disease resistance of this crop. And you know, this was like agriculture was 100 years ago. Uh, using our technology, we can produce seedlings which grow significantly faster and are more disease resistant than what the farmers currently use now. We also develop products to, so that we can open up this seaweed into new big markets. This particular species of seaweed only was used for one product, food thickening additives. And, you know, it was a decent industry, but we are looking to push seaweed products into multiple uh, markets so we can really, you know, get opportunities to generate larger revenue. Uh, we've developed an animal feed um, supplement, which boosts growth and immune, um, immune strength of animals. And we've developed a liquid uh, plant stimulant, uh, a fertilizer. And uh, we do this by working closely with the farmers. 
we use a contract farming model where we work with communities that we know really, really closely, supply them the seedlings, give them a guaranteed buyback of the harvest at the end, and then turn that into products. We are the first in the world to do this by the full cycle. And by doing this, this gives us a distinct advantage over all of our competitors because we can control the quality of our product, the supply, have a price advantage, and also we can guarantee the provenance of our raw materials. This makes us completely unique. And this is just the beginning. Uh, this year, we'll also be starting developing an aquaculture feed supplement made from seaweed. Uh, we're gonna be starting developing ingredients for a seaweed bioplastics company. And we'll also be working with a species of seaweed called asparagopsis, which reduces methane emissions in cows by 98%. We've just been granted more than $140,000 in grants from the UK government, and we've been given a $50,000 um, research contract also. So our research team is really, really solid. You know, we've got a bright future ahead of us for the research side. Um, I funded this company entirely myself from the beginning. Uh, and I did this because, well, first of all, it was a great business opportunity. Um, but really deep down, this is because I, I had to, you know, I'd seen you know, firsthand what was happening in poor communities around the world who rely on the ocean for their livelihoods. And I knew what was happening down the line. And the reality was so much worse than the statistics. So I had no choice, but I had to stand up and, uh, and create this in the world. So it's been, you know, it's been a real tough slog, but it's been an absolute privilege. And now it's a really exciting time because now we're ready to start production and commercialize that technology. We're raising 800,000 US dollars via a convertible note to start production. And this will bring us to break even point in the second year and more than $2 million a year in revenues by the third year. So this is an opportunity both to have a huge impact on communities, a huge impact on the environment, but really this is a great business opportunity as well. I'm looking for investors who've got beyond just the cash, um, skills to and abilities and connections that can add and support us strategically. We need the best people behind us if we're gonna have all the impact that we're aiming for. So I'm looking for people who've got connections in agriculture, in aquaculture, or in fertilizer companies. Um, and I'm also looking for introductions. If anyone here can introduce me to large pet food companies like Mars or Purina, to large fertilizer companies, or to large animal feed companies, I'd really appreciate it. So please reach out to me afterwards. Um, I'd just like to finish on the thought that, um, you know, this time of COVID over the last couple of months has really, you know, created a huge impact on everyone in the world. And more than ever, we can see how this whole world is interlinked and how quickly things can change. I'd like to invite everyone to join us to work together to create solutions that are not only great businesses, but are beneficial for the people, for the communities, and also the planet. Thank you. Hi, thank you, Simon. <laughs> you, have, uh, you have a presentation yesterday that was uh, much fuller. Um, okay, so we got to put you into uh, kind of like a 15 minute thing. Yeah, um, I, I wanted to give some chances for people to interact a bit more and, uh, and have a conversation and, um, and uh, answer a few questions from the audience, if that's okay. Yes, I, let me give an opportunity. Is there anyone who wants to ask a question, actually right now, you can just pose it uh, onto the Q&A chat. Of course, uh, Simon can actually gather uh, all who are interested into a, a network meeting with him. So that's actually a much more interactive thing after this whole uh, session is over. I think that's, that's actually very key. Or you actually can go into the TBN app as well at the same time, you know, because there's a lot of uh, interaction that you can connect and uh, that will help because I think that uh, we all need one another. Okay, the funders, the social enterprises, the foundations, the uh, uh, individuals who can offer what we call time, talent and treasure together with it. All right. Now, let me see. Okay, that's one the question here. Simon, can you share some high level figures on estimated profitability of the seaweed products? 
yeah, high sure. level figures. <laughs> oh, yeah, know. yeah. Like if you want more detailed things, then you know, probably um, it's better that we, you know, link up with that particular individual and we speak on it one on one. But with just on on gross margins on our uh, seaweed fertilizer, it's got a margin of seventy three percent. Um, and on the oh. fermented pet feed additive, it's 45% from memory, definitely more than 40%. Um, but if you want specifics, I can share that, you know, one-on-one -on -one with anyone who's yeah. interested. So we've got really healthy margins on these things. Um, so, you know, the, the, the point with this is, you know, I'm building a great business, you know, this is going to be extremely profitable, um, but true. I'm doing it in the right way that, you know, we're going to, we're going to, we're having the, both the intention <laughs> and the measuring of our environmental and social impact. Right, right. Actually, I mean, Sabah is there. Indonesia has got super, super, super long coastlines, you know. Oh, <laughs> so it's massive. Yeah. yeah, absolutely massive. So we're starting in Sabah now. And the only reason I, I chose Malaysia to start is because the technology was so much better. I could get better um, laboratory facilities and, um, and really, you know, scale a lot faster with the technology. But where we're going to scale production is going to be Indonesia and the Philippines and also Tanzania. Um, one of the grants we've been awarded is uh, with Cargill to start working with their farmers in Tanzania, um, and which will start as soon as this travel lockdown is lifted. Yeah, um, that's right. So, you know, so our technology <laughs> hub is going to be Malaysia, but this is going to be, you know, a solution that can be rolled out in any tropical um, developing country. That's right. That's right. Okay. And uh, one or two more questions. Is the lockdown over in Sabah? Uh, how are the sea farmers affected uh, at this present time? Yeah, the lockdown has been partially lifted, but <clears> it's going it, to officially, um, it's going to lift on the 6th of June. But we're, we're, um, it's partially lifted now and we're going back <coughs> to full operations next week. We've been in partial operations for the last two months. So the great thing is, you know, we've, we haven't lost anything. Um, which is a relief, um, but we'll be fully operational next week. In terms of the seaweed farmers, you know, these guys just keep going. You know, they've got to do it to to get food. You know, they're not going to stop. Right. That's right. Um, That's right. So they're absolutely still been continuing. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, uh, especially for those that are you know lower economic level, that lockdown really has impacted them amplified you know okay yeah. one more That's question actually, actually melvin yeah. if i could you know jump in with this the an interesting um, consequence of the lockdown here in saba is that a lot of coastal people were previously involved in tourism and that's <clears throat> you know crashed now and oh, will yeah. be continually to be low for the next year or two and i've already heard from one of the uh, national parks like an ngo that works there is the incidence of bomb fishing has increased significantly in the last two months. Wow. So since people can't work in, in, uh, in tourism anymore, they've gone back to dynamite fishing. <laughs> wow. And that's, that's really non-eco. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, oh, it's just, it's just an absolute disaster. Um, but you know, I, I don't blame them. They've got to feed their families. Right, um, right. And you know, this will happen more and more as we are just emptying the ocean as a resource. People right. will continue to do worse and worse and illegal things unless we give them alternative that is beneficial. Right, right. Okay, one more question. Have your products reached the markets yet or are they still in development stage? Uh, we've just finished development and we're ready to send them out to market. So we've already got expressions of interest um, from buyers and customers. And yeah. we're, um, we're in the process now of sending out samples to get orders. That's right. Well, I, I really think that uh, seedling is a very, very prospective and potential one. That's why you know, Simon is actually part of our uh, TBN's social entrepreneurship training hub cohort, you know. So we're building relationships at the same time as uh, getting him to be investment ready. Uh, there's a question that's being asked, uh, how do we connect Simon? Well, uh, maybe this is uh, someone who's just tuned in. Uh, the great thing is you can link up both on the uh, TBN app, but at the same time, uh, Simon, I think you will post on... Uh, I would the chat, all right, how to connect. And uh, maybe people who are interested can get it together with you over a Zoom call. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, straight after this, I'll, I'll host a Zoom call. Um, so everyone's welcome to join. I'll post the link up on the chat here. And you can also go to the app and I've posted the link 
on the app as well. So please come and join. Otherwise, just send me a, uh, an email or a WhatsApp message and I'd love to speak to anyone anytime. Look, I've you know, got so much to share with this. Anyone who's listening right. is welcome to come and visit us in Saba. I'd love to show you around the exciting stuff we're doing. That's right. I, I think this is really a, a time, a call to action because uh, you know, we attend seminars, we attend conferences and so on. And then after that, we've, we have so many good stuff and then we, we don't do anything about it. I think this is a call for action, uh, whether it is something that uh, he needs in terms of expertise, connecting to the markets or investment. Uh, you're all welcome. That's, that's the whole idea. Thank you so much, Simon. Thank you for uh, you coming and share. We, we hope that uh, our partnership together would really bear fruits, isn't it? Thank you so much, Melvin. My, it's been wonderful being part of the Seth uh, cohort. Um, you know, we've had so much support from TBN and the Seth team. Um, it's been incredibly beneficial. And um, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, you, you're welcome. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for uh, coming. Right now, what's happening is that uh, we are gathering our whole TBN team together. All right. Uh, both the board as well as the pillar heads. Now remember, TBN has got five pillars, all right? The conference is one. The social entrepreneurship training hub is another one. Investors club is another one. And then we have one that is called expertise network that brings together all the experts like the coaches that deals with, uh, uh, you know, the life of the entrepreneur. We bring in what we call the business mentors or industry mentors, as well as specialists like the IT, the supply chain people, the logistics, uh, the law, the accounting, and so on and so forth. So that's really key. Now, uh, we are waiting actually for the room two to come over. They, they are, I think, about finishing. But I thought that uh, it's good for us to start connecting. Um, I see that some of our TVN uh, heads are here already. So I'd like to get them to share a little bit with you. All right. And the question is like that. How do we go from here? Okay. Where do we go from here? And it, that's key. Okay. So uh, let me see. We have got Wayne who is with us. We have got Christy who is with us. Uh, I think, I think a few others I, I couldn't see all. Now, it's so important that uh, you take, we take this time. We'll just probably take about 20 minutes or so of your remaining time. And then you can have a great weekend uh, dreaming about TBN, all right? And uh, what you're going to do from here. But uh, I want to remind you that um, go into our uh, uh, Google feedback form. We really treasure your feedback. I think that's very important because uh, uh, this is not just a once-off conference. You know, this is our fifth year and we want to continue on building upon it. All right. Uh, let me see. Why don't I get Wayne uh, up on speed? Wayne, uh, can I hand the mic over to you? Okay. Wayne uh, is actually our social entrepreneurship training hub lead. So he takes care of the pillar and uh, he has a great bonding with all our social entrepreneurship training hub uh, cohorts all right great guy wayne thank you melvin well welcome once again everyone and uh, thank you for staying back so late i hope you guys had all had fun i thought we will just uh, wait a little bit for the folks in the other room to come on board because uh, we wouldn't want them to miss out on the the special information uh, but i thought i'll give you keep you guys entertained a little bit to just give you a little bit of the behind the scenes uh, glimpse of what has been happening. Okay, so today is a little bit surreal for me because it's the first day where I'm actually not a panelist or I'm not a host. I, I'm just a spectator, right? And to be honest, I'm just very blown away by the quality of all the pictures that's go ongoing. In fact, we were just texting each other in the background to say, where on earth do we get all these social enterprises? enterprises from even we were surprised some of them from partner networks some of them sign up on their own we were just really blown away and uh it's, it's something really funny to share with you guys quite a few of us actually had some fear of missing out 
So we actually have two devices running in parallel. And then again, we are texting each other to say, oh, this pitch is good. So we'll switch over to one room. Oh, that pitch is good too. And then we'll switch to the other room. So one of the colleagues was actually just uh, joking and to say that I feel like I'm watching two Korean dramas at the same time. So my head is like exploding, right? So I, I just jokingly texted back. I say, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do something like that to myself. I'm just like all good Korean dramas. I'm going to watch the rerun so I can enjoy it um, at the comfort of my own couch whenever I want to. So just to assure everyone that the sessions are recorded. So don't worry if you feel like you have missed out on a couple of uh, sessions, um, we will make the recording available so that you can review and rewatch at your comfort. Yes, so a, a few more things that uh, kind of happened in the background. Uh, we were actually amazed by the responses. We actually thought that we were done as of Tuesday when we started. Uh, we had 36 confirmed. We were very happy. All the schedule is up. Everything taped up, done, right? But the requests kept coming in. So we were like, okay, I guess we can fit in another two more. I guess we could fit in another three more. And the next thing we knew as of yesterday evening, we had 50. So all of a sudden, the team, while everyone has gone back and had your dinner, the team was coming together, scrambling desperately to say, how do we find time to fit in another 14 more social enterprises? Well, that one was quite a bit of a challenge. Uh, but we said, we will press on, we will make it happen. And happen it did. On the surface, I guess you guys uh, would think that everything it looks okay. Uh, but on the background, it was really a circus act. I mean, we had two Zoom rooms running in parallel and we had another two more for the dry run, right? So you can imagine the, the amount of coordination is absolutely insane. So we want to really take this opportunity just to thank all our volunteers in the background, those who are, who are uh, acting as the uh, Zoom techs. Uh, just a big round of applause. You won't believe it. Each two of the room running, rooms running in parallel had at least five each. Just to make sure the slides were properly queued, the next moderator is coming on, the next speaker is ready. All of that is just absolutely amazing. Uh, on the surface, you might think that, ah, yeah, that, there could be a little bit of hiccups here and there, but uh, generally, I don't think anything too major that you have seen, right? But trust me, on the background, everything was like a huge frenzy, but somehow, this team of 10 people kept everything together. So we really just want to thank all our Zoom techs and all our volunteers who have helped to make this happen. Speaking of moderators, uh, you, may have, you may have thought that this panel was done by a, a list of professional moderators, but I'm here to surprise you once again. They are none other than our very own board members. So we actually put all eight of our board members to work. Um, and they, they rotated amongst themselves to make sure that they, they were able to take different segments. And we thought it's an excellent opportunity for us to introduce all the TVN Asia's board members as well. So a round of applause as well to our moderators and our, and our board members. Okay, just a couple of things to note while we are waiting for the rest of the folks from the other room to come in. We have actually opened up the chat so if you want to leave any comments, any words of encouragement, please do. Uh, I think we will appreciate it definitely. And if you have anything, you just any thoughts, right? You just want to, because this is the opportunity for you guys to share. Uh, and we will take a look at that in a, in, a, in a while. Tiff, is there anything you wanted to say or share? Hi. Um, I think that maybe I can um, uh, share a little bit about uh, the conferences. So just an introduction, I'm Tiffany, I'm the lead for the conference pillar. And uh, TPN Asia has actually been organizing conferences, seminars and member dialogues in Jakarta, Indonesia, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia and Singapore since 2016. That's four years ago. This is actually how we were able to grow our network. And it's from all these conferences out came the five pillars. So this is our fifth conference and we invite you to join us for the next one in 2021. Um, if you see a feedback form link sent there, please let us know some improvements uh, that we can uh, work towards for the next conference. 
also we have an amazing team of volunteers as Wayne mentioned and uh, every year we pull off huge events and uh, most of the work uh, are done by the volunteers. So even this particular virtual conference, a good portion of the logistics was done by volunteers. So if you think that you can be part of our team or you want to volunteer for next year, um, please come on board um, to support us and you can email me at events at tbn.asia. Yeah, thank you. All right, as you can see that uh, I actually have a uh, a champagne bottle behind just to celebrate all the good work that the, uh, the team has done. That's the only reason why my virtual background is off. Uh, so I want to just give a round of applause to the entire team for putting everything together once again. Yay! Now that's the only thing I miss of not being in the actual conference, physical conference. Right? I cannot hear the applause and the cheers from the crowd. Okay, um, while we're waiting for the rest of the guys to hop on, uh, just thought that it's good for, for us to do a couple of uh, reminders. Uh, LJ, if you can flash some of the slides. Uh, number one, well, if you still want to connect with the social enterprises, you may. We invite you to again connect with them via the app. Again, there's still the exhibition panel over there, the exhibition button right in the middle where you can tap or tap into any of the social enterprises profile and always remember that you need to tap on the button that says visit exhibitor booth because if you don't do that you don't get to see their posts you don't get to see their content their photos or any information additional information they want to share with you okay so remember to tap on not just the social enterprise profile but scroll all the way to the bottom and tap on visit exhibitor booth well, the conference may be coming to an end, but we have two more immediate follow-up sessions if you're interested to find out. One would be next Tuesday. Uh, you have heard us mention quite a fair bit on the Social Enterprise Training Hub, uh, and maybe you're curious to find out what exactly that is all about. Well, it is a investment readiness program at high potential social enterprises. So we, have, we are just in the midst of wrapping up cohort one. You have seen quite a few of them actually presenting either through the pictures or as panelists in this whole conference. And I'm sure you will agree with me that they are really high potential social enterprises. Now, if you fall under one of that category, you think that, hey, I think I'm that. I think I would like to learn more. Um, please join us next Tuesday, 5 to 6 p.m. Singapore time. Uh, just to note, we will share with you a little bit about what we have done so far and we are also open to doing some co-creation because with COVID-19, we fully understand that the way we are going to do our program moving forward could be very different. So we are always very open to feedback and information from you guys and we will, we can, it might be a, something that we can work on together and we can say, if you are part of our cohort too, how would you like the program to be like? So that is exactly what we are doing next Tuesday. So do join us. Immediately after Tuesday will be Wednesday and we will be sharing about an, the expertise network. Again, it's a follow-up session. Uh, we believe that uh, you might be, have been inspired to learn more about what this, how you can contribute to social impact regardless of what is your profession. So we invite you to join us. You can be a lawyer, uh, an accountant, a marketer, a salesperson, and we believe you have some way of contributing to social impact as well. Um, we, have, we always have positions open to be business mentors, specialist advisors, and coaches for the social enterprises. But we, TBN Asia, also need lots of help. So as you can see, as what you have heard from all the team, this whole conference was made possible by our army, our small army of volunteers. So do join us. Um, this yeah. session will be led by Christy. It will happen next Wednesday, 5 to 6 p.m. Singapore time. Uh, we will be circulating the Zoom links, so watch out for it on your emails. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Wayne. I thought that maybe uh, while the other team is migrating over, the other room is migrating over, maybe it's good for us to start introducing the board members. All right, uh, so that uh, 
the uh, attendees would, would know who they are. Well, by the way, okay, my name is Melvin. I'm Melvin Mark, I'm uh, the current chairman of TBN Asia. All right, uh, I, I spent actually quite a number of years in the issue of uh, community services. Okay, and I, I, I want to really help people uh, that are struggling through. But I also realize deep in my heart, how do you leave the poor out of poverty, not just in Singapore, but Southeast Asia. That's why Southeast Asia becomes actually the focus uh, and the focal point of TBN Asia. And uh, so that platform of TBN Asia just come into the picture and I've, I've journeyed so much, learning so much, so much needs that are around us. So this is just an attempt for us to link everybody up. But a team that is uh, with us here, a fantastic team. So I just want to give them an opportunity just to introduce themselves uh, and share why are they involved with TBN, all right? Um, I just look at this, um, okay, the gallery. So maybe we have uh, Christy first because she's just next to me, okay, in the gallery. So Christy, if you can unmute it and uh, you can share. Okay. So actually the first thing, thank you, Melvin. The first thing I thought actually, my name is Christy Davis. Um, I, am, I have a privilege to be on the board, but the first thing I thought when Wayne was talking about the uh, army of volunteers and especially the, the 10 Zoom techs, okay, that were running around in the back all day. And you know why there were 10? Is it precisely because it was us guys that were in the front trying to moderate and figure out the technology. Without them, trust me, some of us would definitely have been lost. Um, so I really, really am so appreciative to everybody that was running around in the background um, that was making sure that we um, looked like we knew what we were doing up front. So thank you so much. Um, why am I involved in TV in Asia? Um, currently, I'm the director of uh, the Lian Center for Social Innovation at Singapore Management University, um, uh, which is um, amazing. Obviously, I love social innovation. I love the idea of, of just working alongside communities and people to in creative ways and, and to, to generate solutions that improve everybody's lives, improves our societies, uh, improves our world. Um, but I came upon, I came to know TV in Asia through a former role. I spent some time in a World Vision and Asia P3 Hub, which was an incubation hub for partnerships across the private, public, and social sectors. And that's when I got to know uh, the TBN Asia crowd and kind of fell in love with them. And what did I fall in love with? Well, there was two key things. Uh, the first was the, the vision for impact, um, working with just this, this amazing, uh, there's a very diverse ecosystem around TB in Asia. Um, and it's, it's across all of the sectors. So there's government people and there's business people, multinationals, there's the entrepreneurs, of course, uh, both um, normal entrepreneurs, small businesses, as well as the purpose-driven social entrepreneurs. And of course, there's the social sector. Uh, community-based organizations, uh, NGOs, uh, the UN, and others. And I started to see how there was just so much energy across that ecosystem and the, it, the people that were leading and, and working with TBN Asia, uh, there was such a, a quality of, of just a generosity of spirit and integrity that was really attractive to me. So I, I thought I would love to, to be more uh, involved with this group. Um, I think the other reason I'm in love with TB in Asia, um, and my husband knows this, so it's okay, um, is that our values are very aligned. Um, there's a generosity of spirit, um, the spirit of collaboration. There's none of this, that's your job, I'm not going to help out. It's, it's the opposite. Everybody's like putting their hands up to help. Um, and that's not just with each other, that's just with, with the, whole, the, the whole network of everyone that we're working with or serving. Um, there's mutual respect. It doesn't matter if you're a CEO um, or, you know, if, if, if uh, you're someone that's working at the community level um, in partnership with, with refugee women. Um, there's this amazing mutual respect regardless of who you are, where you are, what your title might be, or where you're from. Uh, and so I, I love that. Um, there's, there's a value of, for equity. Um, where everyone is valued for their different strengths and the, and the resources and the talents that they bring. Um, and so I just think by, by being able to harness 
those, those strengths and networks and, pool, and, and look at how we can bring them together and, and pool those resources. We create a multiplier effect and we start to see so many lives changed. And, and that is, in a nutshell, that is why I'm <laughs> loving TB in Asia and why I'm really proud to be part of this amazing team, Melvin. Thank you. Yeah, we can give you a webinar and, uh, you know. <laughs> you can pay <laughs> me later. It's okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, okay. I tell you what. Uh, uh, let me just go to all the board members first. But I, I, can I have a request that everybody uh, puts on their video? You know, it's really great to see a face and not just a name, right? Uh, would you mind uh, the Zoom tech people? Yeah, thank you so much. LJ, uh, Kim, David, Pei and all this because you're so precious to us it's great and uh okay the next one that is uh on my panel okay looking at the gallery is jeremy han hello jeremy han okay one minute to go and talk about yourself all right okay thanks pastor melvin so thank you but uh, before i share i just want to thank the team uh that's been putting in so much effort and pulling us from all directions right for the wednesday meeting <laughs> and now you know this is the fruit of it you know, and we're seeing all the people thanking the team and all that is really to your credit so thank you team and thank you volunteers okay so my name is jeremy so why am i in tvn um so what i do is i i coach ceos actually i, I work with teams on how to scale their businesses and i think the key thing that really um got me as a founding member um some years back with uh melvin and the team with mason melvin james so we had few meetings back then it's really this whole idea that we spend so much of our time i was you know investing in our time in in the marketplace right in our careers and building businesses and all that and where what's is there going to be something more than just building our careers building our businesses right what's this whole thing about being give uh not being um given this set of skills talents and gifts that we can do for something that's far bigger far larger than just ourselves and that's really about the whole idea that you know what we do in the marketplace can actually have a impact if we were to use the same set of skills that we have for a different purpose right and if you look at it it's really not that different actually because these social enterprises they need what we have and i think that's just where we can multiply the very skills and talents the effects of the skills and talents that we have been given right and that's really to to contribute to the social enterprises to build them up so that they really uh, eradicate poverty through enterprise right and i think this whole thing about sustaining growth because one of the things that i work with companies a lot is really not just growing but sustaining growth right? it's harder to sustain growth sometimes but really if they want to eradicate poverty on the long term and be successful and really take everybody in the community up a higher level, then these businesses must grow. These social enterprises must grow, right? So what better way to contribute our skills than to join TBN and use the skills that we have uh, to help these social enterprises to grow and to scale their impact. So that's why I'm in TBN and really thankful for the journey and seeing how we have grown over the years. Uh, the RecTech team gets bigger and bigger and really scaling TBN up as well. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Wow, scale up coach, okay. And then we have uh, Steven. All right, Steven, can you introduce yourself? Uh, you are mute, you're on mute, yes. Steven. Yes, yes. Well, hi everyone. Uh, you know, really thank you for the uh, op team. In fact, the entire you know, team that's working uh, front and back, and I know some of them working you know, last whole week, and, uh, and 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 just dedicated to the whole event and and, and bear in mind these are all volunteers committed uh, pro bono basis and uh, they'll be paid in heaven i guess and uh, wow. <laughs> you know why we do that uh, we get all the volunteers because we want to keep all the uh, fees to the minimum expenses so that all the fees conference fees and all that go towards uh, uh, helping the social enterprise and that's very important to us uh, so that you know all the fees that you you gave and and it's really uh, all back to the uh, social enterprise uh, who ends be beneficiary are really the poor and so although the conference may be soon over but the donations are not over yet and we yeah. <laughs> you to you know uh, contribute uh, more 
And then if you've got more, more to spend, you can always talk to Alex T, who is our uh, Resilient <laughs> Fund uh, program uh, lead. And he certainly uh, needs a lot of uh, help uh, because uh, we're talking about a pandemic here. So a lot of uh, social enterprise are really in crisis. So uh, my name is Stephen, and I, I have the privilege to serve on this board. And uh, my journey actually started in 2017 after my retirement. And uh, I got uh, fortunate to benefit from uh, one of the best companies I worked for. And with, uh, you know, attrition rate of less than 1% and profitable for the last 35 years. You know, you might be wonder why do I just quit and, and retire? Uh, I guess it's, uh, my wife and I always often say, you know, we are kind of like sometimes itchy backside, you know. And, uh, but anyway, uh, we, we, we just thought that maybe we want to do something, uh, you know, uh, uh, in our final lap, you know, of our life. So immediately after the retirement, we travel around Southeast Asia and uh, visited Philippines, uh, Gawa Kalinga, and see how their wonderful work in, in uh, housing uh, for the poor and visit Vietnam. That's how I get to know Tohe, you know, how the wonderful work they have done for the children and, and for the uh, disadvantaged people. And also in Myanmar and in Indonesia and, and in Batam and all that. And then we come to Batam, right? It's really close to Singapore and close to our heart. And you know, Batam is a really a, a migrant city and 75% of their people are, are migrated from other provinces in, in Indonesia. And, 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 and that's why I'm very, uh, encouraged right, to, to see so many social enterprises uh, really uh, uh, creating jobs using their innovations and in rural area community because uh, that's very important to me because uh, that would slow down or mitigate some of the migration issue because one of the problem is that uh, when they don't have job they don't have income where do they go you know they go to a city to find job and if they cannot find a job what do they do they end up in squatters <coughs> And, and in, in housing problem and all that. So I really appreciate those uh, innovative solution, right? In farming, in uh, such as Duanam, you know, right at the florist area and creating uh, uh, valuable products that they can uh, support their income. So that's how I, uh, I came to learn about, you know, all this issue and I joined 3 d I think in 2017 or 18. And I, but I didn't know that the task is so big, right? And uh, and we ended up with the words called collaboration because uh, we just can't do that, that solve the problem uh, in, in, in this 650 million uh, uh, Southeast Asia, which one third of them probably in, in uh, poverty and all that. So that's how my journey. So I, I want to just thank you for uh, all the participants. So please uh, pour your money in or pour your time and treasure or, or you know, or talents. Eh? Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. You know, these guys are all so passionate, you know, so passionate. So one minute like that becomes like that. <laughs> okay. Let's, let's tighten it up a bit. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, over to you, Mason. Are you on mute? Hi, Hi everyone. Um, I'll make it short and sweet. Um, before I embark on this social impact investing journey, um, I was actually a professional accountant by training. Um, so I've experienced what today young people call quarter life crisis and midlife crisis. Um, that I begin to realize that, you know, as a professional mm. accountant by training and a job, uh, why am I not finding purpose in my life? And it is actually through my encounter to, uh, with uh, Kim Bong, who is a coach uh, by training. He helped to enlighten up my uh, thinking and help me to discover my purpose. I realized that my passion in life is to help to make other people's dreams come true. So combining the skills, the strengths, and my life experience, uh, you know, I boldly took the step to embark into this so-called unknown social impact investing together with uh, Dr. Kim Tan. Um, in fact, um, you know, it is by his mentorship that I'm able to see a bigger picture of more than, more than just a, a marketplace play a work, but it is more helping how to use business enterprises to tackle 
uh, social injustices issues like poverty, income inequality, uh, how to help to lift people up, the marginalized group of people. Um, so far, I've been doing this uh, food impact investing for the past eight years full time. And I can tell you, uh, there's no regret. Um, in fact, you know, like I said, this is my probably uh, second crisis uh, since I embarked on this journey. This so-called pandemic has actually reaffirmed uh, my, uh, that what I'm doing is the right thing to do. Although doing the right thing can be the most difficult thing to do. But, you know, I have no regret. So, but again, I want to thank you all the volunteers, people who have journeyed with me. Um, you know, when I say hard, it's not just difficult. It is really a lot of, need a lot of passion, need a lot of um, faith uh, in, in what we are doing. And, but our reward is when we see people got a chance, their life being transformed and really being part of the community. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. And then we have uh, Tim. Tim, you're on mute. Yes, yep. hi. Hi, everybody. Um, sorry, I don't know if I can keep it to one minute. There's too many things to, to say. <laughs> but um, yeah, you know, it's amazing. I'm looking at the 70 over people who are still hanging on with us. And I really thank you for doing that. You know, people that you're looking at have worked so hard and I really thank them as well. Um, as, a, as a board director in TBN, um, I've been around for five years. And uh, at the same time when, when TBN started, um, we also started uh, my social uh, enterprise, affordable, affordable Abodes, doing low cost housing. Um, it's been a tough journey. You know, I remember in 2016, we were scrambling like mad, harvesting kanaf and processing and producing bricks and building a house. And we did it within a few weeks. It was crazy. But that's exactly what TBN is all about. You know, with a bunch of crazy people getting the job done, you know. Um, I love, you know, being part of the workshop today um, in Agrotech, you know, the, the seven panelists, they're still chatting on, on, the, on the WhatsApp chat until now, you know. And that's exactly what we're trying to achieve, right? Networking, exchanging skills, knowledge, helping each other, in order to, to support this, these, uh, these uh, social enterprises, we, we as TBN need to step it up. So after this conference, you know, we're, we're going to continue on with, with the various programs that we have. Just stick on with us. Don't, if you need help, shout. You know, we're here to help you. Um, that's, that's why we exist, because uh, the social enterprises need to do what they do in order to help the poor. So that's, um, right. did I exceed a minute? Well, <laughs> you can, you can well <laughs> yeah, it's about three minutes. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tim. Uh, we have James and then after that, uh, we end up with Kim Pong. Right. Hi, uh, everybody. Uh, very quickly, in, uh, re in 30 seconds, uh, I'm James. Uh, I'm part of a board team. I came on board uh, Six six years ago, uh, invited by Mason, uh, who's uh, you know who's also heading up Garden Impact. So I, you know, how I came up upon this uh, TBN journey and all that is, uh, well, I was exposed to all this only after I came on board. <laughs> you know, as a, a board member, I'm also the treasurer for TBN <laughs> for the last six years. So it's opened up my eyes to all the needs uh, around this uh, social enterprise space. So much needs uh, all around whole ecosystem so so i've come to realize that we are not i'm not here uh like what they say we're not here on this earth to to consume and uh, breathe air and uh, occupy space so i think we're all here and uh, you can see from the volunteers uh, all around in this for this conference that we want to do good all right so yeah so i in the day job i'm uh, working in a real estate uh, developer and a real estate uh, investor uh, company um so i'm helping out uh, alex in the as part of a committee uh, for the re resilience uh, program. So uh, happy to help and uh, contribute my very small part. All right, thank you. Thank you, James. And uh, finally, Kim Pong. You're on mute, Kim Pong. Yes, yeah. I am. 
Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Kim Pong. And, uh, you know, I, together with um, Mason and uh, Melvin, um, you know, years ago, uh, I got forced by them, you know, to, to co-start <laughs> and co-found TVN Asia. Um, little did I know what this thing would become, uh, but I'm just so glad to be in the journey here. Um, the, and, and one of the things, I just want to share this, right? One of the things that I, uh, I'm beginning to step up and do a little bit more in, in TBN Asia is to really create a coaching practice um, uh, within TBN Asia. You know, you often hear us talking about doing good and doing well, uh, that we are caring not just for the enterprises, but we're also caring for the entrepreneurs. Um, so, you know, essentially, you know, I think this is the thing that's really driving me. Um, I, I keep telling my two friends here, you know, you guys go out there, you know, you go into the lalang, the kanaf fields, you know, the rice paddies and you get your, your, your feet dirty, right? You know, whereas I'll get, you know, myself dirty, you know, trying to mess around with the lives of people here. So that's what I do. Um, so for those of you out there, you know, if you are a coach, you know, if you are looking for a place to say, look, you know, I do not know how to serve these guys here. I'm not interested in serving children. I have no idea on canaf planting. I have no ideas on, you know, you know, building houses, you know, but I love people. Well, hey, check me out, right? I would love to talk to you. Uh, I would love to connect with you because we need more coaches to come in, you know, and begin to impact the very people that's changing uh, the face of the earth here. So thank you very much. Back to you, Melvin. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, you know, this is a great thing. If everybody can uh, show your faces, pay, and then we have David, show your faces. Now, uh, you know, we have uh, five pillars, right? So win being the, uh, the lead for Seth as uh, shared and Tiffany being the lead for conference as shared. Then I, I want to introduce to you when, okay? She's our lead for uh, the uh, Investors Club. And then we have another one that is Alex who is the lead for the uh, Resilience Program. Just, just take a minute to share, okay? Before we can uh, take a, a great photograph here together. Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm sure you're sick of seeing my face all week. Um, my oh, I'd love to. <laughs> I went and um, yeah, I started volunteering at TBN when I actually moved uh, country. So it was a, I've only been on board since like February and it's actually the first organization I reached out to to just volunteer my time. And here we are a full conference later and um, just even the privilege of leading up the Investors Club. Um, really interested to see what's ahead. Uh, we've had a lot of inquiries about people wanting to get involved and part of the club. Um, I think that there's gonna be great friendships and great impact that'll come out of this because there are people with resources who, you know, are just thinking, what am I gonna do with what I've been blessed with uh, to help the poor um, and maybe in a different model. So, you know, they've been very generous with um, giving and charity. Um, and now maybe they want to combine their business experience and investment strategy uh, and look at impact investing. So really looking forward to the journey ahead. And there's just so much collaboration uh, within the other pillars as well um, in what we do because of pipeline sharing and just what, um, yeah, and who needs help out there. So uh, looking forward to staying in touch and I'll pass it over to Alex. Hi. Um, just give me one second. I'm, um, hi, I'm Alex, and I lead the Resilience Program Pillar within TBN. The program might have been birthed, you know, through the current pandemic to support quality enterprises that create value for others, but I'm optimistic that this will actually, in time, be an enduring feature of, uh, of TBN. Um, I have shared in previous sessions that for now, the way this capital will be deployed is via debt, you know, with amortizing repayments over a period of uh, not exceeding four years. Um, to the entrepreneurs among us, I'd just like to state up front that the whole intent of the fund is to support rather than to dilute. The support comes through charging roughly about 50% below market rates for, for your borrowing and also capacity building via Seth. Uh, we hope this savings will then in turn allow you to serve your stakeholders like your employees, like your supply chain, and even your customers better. And, and we intend to measure that to, to the extent possible. And to the potential funders among us, you know, I had also shared earlier on in one of the sessions that often we think that our treasure will follow where our heart is. In fact, what I've observed in practice, and certainly in my own life, is our hearts follow where our treasure is. Meaning to say, if you want to be someone or a family who cares about the poor and the vulnerable, 
a good place to start is by channeling your treasure that way. You know, investment in the resilience program, either as a donor to TBN, um, and hopefully we can flash some, some channels where people can donate directly into this productive philanthropy or investing directly into enterprises or coming on as an investor into the resilience fund, you know, offer a real opportunity for you to, to direct your treasure. And we understand the hurdles of liquidity and risk. To address the, the hurdle of risk, uh, you would have probably heard that TBN is devoting every dollar raised through this conference to, for, to forming that first loss capital up to around 20% of uh, the fund size. This means that you, you only stand to lose any parts of your capital if the total delinquency exceeds that amount. And to address the hurdle of liquidity, the resilience fund seek to make um, principal and interest payments, repayments to you um, semi-annually. So in essence, that's the resilience wow. program. Please get in touch with us if yeah. you're keen to participate. And, uh, and we really want to try and do this with excellence. So please come on board. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Wow. Okay, I, I just want to acknowledge all the, uh, the, you know, the team, the tech people. LJ, LJ, can you wave at us? LJ, we have uh, Valerie. Okay. And then we have, uh, that's one, HH, how do I, how do I address you? Hannah. Hannah and Heiko. Hannah, Heiko, thank you so much. And then we have Sentoso. Thank you. And then Eliza, Eliza, thank you so much. And Andrew. All right, Andrew. And then we have Josh. Thank you so much, Josh. And uh, Pay, of course, Pay. And then David. Wow, well, we've got a total of 23 in the team. But I, I want to uh, just end up by just uh, welcoming our official advisor, Kim Tan from the UK. Kim. Kim, Morning. can you say, can you give Hello, a Melvin. closing word? Hi. <laughs> I'm team. not sure about closing words. Uh, I'm sorry I haven't been able to join um, many of the sessions this week. Uh, it's just been uh, a week of Zoom meetings with uh, a whole lot of uh, companies. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, so I, I just want to say thank you to everybody. What an amazing job you guys have all done. Uh, to pull this off in such a short time um, and uh, the, the number of uh, businesses that wanted to present and, and participate has just been outstanding. So just want to, to congratulate and thank you all, uh, everyone, uh, for, for all your efforts on behalf of these uh, social enterprises and really on behalf of the poor. Um, there is no other way that we're going to be able to help the poor to become independent so that they can look after themselves and look after their, provide for their own families, educate their kids, uh, provide for their own health care uh, without some kind of independent uh, means of income. So, uh, you know, the jobs that are going to be created through these social enterprises are going to be critical, not only for their communities, but also in the long run for their countries. Uh, these countries are going to have to lift themselves out uh, of, of poverty through enterprises. So great job, everybody. And, and thank you again so much for your energy and your, uh, your vision uh, to carry this out. So well done. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. All right, this is what's happening. I, I, uh, I know that the participants are all there. So can we all put uh, our best uh, face? Maybe LJ can, can help us or something like that because some of us, are, we are not center. And then we take a group photo. Who will do that? Uh, I, I, okay, LJ will do that. All right. And, uh, and I think someone is quite dark, isn't it? Uh, maybe Andrew is quite dark, right? <laughs> All right. So LJ, I, I hand over to you. Okay, everybody smile. I want to see Keith. Uh, Andrew disappeared into the blue. 
Uh, Dr. Kim, can you put your face nearer to the camera because you uh, very small now? A lot nearer. A lot nearer. Okay, very good. Okay, everybody smile. I want to see teeth. One, two, three. Hang on. One, two, three. Okay. Double checking. Yes, I can see everybody. Perfect. All right, great. So we're going to end this now. Uh, there's a question that's being asked, okay? And that's uh, for Alex. The question is, how much, what's the minimum amount for the uh, resilience program? So Alex, you want to say the last word and then... Uh... I've actually answered Paul uh, privately. Oh, okay. Okay, that's great. That's great. So on, on behalf of TBN and this fantastic team, I, I really, the whole journey is not about finishing the uh, conference. The whole journey is working with this team and the joy of seeing how everybody selflessly come together. Now, I want to re remind you again, the five pillar leads. Okay, these are the people to connect with. Okay, we have uh, Wayne who is on Seth. We have uh, Alex on the uh, resilience program. We have when, when, you know, our professional uh, moderator who is on Investors Club. And uh, we have uh, Tiffany and this um, uh, Bernice who is on the program itself on the uh, conference program because they, they, they work together very much. And then we have Christy on the uh, Expertise Network. So on behalf of the TBN team, Thank you so much and uh, thank you, Kim, for just joining in and thank you, everybody, all right? We look for a time where we can have barbecue, but uh, I think until, <laughs> I think that's allowable. All right, God bless okay, you. Okay, guys, before we go, just three quick reminders for the guys who missed us uh, in the front part. One is the TBN app is still alive. If you still want to interact with the social entrepreneurs, the social enterprises, remember to just reach out to them directly and see their latest updates. Second, we have two follow-up sessions for those of you who are interested to learn more about the SAF program. That is a follow-up session happening next week. If you would like to learn how you can be part of cohort two or you have some inputs, join us. We will also be having some participants from the first cohort uh, sharing their experience to help you decide whether this is something that is relevant for you. Of course, we also have another follow-up session on the Expertise Network as you have, we hope that we have inspired you enough that you want to say, regardless of what you do professionally, how can I contribute to social impact? And so join this session. This is how we can help you get started. Without further ado, thank you very much. We are giving you back your weekend. Thank you for joining us. We hope you had fun. Um, and yeah, thank you so much.